Friedrich Engels Dialectics of Nature Preface by J. B. S. Haldane Marxism has a twofold bearing on science. In the first place, Marxists study science, among other human activities. They show how the scientific activities of any society depend on its changing needs, and so in the long run on its productive methods, and how science changes the productive methods, and therefore the whole society. This analysis is needed for any scientific approach to history, and even non-Marxists are now accepting parts of it. But secondly, Marx and Engels were not content to analyze the changes in society. In dialectics, they saw the science of the general laws of change, not only in society and in human thought, but in the external world, which is mirrored by human thought. That is to say, it can be applied to problems of quote-unquote pure science as well as to the social relations of science. Scientists are becoming familiar with the application of Marxist ideas to the place of science in society. Some accept it in whole or in part. Others fight against it vigorously and say that they are pursuing pure knowledge for its own sake. But many of them are unaware that Marxism has any bearing on scientific problems considered out of their relation to society, for example, the problems of totemerism in chemistry or individuality in biology. And certain Marxists are inclined to regard the study of such scientific and philosophical problems as unimportant. Yet, they have before them the example of Lenin. In 1905, the Russian Revolution had failed. It was necessary to build up the revolutionary movement afresh. Lenin saw that this could only be done on a sound theoretical basis, so he wrote Materialism and Imperial Criticism. This involved a study not only of philosophers, such as Mach and Pearson, whom he criticized, but of physicists, such as Hertz, J. J. Thompson, and Becquerel, whose discoveries could be interpreted from a materialistic or an idealistic point of view. However, Lenin did not attempt to cover the whole of science. He was mainly concerned with the revolution in physics, which was then in progress, and had little to say on astronomy, geology, chemistry, or biology. But thirty years before Lenin, Engels had tried to discuss the whole of science from a Marxist standpoint. He had always been a student of science. Since 1861, he had been in close touch with the chemist Schorlemmer at Manchester and had discussed scientific problems with him and Marx for many years. In 1871, he came to London and started reading scientific books and journals on a large scale. He intended to write a great book to show, quote, that in nature the same dialectical laws of movement are carried out in the confusion of its countless changes as also govern the apparent contingency of events in history. Unquote. If this book had been written, it would have been of immense importance for the development of science. But apart from political work, other intellectual tasks lay before Engels. During had to be answered, and perhaps anti during which covers the whole field of human knowledge, is a greater book than Dialectics of Nature would have been had Engels completed it. After Marx's death in 1883, he had the gigantic task of editing and completing Capital, beside which he wrote Feuerbach and The Origin of the Family. So, Dialectics of Nature was never finished. The manuscript consists of four bundles, all in Engels' handwriting, save for a number of quotations from Greek philosophers in that of Marx. Part of the manuscript is ready for publication, though, as we shall see, it would almost certainly have been revised. Much of it merely consists of rough notes, which Engels hoped to work up later. They are often hard to read and full of abbreviations. For example, mag for magnet and magnetism. There are occasional scribbles and sketches in the margin. Finally, although the bulk of the manuscript is in German, Engels thought equally well in English and French, and occasionally produced a hybrid sentence, such as, quote, When Coulomb 
von particles of electricity spricht, which repel each other inversely as the square of distance, so nimmt Thomson das ruhig hin als bewiesen, unquote. Or, quote, in der heutigen Gesellschaft dans le mécanisme civils herrscht duplicité d'action contrarité de l'intellect individuel avec le collectif es ist une que universel de individus contra le mass. Unquote. The translation has been a very difficult task, and the order of the different parts is somewhat uncertain. Most of the manuscript seems to have been written between 1872 and 1882. That is to say, it refers to the science of 60 years ago. Hence, it is often hard to follow if one does not know the history of the scientific practice and theory of that time. The idea of what is now called the conservation of energy was beginning to permeate physics, chemistry and biology, but it was still very incompletely realized and still more incompletely applied. Words such as force, motion, and vis viva were used where we should now speak of energy. The essays on basic forms of motion, the measure of motion to work, and heat are largely concerned with the controversies which arose from incomplete or faulty theories about energy. They are interesting as showing how ideas on this subject developed and how Engels tackled the controversies of his day. However, many of these controversies are now settled. The expression vis viva is no longer used for double the kinetic energy, and quote-unquote force has acquired a definite meaning in physics. Engels would not have published them in their present form, if only because, in the later essay on tidal friction, he uses a more modern terminology. Their interest lies not so much in their detailed criticism of theories, many of which have ceased to be of importance, but in showing how Engels grappled with intellectual problems. The essay on electricity dates even more. As a criticism of Wiedemann's inconsistencies, it is interesting, and it ends with a plea for a closer investigation of the connection between chemical and electrical action, which, as Engels said, quote, will lead to important results in both spheres of investigation." Unquote. This prophecy has, of course, been amply fulfilled. Arrhenius's ionic theory has transformed chemistry, and Thomson's electron theory has revolutionized physics. Here again, the manuscript would certainly have been revised before publication. In a letter to Marx on November 23, 1882, he points out that, Siemens, in his presidential address to the British Association, has defined a new unit, that of electric power, the watt, which is proportional to the resistance multiplied by the square of the current, whereas the electromotive force is proportional to the resistance multiplied by the current. He compares these with the expressions for momentum and energy, discussed in the essay on the measure of motion, work and points out that in each case we have simple proportionality, momentum as velocity, and electromotive force as current, when we are not dealing with transformation of one form of energy into another. But when the energy is transformed into heat or work, the correct value is found by squaring the velocity or current, quote, so it is a general law of motion, which I was the first to formulate, unquote. We can now see why this is so. The momentum and the electromotive force having directions are reversed when the speed and current are reversed, but the energy remains unaltered. So the speed or the current must come into the formula as the square or some even power, since in parentheses minus x close parentheses squared equals x squared. In the essay on tidal friction, Engels made a serious mistake or, more accurately, a mistake which would have been serious had he published it. But I very much doubt whether he would have done so. In the manuscript notes for anti deering he supported the view, quite commonly held in the 19th century, that we find truths, such as mathematical axioms, self-evident because our ancestors have been convinced of their validity, while they would not appear self-evident to a Bushman or Australian black. Footnote. See Anti-During, 
page 314 in the footnote. Now, this view is almost certainly incorrect, and Engels presumably saw the fallacy and did not have it printed. I have little doubt that either he or one of his scientific friends, such as Schorlemer, would have detected the mistake in the essay on tidal friction. But even as a mistake, it is interesting, because it is one of the mistakes which leads to a correct result, namely that the day would shorten even if there were no oceans, by incorrect reasoning. Such mistakes have been extremely fruitful in the history of science. Elsewhere, there are statements which are certainly untrue, for example in the sections on stars and protozoa, but here Engels cannot be blamed for following some of the best astronomers and zoologists of his day. The technical improvement of the telescope and microscope has, of course, led to great increases in our knowledge here in the last 60 years. On the other hand, Engels's remark on the differential calculus, though inapplicable to that branch of mathematics as now taught, were correct in his own day, and for some time after. He points out that it actually developed by contradiction, and is none the worse for that. Today, quote-unquote rigorous, proofs are given of many of the theorems to which he refers, and some mathematicians claim to have eliminated the contradictions. Actually, they have only pushed the contradictions into the background, where they remain in the field of mathematical logic. Not only has every effort to deduce all mathematics from a set of axioms and rules for applying them failed, but Gödel has proved that they must fail. So the fact that the calculus can be taught without involving the particular contradictions mentioned by Engels in no way impugns the validity of his dialectical argument. When all such criticisms have been made, it is astonishing how Engels anticipated the progress of science in the sixty years which have elapsed since he wrote. He certainly did not like the atomic theory of electricity, which held sway from 1900 to 1930, and until it turned out that the electron behaved not only like a particle, but like a system of moving waves, he might well have been thought to have, quote-unquote, backed the wrong horse. His insistence that life is the characteristic mode of behavior of proteins appeared to be very one-sided to most biochemists, since every cell contains many other complicated organ substances besides proteins. Only in the last four years has it turned out that certain pure proteins do exhibit one of the most essential features of living things, reproducing themselves in a variety of environments. While we can everywhere study Engels' method of thinking with advantage, I believe that the sections of the book which deal with biology are the most immediately valuable to scientists today. This may of course be because as a biologist, I can detect subtleties of Engels' thought, which I have missed in the physical sections. It may be because biology has undergone less spectacular changes than physics in the last two generations. In order to help readers to follow the development of science since Engels' time, I have added some notes. A few readers may object to my pointing out that Engels was occasionally wrong. Engels would not have objected. He was well aware that he was not infallible, and that the labor movement wants no popes or inspired scriptures. The condition of the working class in England in 1844, of which an English translation has been published in America in 1885, was first published in England in 1892. In his preface, written after 48 years, he says, quote, I have taken great care not to strike out of the text the many prophecies, amongst others, that of an imminent social revolution in England, which my youthful ardor induced me to venture upon. The wonder is, not that a good many of them proved wrong, but that so many of them have proved right. Unquote. I think the readers of Dialectics of Nature will come to a similar conclusion. I have not yet mentioned the sections on the history of science. These are among the most brilliant passages in the whole book, but they represent a line of thought which was followed by Marx and Engels in many of their books, and which has since been developed by others, so most readers will find them less novel. Finally, there is the delightful essay on scientific research into the spirit world. 
There is a tendency among materialists to neglect the problems here dealt with. It is worthwhile noticing that Engels did not do so. On the contrary, he produced a number of phenomena which were regarded as quote-unquote occult and mysterious in his day, and arrived at the same conclusions as most scientific investigators in this field have reached, provided that, like Engels, they brought to their work robust common sense and also a sense of humor. It was a great misfortune, not only for Marxism, but for all branches of natural science, that Bernstein, into whose hands the manuscript came when Engels died in 1895, did not publish it. In 1924, he submitted it, or part of it, to Einstein, who, though he did not think it of great interest from the standpoint of modern physics, was on the whole in favor of publication. If, as seems likely, Einstein only saw the essay on electricity, his hesitation can easily be understood, since this deals almost wholly with questions which now seem remote. The manuscript was first edited by Ryazanov, and printed in 1927. However, Adorotsky's edition of 1935 is more satisfactory, as several passages which made nonsense in the earlier edition have now been deciphered. Had Engels's method of thinking been more familiar, the transformation of our ideas on physics, which have occurred during the last 30 years, would have been smoother. Had his remarks on Darwinism been generally known, I, for one, would have been saved a certain amount of muddled thinking. I therefore welcome wholeheartedly the publication of an English translation of Dialectics of Nature, and hope that future generations of scientists will find that it helps them to elasticity of thought. But it must not be thought that Dialectics of Nature is only of interest to scientists. Any educated person, and, above all, anyone who is a student of philosophy, will find much to interest him or her throughout the book, though particularly in chapters 1, 2, 7, 9, and 10. One reason why Engels was such a great writer is that he was probably the most widely educated man of his day. Not only had he a profound knowledge of economics and history, but he knew enough to discuss the meaning of an obscure Latin phrase concerning Roman marriage law, or the processes taking place when a piece of impure zinc was dipped into sulfuric acid, and he contrived to accumulate this immense knowledge, not by leading a life of cloistered learning, but while playing an active part in politics, running a business, and even fox hunting. He needed this knowledge, because dialectical materialism, the philosophy which, along with Marx, he founded, is not merely a philosophy of history, but a philosophy which illuminates all events whatever, from the falling of a stone to a poet's imaginings, and it lays particular emphasis on the interconnection of all processes, and the artificial character of the distinctions which men have drawn, not merely between vertebrates and invertebrates, or liquids and gases, but between the different fields of human knowledge, such as economics, history, and natural science. Chapter 2 contains an outline of his philosophy in its relation to natural science. A very careful and condensed summary of it is given in Chapter 4 of the history of the CPSUB, but the main sources for its study are Engels' Feuerbach and anti deering Lenin's Materialism and Imperial Criticism, and a number of passages in the works of Marx. Just because it is a living philosophy with innumerable concrete applications, its full power and importance can only be gradually understood when we see it applied to history, science, or whatever field of study interests us most. For this reason, a reader whose concern lies primarily in the political or economic field will come back to his main interest, a better dialectical materialist, and therefore a clearer-sighted politician or economist, after studying how Engels applied dialectics to nature. At the present moment, clear thinking is vitally necessary if we are to understand the extremely complicated situation in which the whole human race, and our own nation in particular, is placed, and to see the way out of it to a better world. A study of Engels will warn us against some of the facile solutions which are put forward today and help us to play an intelligent and courageous part in the great events of our time.
J. B. S. Haldane, November 1939 Introduction Modern natural science, which alone has achieved an all-around systematic and scientific development, as contrasted with the brilliant natural philosophical institutions of antiquity and the extremely important but sporadic discoveries of the Arabs, which for the most part vanished without results, this modern natural science dates, like all more recent history, from that mighty epoch which we Germans term the Reformation, from the national misfortune that overtook us at that time, and which the French term the Renaissance, and the Italians the Cinco Cento, although it is not fully expressed by any of these names. It is the epoch which had its rise in the last half of the 15th century. Royalty, with the support of the burghers of the towns, broke the power of the feudal nobility and established the great monarchies, based essentially on nationality, within which the modern European nations and modern bourgeois society came to development. And while the burghers and nobles were still fighting one another, the peasant war in Germany pointed prophetically to future class struggles, not only by bringing onto the stage the peasants in revolt, that was no longer anything new, but behind them the beginnings of the modern proletariat, with the red flag in their hands, and the demand for common ownership of goods on their lips. In the manuscripts saved from the fall of Byzantium, in the antique statues dug out of the ruins of Rome, a new world was revealed to the astonished West, that of ancient Greece. The ghosts of the Middle Ages vanished before its shining forms. Italy rose to an undreamt-of flowering of art, which seemed like a reflection of classical antiquity and was never attained again. In Italy, France, and Germany, a new literature arose, the first modern literature. Shortly afterwards came the classical epochs of English and Spanish literature. The bounds of the old Orbis Terrarum were pierced. Only now, for the first time, was the world really discovered and the basis laid for subsequent world trade and the transition from handicraft to manufacture, which in its turn formed the starting point for modern large-scale industry. The dictatorship of the church over men's minds was shattered. It was directly cast off by the majority of the Germanic peoples, who adopted Protestantism, while among the Latins a cheerful spirit of free thought, taken over from the Arabs and nourished by the newly discovered Greek philosophy, took root more and more and prepared the way for the materialism of the 18th century. It was the greatest progressive revolution that mankind has so far experienced, a time which called for giants and produced giants, giants in power of thought, passion and character, in universality and learning. The men who founded the modern rule of the bourgeoisie had anything but bourgeois limitations. On the contrary, the adventurous character of the time inspired them to a greater or less degree. There was hardly any man of importance then living who had not traveled extensively, who did not command four or five languages, who did not shine in a number of fields. Leonardo da Vinci was not only a great painter, but also a great mathematician, mechanician and engineer, to whom the most diverse branches of physics are indebted for important discoveries. Albrecht Dürer was painter, engraver, sculptor and architect, and in addition invented a system of fortification embodying many of the ideas that much later were again taken up by Montalembert and the modern German science of fortification. Machiavelli was statesman, historian, poet, and at the same time the first notable military author of modern times. Luther not only cleaned the Augean stable of the church, but also that of the German language. He created modern German prose, and composed the text and melody of that triumphal hymn which became the Marseillaise of the 16th century. The heroes of that time had not yet come under the servitude of the division of labor, the restricting effects of which, with its production of one-sidedness, were so often noticed in their successors. But what is especially characteristic of them is that they almost all pursue their lives and activities in the midst of the contemporary movements, in the practical struggle. They take sides and join the fight, one by speaking and writing, another with the sword, 
many with both. Hence the fullness and force of character that makes them complete men. Men of the study are the exception, either persons of second or third rank, or cautious Philistines who do not want to burn their fingers. At that time natural science also developed in the midst of the general revolution and was itself thoroughly revolutionary. It had to win in struggle its right of existence. Side by side with the great Italians, from whom modern philosophy dates, it provided its martyrs for the stake and the prisons of the Inquisition, and it is characteristic that Protestants outdid Catholics in persecuting the free investigation of nature. Calvin had Servetus burned at the stake, when the latter was on the point of discovering the circulation of the blood, and indeed he kept him roasting alive during two hours. For the Inquisition, at least it sufficed to have Giordano Bruno simply burnt alive. The revolutionary act by which natural science declared its independence, and, as it were, repeated Luther's burning of the papal bull, was the publication of the immortal work by which Copernicus, though timidly, and, so to speak, only from his deathbed, threw down the gauntlet to ecclesiastical authority in the affairs of nature. The emancipation of natural science from theology dates from this act, although the fighting out of the particular antagonistic claims has dragged out up to our day, and in many minds is still far from completion. Thenceforward, however, the development of the sciences proceeded with giant strides, and it might be said, gained in force in proportion to the square of the distance in time from its point of departure. It was as if the world were to be shown that henceforth the reciprocal law of motion would be as valid for the highest product of organic matter, the human mind, as for inorganic substance. The main work in the first period of natural science that now opened lay in mastering the material immediately at hand. In most fields a start had to be made from the very beginning. Antiquity had bequeathed Euclid and the Ptolemaic solar system. The Arabs had left behind the decimal notation, the beginnings of algebra, the modern numerals and alchemy. The Christian Middle Ages, nothing at all. Of necessity, in this situation, the most fundamental natural science, the mechanics of terrestrial and heavenly bodies, occupied first place, and alongside it, as handmaiden to it, the discovery and perfection of mathematical methods. Great work was achieved here. At the end of the period characterized by Newton and Linné, we find these branches of science brought to a certain perfection. The basic features of the most essential mathematical methods were established. Analytical geometry by Descartes especially, logarithms by Napier, and the differential and integral calculus by Leibniz and perhaps Newton. The same holds good of the mechanics of rigid bodies, the main laws of which were made clear once for all. Finally, in the astronomy of the solar system, Kepler discovered the laws of planetary movement, and Newton formulated them from the point of view of the general laws of motion of matter. The other branches of natural science were far removed even from this preliminary perfection. Only towards the end of the period did the mechanics of fluid and gaseous bodies receive further treatment. Physics proper had still not gone beyond its first beginnings with the exception of optics, the exceptional progress of which was due to the practical needs of astronomy. By the phlogistic theory, chemistry for the first time emancipated itself from alchemy. Geology had not yet gone beyond the embryonic stage of mineralogy, hence paleontology could not yet exist at all. Finally, in the field of biology, the essential preoccupation was still with the collection and first sifting of the immense material, not only botanical and zoological, but also anatomical and even physiological. There could as yet be hardly any talk of the comparison of the various forms of life, of the investigation of their geographical distribution and their climatic, etc. living conditions. Here only botany and zoology arrived at an approximate completion owing to Linnaeus. But what especially characterizes this period is the elaboration of a peculiar general outlook, in which the central point is the view of the absolute immutability of nature. In whatever way nature itself might have come into being, once present, 
it remained as it was as long as it continued to exist. The planets and their satellites, once set in motion by the mysterious, quote-unquote, first impulse, circled on and on in their predestined ellipses for all eternity, or at any rate, until the end of all things. The stars remained forever fixed and immovable in their places, keeping one another therein by, quote-unquote, universal gravitation. The Earth had persisted without alteration from all eternity, or, alternatively, change or cultivation had taken place at the hand of man. The species of plants and animals had been established once and for all when they came into existence. Like continually produced like, and it was already a good deal for Linnaeus to have conceded that possibly here and there new species could have arisen by crossing. In contrast to the history of mankind, which develops in time, there was ascribed to the history of nature only an unfolding in space. All change, all development in nature was denied. Natural science, so revolutionary at the outset, suddenly found itself confronted by an out-and-out -out conservative nature, in which, even today, everything was as it had been at the beginning, and in which, to the end of the world or for all eternity, everything would remain as it had been since the beginning. High as the natural science of the first half of the 18th century stood above Greek antiquity in knowledge, and even in the sifting of its material, it stood just as deeply below Greek antiquity in the theoretical mastery of this material, in the general outlook on nature. For the Greek philosophers, the world was essentially something that had emerged from chaos, something that had developed, that had come into being. For the natural scientists of the period that we are dealing with, it was something ossified, something immutable, and for most of them, something that had been created at one stroke. Science was still deeply enmeshed in theology. Everywhere it sought and found its ultimate resort in an impulse from outside that was not to be explained from nature itself. Even if attraction, by Newton pompously baptized as quote-unquote universal gravitation, was conceived as an essential property of matter, whence comes the unexplained tangential force which first gives rise to the orbits of the planets? How did the innumerable varieties of animals and plants arise? And how, above all, did man arise, since, after all, it was certain that he was not present from all eternity? To such questions, natural science only too frequently answered by making the creator of all things responsible. Copernicus, at the beginning of the period, writes a letter renouncing theology, Newton closes the period with the postulate of a divine first impulse. The highest general idea to which this natural science attained was that of the purposiveness of the arrangements of nature, the shallow theology of Wolf, according to which cats were created to eat mice, mice to be eaten by cats, and the whole of nature to testify to the wisdom of the Creator. It is to the highest credit of the philosophy of the time that it did not let itself be led astray by the restricted state of contemporary natural knowledge, and that, from Spinoza right to the great French materialists, it insisted on explaining the world from the world itself, and left the justification in detail to the natural science of the future. I include the materials of the 18th century in this period, because no natural scientific material was available to them, other than that above described. Kant's epoch-making work remained a secret to them, and Laplace came long after them. We should not forget that this obsolete outlook on nature, although riddled through and through by the progress of science, dominated the entire first half of the 19th century, and in substance is even now still taught in all schools. Footnote. How tenaciously, even in 1861, this view could be held by a man whose scientific achievements had provided highly important material for abolishing it, is shown by the following classic words. Quote, All the arrangements of our solar system, so far as we are capable of comprehending them, aim at preservation of what exists, and at unchanging continuance. Just as since the most ancient times, no animal and no plant on the earth has become more perfect, or in any way different, just as we find in all organisms only stages alongside one another, and not following one another, 
Just as our own race has always remained the same in corporeal respects, so even the greatest diversity in the coexisting heavenly bodies does not justify us in assuming that these forms are merely different stages of development. It is rather that everything created is equally perfect in itself. Unquote. Medler, Popular Astronomy, Berlin, 1861, 5th edition, page 316. End of footnote. The first breach in this petrified outlook on nature was made not only by a natural scientist but by a philosopher. In 1755 appeared Kant's Allgemeine Naturgeschichte und Theorie des Himmels, General Natural History and Theory of the Heavens. The question of the first impulse was abolished. The Earth and the whole solar system appeared as something that had come into being in the course of time. If the great majority of the natural scientists had had a little less of the repugnance to thinking that Newton expressed in the warning, quote, physics, beware of metaphysics, unquote, they would have been compelled from this single brilliant discovery of Kant's to draw conclusions that would have spared them endless deviations and immeasurable amounts of time and labor wasted in false directions. For Kant's discovery contained the point of departure for all further progress. If the Earth were something that had come into being, then its present geological, geographical, and climatic state, and its plants and animals likewise, must be something that had come into being. It must have had a history not only of coexistence in space, but also of succession in time. If at once further investigations had been resolutely pursued in this direction, natural science would now be considerably further advanced than it is. But what good could come out of philosophy? Kant's work remained without immediate results, until many years later Laplace and Herschel expounded its contents and gave them a deeper foundation, thereby gradually bringing the quote-unquote nebular hypothesis into favor. Further discoveries finally brought it victory. The most important of these, the proper motion of the fixed stars, the demonstration of a resistant medium in universal space, the proof furnished by spectral analysis of the chemical identity of the matter of the universe, and the existence of such glowing nebular masses as Kant had postulated. It is, however, permissible to doubt whether the majority of natural scientists would so soon have become conscious of the contradiction of a changing earth that bore immutable organisms had not the dawning conception that nature does not just exist, but comes into being and passes away, derived support from another quarter. Geology arose and pointed out not only the terrestrial strata formed one after another and deposited one upon another, but also the shells and skeletons of extinct animals, and the trunks, leaves and fruits of no longer existing plants contained in these strata. It had finally to be acknowledged that not only the earth as a whole, but also its present surface and the plants and animals living on it, possessed a history in time. At first the acknowledgement occurred reluctantly enough. Cuvier's theory of the revolutions of the earth was revolutionary in phrase and reactionary in substance. In place of a single divine creation, he put a whole series of repeated acts of creation, making the miracle an essential natural agent. Lyell first brought sense into geology by substituting for the sudden revolutions due to the moods of the creator the gradual effects of a slow transformation of the earth. Footnote. The defect of Lyell's view, at least in its first form, lay in conceiving the forces at work on the earth as constant, both in quality and quantity. The cooling of the earth does not exist for him. The earth does not develop in a definite direction, but merely changes in an inconsequent, fortuitous manner. End of footnote. Lyell's theory was even more incompatible than any of its predecessors with the assumption of a constant organic species. Gradual transformation of the earth's surface and of all conditions of life led directly to gradual transformation of the organisms and their adaptation to the changing environment, to the mutability of species. But tradition is a power not only in the Catholic Church, but also in natural science. For years, Lyell himself did not see the contradiction, and his pupils still less. 
This is only to be explained by the division of labor that had meanwhile become dominant in natural science, which more or less restricted each person to his special sphere, there being only a few whom it did not rob of a comprehensive view. Meanwhile physics had made mighty advances, the results of which were summed up almost simultaneously by three different persons in the year 1842, an epoch-making year for this branch of natural investigation. Mayer in Heilbronn and Joule in Manchester demonstrated the transformation of heat into mechanical energy and of mechanical energy into heat. The determination of the mechanical equivalent of heat put this result beyond question. Simultaneously, by simply working up the separate physical results already arrived at, Grove, not a natural scientist by profession, but an English lawyer, proved that all so-called physical energy, mechanical energy, heat, light, electricity, magnetism, indeed even so-called chemical energy, become transformed into one another under definite conditions, without any loss of energy occurring, and so proved post factum along physical lines, Descartes' principle that the quantity of motion present in the world is constant. With that, the special physical energies, the, as it were, immutable, quote-unquote, species of physics, were resolved into variously differentiated forms of the motion of matter, convertible into one another according to definite laws. The fortuitousness of the existence of a number of physical energies was abolished from science by the proof of their interconnections and transitions. Physics, like astronomy before it, had arrived at a result that necessarily pointed to the eternal cycle of matter in motion as the ultimate reality. The wonderfully rapid development of chemistry, since Lavoisier, and especially since Dalton, attacked the old ideas of nature from another aspect. The preparation by inorganic means, of compounds that hitherto had been produced only in the living organism, proved that the laws of chemistry had the same validity for organic as for inorganic bodies, and to a large extent, bridged the gulf between inorganic and organic nature, a gulf that even Kant regarded as forever impassable. Finally, in the sphere of biological research, also the scientific journeys and expeditions that had been systematically organized since the middle of the previous century, the more thorough exploration of the European colonies in all parts of the world by specialists living there, and further the progress of paleontology, anatomy and physiology in general, particularly since the systematic use of the microscope and the discovery of the cell, had accumulated so much material that the application of the comparative method became possible and at the same time indispensable. On the one hand, the conditions of life of the various floras and faunas were determined by means of comparative physical geography. On the other hand, the various organisms were compared with one another according to their homologous organs, and this not only in the adult condition, but at all stages of development. The more deeply and exactly this research was carried on, the more did the rigid system of an immutable, fixed organic nature crumble away at its touch. Not only did the separate species of plants and animals become more and more inextricably intermingled, but animals turned up, such as Amphioxus and Lepidoceran, that made a mockery of all previous classification, and finally organisms were encountered, of which it was not possible to say whether they belonged to the plant or animal kingdom. More and more, the gaps in the paleontological record were filled up, compelling even the most reluctant to acknowledge the striking parallelisms between the evolutionary history of the organic world as a whole and that of the individual organism. The Ariadne's thread that was to lead the way out of the labyrinth, in which botany and zoology appeared to have become more and more deeply lost. It was characteristic that almost simultaneously with Kant's attack on the eternity of the solar system, C. F. Wolf in 1759 launched the first attack on the fixity of species and proclaimed the theory of descent. But what in his case was still only a brilliant anticipation, took firm shape in the hands of Oaken, Lamarck, Bayer, and was victoriously carried through by Darwin in 1859, exactly a hundred years later. Almost simultaneously it was established 
that protoplasm and the cell, which had already been shown to be the ultimate morphological constituents of all organisms, occurred independently as the lowest forms of organic life. This not only reduced the gulf between inorganic and organic nature to a minimum, but removed one of the most essential difficulties that had previously stood in the way of the theory of descent of organisms. The new conception of nature was complete in its main features. All rigidity was dissolved, all fixity dissipated, all particularity that had been regarded as eternal became transient. The whole of nature, shown as moving in eternal flux and cyclical course. Thus we have once again returned to the point of view of the great founders of Greek philosophy, the view that the whole of nature, from the smallest element to the greatest, from grains of sand to suns, from protista to men, has its existence in eternal coming into being and passing away, in ceaseless flux, in unresting motion and change, only with the essential difference that what for the Greeks was a brilliant intuition is in our case the result of strictly scientific research in accordance with experience, and hence also it emerges in a much more definite and clear form. It is true that the empirical proof of this motion is not wholly free from gaps, but these are insignificant in comparison with what has already been firmly established, and with each year they become more and more filled up. And how could the proof in detail be otherwise than defective when one bears in mind that the most essential branches of science, transplanetary astronomy, chemistry, geology, have a scientific existence of barely a hundred years, and the comparative method in physiology, one of barely fifty years, and that the basic form of almost all organic development, the cell, is a discovery not yet forty years old. The innumerable suns and solar systems of our island universe, bounded by the outermost stellar rings of the Milky Way, developed from swirling, glowing masses of vapor, the laws of motion of which will perhaps be disclosed after the observations of some centuries have given us an insight into the proper motion of the stars. Obviously, this development did not proceed everywhere at the same rate. Recognition of the existence of dark bodies, not merely planetary in nature, hence extinct suns in our stellar systems, more and more forces itself into astronomy, in parentheses, Mettler. On the other hand, according to Secchi, a part of the vaporous nebular patches belong to our stellar system as suns not yet fully formed, whereby it is not excluded that other nebulae, as Mettler maintains, are distant independent island universes, the relative stage of development of which must be determined by the spectroscope. How a solar system develops from an individual nebular mass has been shown in detail by Laplace in a manner still unsurpassed. Subsequent science has more and more confirmed him. On the separate bodies so formed, suns as well as planets and satellites, the form of motion of matter at first prevailing is that which we call heat. There can be no question of chemical compounds of the elements, even at a temperature like that still possessed by the sun. The extent to which heat is transformed into electricity or magnetism under such conditions, continued solar observations will show. It is already as good as proved that the mechanical motion taking place in the sun arises solely from the conflict of heat with gravity. The smaller the individual bodies, the quicker they cool down. The satellites, asteroids and meteors, first of all, just as our moon has long been extinct. The planets cool more slowly, the central body slowest of all. With progressive cooling, the interplay of the physical forms of motion, which become transformed into one another, comes more and more to the forefront until finally a point is reached from when on chemical affinity begins to make itself felt. The previously chemically indifferent elements become differentiated chemically one after another, obtain chemical properties, and enter into combination with one another. These compounds change continually with the decreasing temperature, which affects differently not only each element, but also each separate compound of the elements, changing also with the consequent passage of part of the gaseous matter first to the liquid and then to the solid state, and with the new conditions thus created. The period when the planet has a firm shell and accumulations of water on its surface coincides with that when its intrinsic heat diminishes more and more 
in comparison to the heat emitted to it from the central body. Its atmosphere becomes the arena of meteorological phenomena in the sense in which we now understand the word. Its surface becomes the arena of geological changes, in which the deposits resulting from atmospheric precipitation become of ever greater importance in comparison to the slowly decreasing external effects of the hot fluid interior. If, finally, the temperature becomes so far equalized that over a considerable portion of the surface at least, it does not exceed the limits within which protein is capable of life, then, if other chemical conditions are favorable, living protoplasm is formed. What these conditions are, we do not yet know, which is not to be wondered at, since, so far, not even the chemical formula of protein has been established. We do not even know how many chemically different protein bodies there are, and since it is only about ten years ago that the fact became known that completely structureless protein exercises all the essential functions of life, digestion, excretion, movement, contraction, reaction to stimuli, and reproduction. Thousands of years may have passed before the conditions arose in which the next advance could take place, and this formless protein produced the first cell by formation of nucleus and cell membrane. But this first cell also provided the foundation for the morphological development of the whole organic world. The first to develop, as it is permissible to assume from the whole analogy of the paleontological record, were the innumerable species of non-cellular and cellular protista, of which Eozoon canadense alone has come down to us, and of which some were gradually differentiated into the first plants and others into the first animals. And from the first animals were developed, essentially by further differentiation, the numerous classes, orders, families, genera, and species of animals, and finally mammals, the form in which the nervous system attains its fullest development, and among these again, finally, that mammal in which nature attains consciousness of itself, man. Man too arises by differentiation, not only individually by differentiation from a single egg cell to the most complicated organism that nature produces, no, also historically, when after thousands of years of struggle the differentiation of hand from foot and erect gait were finally established, man became distinct from the monkey, and the basis was laid for the development of articulate speech and mighty development of the brain that has since made the gulf between man and monkey an unbridgeable one. The specialization of the hand. This implies the tool, and the tool implies specific human activity, the transforming reaction of man on nature, production. Animals, in the narrower sense, also have tools, but only as limbs of their bodies. The ant, the bee, the beaver. Animals also produce, but their productive effect on surrounding nature in relation to the latter amounts to nothing at all. Man alone has succeeded in impressing his stamp on nature, not only by shifting the plant and animal world from one place to another, but also by so altering the aspect and climate of his dwelling place, and even the plants and animals themselves, that the consequences of his activity can disappear only with the general extinction of the terrestrial globe. And he has accomplished this primarily and essentially by means of the hand. Even the steam engine, so far his most powerful tool for the transformation of nature, depends, because it is a tool, in the last resort, on the hand. But step by step, with the development of the hand, went that of the brain. First of all, consciousness of the conditions for separate, practically useful actions, and later, among the more favored peoples, and arising from the preceding, insight into the natural laws governing them. And with the rapidly growing knowledge of the laws of nature, the means for reacting on nature also grew. The hand alone would never have achieved the steam engine if the brain of the man had not attained a correlative development with it, and parallel to it, and partly owing to it. With men we enter history. Animals also have a history, that of their derivation and gradual evolution to their present position. This history, however, is made for them, and in so far as they themselves take part in it, this occurs without their knowledge or desire. On the other hand, the more that human beings become removed from animals, in the narrower sense of the word, 
the more they make their own history consciously, the less becomes the influence of unforeseen effects and uncontrolled forces of this history, and the more accurately does the historical result correspond to the aim laid down in advance. If, however, we apply this measure to human history, to that of even the most developed peoples of the present day, we find that there still exists here a colossal disproportion between the proposed aims and the results arrived at, that unforeseen effects predominate, and that the uncontrolled forces are far more powerful than those set into motion according to plan. And this cannot be otherwise, as long as the most essential historical activity of men, the one which has raised them from bestiality to humanity, and which forms the material foundation of all their other activities, namely the production of their requirements of life, that is today, social production, is above all subject to the interplay of unintended effects from uncontrolled forces, and achieves its desired end only by way of exception, and much more frequently the exact opposite. In the most advanced industrial countries, we have subdued the forces of nature and pressed them into the service of mankind. We have thereby infinitely multiplied production, so that a child now produces more than a hundred adults previously did. And what is the result? Increasing overwork, and increasing misery of the masses, and every ten years a great collapse. Darwin did not know what a bitter satire he wrote on mankind, and especially on his countrymen, when he showed that free competition, the struggle for existence, which the economists celebrate as the highest historical achievement, is the normal state of the animal kingdom. Only conscious organization of social production, in which production and distribution are carried on in a planned way, can lift mankind above the rest of the animal world, as regards the social aspect, in the same way that production in general has done this for men in their aspect as species. Historical evolution makes such an organization daily more indispensable, but also with every day more possible. From it will date a new epoch of history, in which mankind itself, and with mankind all branches of its activity, and especially natural science, will experience an advance that will put everything preceding it in the deepest shade. Nevertheless, quote, all that comes into being deserves to perish, unquote. Millions of years may elapse, hundreds of thousands of generations be born and die, but inexorably the time will come when the declining warmth of the sun will no longer suffice to melt the ice thrusting itself forward from the poles, when the human race, crowding more and more about the equator, will finally no longer find even there enough heat for life, when gradually even the last trace of organic life will vanish, and the earth, an extinct frozen globe like the moon, will circle in deepest darkness, and in an ever narrower orbit about the equally extinct sun, and at last fall into it. Other planets will have preceded it, others will follow it. Instead of the bright, warm solar system with its harmonious arrangement of members, only a cold, dead sphere will still pursue its lonely path through universal space. And what will happen to our solar system will happen sooner or later to all the other solar systems of our island universe. It will happen to all the other innumerable island universes, even to those the light of which will never reach the earth while there is a living human eye to receive it. And when such a solar system has completed its life history and succumbs to the fate of all that is finite, death, what then? Will the sun's corpse roll on for all eternity through infinite space, and all the once infinitely diverse, differentiated natural forces pass forever into one single form of motion, attraction? Or, as Sechi asks, quote, do forces exist in nature which can reconvert the dead system into its original state of an incandescent nebula and reawake it to new life? We do not know. Unquote. At all events, we do not know in the sense that we know that 2 times 2 equals 4, or that the attraction of matter increases and decreases according to the square of the distance. In theoretical natural science, however, which, as far as possible, builds up its view of nature into a harmonious whole, and without which, nowadays, even the most thoughtless empiricist cannot get anywhere, we have very often to reckon with incompletely known magnitudes, 
and logical consistency of thought must at all times help to get over defective knowledge. Modern natural science has had to take over from philosophy the principle of the indestructibility of motion. It cannot any longer exist without this principle. But the motion of matter is not merely crude mechanical motion, mere change of place. It is heat and light, electric and magnetic stress, chemical combination and disassociation, life and finally consciousness. To say that matter, during the whole unlimited time of its existence, has only once, and for what is an infinitesimally short period in comparison to its eternity, found itself able to differentiate its motion, and thereby to unfold the whole wealth of this motion, and that before and after this remains restricted for eternity to mere change of place, this is equivalent to maintaining that matter is mortal and motion transitory. The indestructibility of motion cannot be merely quantitative, it must also be conceived qualitatively. Matter, whose purely mechanical change of place, includes indeed the possibility under favorable conditions of being transformed into heat, electricity, chemical action or life, but which is not capable of producing these conditions from out of itself, such matter has forfeited motion. Motion, which has lost the capacity of being transformed into the various forms appropriate to it, may indeed still have dynamis, but no longer energeia, and so has become partially destroyed. Both, however, are unthinkable. This much is certain. There was a time when the matter of our island universe had transformed a quantity of motion, of what kind we do not yet know, into heat such that there could be developed from it the solar systems appertaining to, according to Medler, at least into 20 million stars, the gradual extinction of which is likewise certain. How did this transformation take place? We know just as little as Father Secchi knows whether the future caput mortum of our solar system will once again be converted into the raw material of a new solar system. But here, either we must have recourse to a creator, or we are forced to the conclusion that the incandescent raw material for the solar system of our universe was produced in a natural way by transformations of motion, which are by nature inherent in moving matter, and the conditions of which therefore also must be reproduced by matter, even if only after millions and millions of years, and more or less by chance, but with the necessity that is also inherent in chance. The possibility of such a transformation is more and more being conceded. The view is being arrived at that the heavenly bodies are ultimately destined to fall into one another, and one even calculates the amount of heat which must be developed on such collisions. The sudden flaring up of new stars, and the equally sudden increase in brightness of familiar ones, of which we are informed by astronomy, is most easily explained by such collisions. Not only does our group of planets move about the sun, and our sun within our island universe, but our whole island universe also moves in space in temporary, relative equilibrium with the other island universes. For even the relative equilibrium of freely moving bodies can only exist where the motion is reciprocally determined, and it is assumed by many that the temperature in space is not everywhere the same. Finally, we know that, with the exception of an infinitesimal portion, the heat of the innumerable suns of our island universe vanishes into space, and fails to raise the temperature of space even by a millionth of a degree centigrade. What becomes of all this enormous quantity of heat? Is it forever dissipated in the attempt to heat universal space? Has it ceased to exist practically, and does it only continue to exist theoretically, in the fact that universal space has become warmer by a decimal fraction of a degree, beginning with ten or more knots? The indestructibility of motion forbids such an assumption, but it allows the possibility that by the successive falling into one another of the bodies of the universe, all existing mechanical motion will be converted into heat, and the latter radiated into space, so that in spite of all, quote-unquote, indestructibility of force, all motion in general would have ceased. Incidentally, it is seen here how inaccurate is the term indestructibility of force, instead of indestructibility of motion. Hence we arrive at the conclusion that in some way, 
which it will later be the task of scientific research to demonstrate, the heat radiated into space must be able to become transformed into another form of motion, in which it can once more be stored up and rendered active. Thereby the chief difficulty in the way of the reconversion of extinct suns into incandescent vapor disappears. For the rest, the eternally repeated succession of worlds in infinite time is only the logical complement to the coexistence of innumerable worlds in infinite space, a principle the necessity of which has forced itself even on the anti-theoretical Yankee brain of Draper. Footnote. Quote, the multiplicity of worlds in infinite space leads to the conception of a succession of worlds in infinite time. Unquote. J. W. Draper, History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, 1864, Volume 2, page 325. End of footnote. It is an eternal cycle in which matter moves, a cycle that certainly only completes its orbit in periods of time for which our terrestrial year is no adequate measure a cycle in which the time of highest development, the time of organic life, and still more that of the life of beings conscious of nature and of themselves, is just as narrowly restricted as the space in which life and self-consciousness come into operation, a cycle in which every finite mode of existence of matter, whether it be sun or nebular vapor, single animal or genus of animals, chemical combination or disassociation, is equally transient and wherein nothing is eternal but eternally changing, eternally moving matter, and the laws according to which it moves and changes. But however often and however relentlessly this cycle is completed in time and space, however many millions of suns and earths may arise and pass away, however long it may last before the conditions for organic life develop, however innumerable the organic beings that have to arise and to pass away before animals with a brain capable of thought are developed from their midst and for a short span of time find conditions suitable for life only to be exterminated later without mercy we have the certainty that matter remains eternally the same in all its transformations that none of its attributes can ever be lost and therefore also that with the same iron necessity that it will exterminate on the earth its highest creation the thinking mind it must somewhere else, and at another time, again produce it. Dialectics The general nature of dialectics, to be developed as the science of interconnections, in contrast to metaphysics. It is therefore from the history of nature and human society that the laws of dialectics are abstracted, for they are nothing but the most general laws of these two aspects of historical development, as well as of thought itself. And indeed, they can be reduced in the main to three. The law of the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa. The law of the interpenetration of opposites. The law of the negation of the negation. All three are developed by Hegel in his idealist fashion as mere laws of thought. The first, in the first part of his logic, in the doctrine of being, the second fills the whole of the second, and by far the most important part of his logic, the doctrine of essence. Finally, the third figures as the fundamental law for the construction of the whole system. The mistake lies in the fact that these laws are foisted on nature and history as laws of thought, and not deduced from them. This is the source of the whole forced and often outrageous treatment. The universe, willy-nilly, is made out to be arranged in accordance with a system of thought, which itself is only the product of a definite stage of evolution of human thought. If we turn the thing round, then everything becomes simple, and the dialectical laws that look so extremely mysterious in idealist philosophy at once become simple and clear as noonday. Moreover, anyone who is even only slightly acquainted with his Hegel will be aware that in hundreds of passages Hegel is capable of giving the most striking individual illustrations from nature and history of the dialectical laws. We are not concerned here with writing a handbook of dialectics, but only with showing that the dialectical laws are really laws of development of nature, and therefore are valid also for theoretical natural science.
Hence, we cannot go into the inner interconnection of these laws with one another. 1. The law of the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa. For our purpose, we could express this by saying that in nature, in a manner exactly fixed for each individual case, qualitative changes can only occur by the quantitative addition or subtraction of matter or motion, so-called energy. All qualitative differences in nature rest on differences of chemical composition or on different quantities or forms of motion, energy, or, as is almost always the case, on both. Hence, it is impossible to alter the quality of a body without addition or subtraction of matter or motion, that is, without the quantitative alteration of the body concerned. In this form, therefore, Hegel's mysterious principle appears not only quite rational, but even rather obvious. It is surely hardly necessary to point out that the various allotropic and aggregational states of bodies, because they depend on various groupings of the molecules, depend on greater or lesser quantities of motion communicated to the bodies. But what is the position in regard to change of form of motion, or so-called energy? If we change heat into mechanical motion or vice versa, is not the quality altered while the quantity remains the same? Quite correct, but it is with change of form of motion as with highness vices. Anyone can be virtuous by himself, for vices too are always necessary. Change of form of motion is always a process that takes place between at least two bodies, of which one loses a definite quantity of motion of one quality, for example heat, while the other gains a corresponding quantity of motion of another quality, mechanical motion, electricity, chemical decomposition. Hence, therefore, quantity and quality mutually correspond to each other. So far, it has not been found possible to convert motion from one form to another inside a single isolated body. We are concerned here in the first place with non-living bodies. The same law holds for living bodies, but it operates under very complex conditions, and at present quantitative measurement is still often impossible for us. If we imagine any non-living body cut up into smaller and smaller portions, at first no qualitative change occurs. But this has a limit. If we succeed, as by evaporation, in obtaining the separate molecules in the free state, then it is true that we can usually divide these still further, yet only with a complete change of quality. The molecule is decomposed into its separate atoms, which have quite different properties from those of the molecule. In the case of molecules composed of various chemical elements, atoms or molecules of these elements themselves make their appearance in the place of the compound molecule. In the case of molecules of elements, the free atoms appear, which exert quite distinctive qualitative effects. The free atoms of nascent oxygen are easily able to affect what the atoms of atmospheric oxygen bound together in the molecule can never achieve. But the molecule is also qualitatively different from the mass of the body to which it belongs. It can carry out movements independently of this mass, and while the latter remains apparently at rest, for example heat oscillations, by means of a change of position and of connection with neighboring molecules, it can change the body into an allotrope or a different state of aggregation. Thus we see that the purely quantitative operation of division has a limit at which it becomes transformed into a qualitative difference. The mass consists solely of molecules, but it is something essentially different from the molecule, just as the latter is different from the atom. It is this difference that is the basis for the separation of mechanics as the science of heavenly and terrestrial masses from physics as the mechanics of the molecule, and from chemistry as the physics of the atom. In mechanics, no qualities occur. At most, states such as equilibrium, motion, potential energy, which all depend on measurable transference of motion, and are themselves capable of quantitative expression. Hence, in so far as qualitative change takes place here, it is determined by a corresponding quantitative change. In physics, bodies are treated as chemically unaltered or indifferent. We have to do with changes of their molecular states, and with the change of form of the motion, 
which in all cases, at least on one of the two sides, brings the molecule into play. Here every change is a transformation of quantity into quality, a consequence of the quantitative change of the quantity of motion of one form or another that is inherent in the body or communicated to it. Quote, Thus, for instance, the temperature of water is first of all indifferent in relation to its state as a liquid, but by increasing or decreasing the temperature of liquid water, a point is reached at which this state of cohesion alters and the water becomes transformed on the one side into steam and on the other into ice. Unquote. Hegel, Encyclopedia, Collected Works 6, page 217. Similarly, a definite minimum current strength is required to cause the platinum wire of an electric incandescent lamp to glow, and every metal has its temperature of incandescence and fusion every liquid its definite freezing and boiling point at a given pressure, in so far as our means allow us to produce the temperature required. Finally, also every gas has its critical point at which it can be liquefied by pressure and cooling. In short, the so-called physical constants are for the most part nothing but designations of the nodal points at which quantitative addition or subtraction of motion produces qualitative alteration in the state of the body concerned, at which, therefore, quantity is transformed into quality. The sphere, however, in which the law of nature discovered by Hegel celebrates its most important triumphs is that of chemistry. Chemistry can be termed the science of the qualitative changes of bodies as a result of changed quantitative composition. That was already known to Hegel himself. In parentheses, Logic, Collected Works 3, page 488. As in the case of oxygen, if three atoms unite into a molecule, instead of the usual two, we get ozone, a body which is very considerably different from ordinary oxygen in its odor and reactions. Again, one can take the various proportions in which oxygen combines with nitrogen or sulfur, each of which produces a substance qualitatively different from any of the others. How different laughing gas, nitrogen monoxide, N2O, is from nitric anhydride, nitrogen pentoxide, N2O5. The first is a gas, the second at ordinary temperatures a solid crystalline substance. And yet, the whole difference in composition is that the second contains five times as much oxygen as the first and between the two of them are three more oxides of nitrogen, NO, N2O3, N2O2, each of which is qualitatively different from the first two and from each other. This is seen still more strikingly in the homologous series of carbon compounds, especially in the simpler hydrocarbons. Of the normal paraffins, the lowest is methane, CH4. Here, the four linkages of the carbon atom are saturated by four atoms of hydrogen. The second, ethane, C2H6, has two atoms of carbon joined together, and the six free linkages are saturated by six atoms of hydrogen. And so it goes on, with C3H8, C4H10, etc., according to the algebraic formula CnH2n plus 2 so that by each addition of CH2, a body is formed that is qualitatively distinct from the preceding one. The three lowest members of the series are gases, the highest known, hexadecane, C16H34, is a solid body with a boiling point of 270 degrees Celsius. Exactly the same holds good for the series of ethyl alcohol, C2H12O in any drinkable form without addition of other alcohols, and on another occasion take the same ethyl alcohol, but with a slight addition of amyl alcohol, C5H12O, which forms the main constituent of the notorious fusel oil. One's head will certainly be aware of it the next morning, much to its detriment, so that one could even say that the intoxication and subsequent morning-after feeling is also a quantity transformed into quality, on the hand of ethyl alcohol, and on the other hand of this added C3H6. 
In this series, we encounter the Hegelian law in yet another form. The lower members permit only of a single mutual arrangement of the atoms. If, however, the number of atoms united into a molecule attains a size definitely fixed for each series, the grouping of the atoms in the molecule can take place in more than one way, so that two or more isometric substances can be formed, having equal numbers of C, H, and O atoms in the molecule, but nevertheless qualitatively distinct from one another. We can even calculate how many such isomers are possible for each member of the series. Thus, in the paraffin series, for C4H10, there are two. For C6H12, there are three. Among the higher members, the number of possible isomers mounts very rapidly. Hence, once again, it is the quantitative number of atoms in the molecule that determines the possibility, and in so far as it has been proved, also the actual existence of such qualitatively distinct isomers. Still more, from the analogy of the substances with which we are acquainted in each of these series, we can draw conclusions as to the physical properties of the still unknown members of the series, and at least for the members immediately following the known ones, predict their properties, boiling point, etc., with fair certainty. Finally, the Hegelian law is valid not only for compound substances, but also for the chemical elements themselves. We now know that, quote, the chemical properties of the elements are a periodic function of their atomic weights, unquote. Roscoe Schorlemer, Complete Textbook of Chemistry, Volume 2, page 823, and that therefore their quality is determined by the quantity of their atomic weight. And the test of this has been brilliantly carried out. Mendeleev proved that various gaps occur in the series of related elements, arranged according to atomic weights, indicating that here new elements remain to be discovered. He described in advance the general chemical properties of one of these unknown elements, which he termed Ica aluminum, because it follows after aluminum in the series beginning with the latter, and he predicted its approximate, specific and atomic weight, as well as its atomic volume. A few years later, Lycaux de Beaubotron actually discovered this element, and Mendeleev's predictions fitted with only very slight discrepancies. Ica aluminum was realized in gallium. In parentheses, Ibid, page 828. By means of the unconscious application of Hegel's law of the transformation of quantity into quality, Mendeleev achieved a scientific feat, which it is not too bold to put on a par with that of Leverrier in calculating the orbit of the still unknown planet Neptune. In biology, as in the history of human society, the same law holds good at every step, but we prefer to dwell here on examples from the exact sciences, since here the quantities are accurately measurable and traceable. Probably the same gentlemen who up to now have decried the transformation of quantity into quality as mysticism and incomprehensible transcendentalism will now declare that it is indeed something quite self-evident, trivial and commonplace, which they have long employed, and so they have been taught nothing new. But to have formulated for the first time in its universally valid form a general law of development of nature, society and thought, will always remain an act of historic importance. And if these gentlemen have for years caused quantity and quality to be transformed into one another without knowing what they did, then they will have to console themselves with Moliere's Monsieur Jourdain, who had spoken prose all his life without having the slightest inkling of it. Basic Forms of Motion Motion, in the most general sense, conceived as the mode of existence, the inherent attribute of matter, comprehends all changes and processes occurring in the universe, from mere change of place right up to thinking. The investigation of the nature of motion had, as a matter of course, to start from the lowest, simplest forms of this motion, and to learn to grasp these before it could achieve anything in the way of explanation of the higher and more complicated forms. Hence, in the historical evolution of the natural sciences, we see how, first of all, the theory of simplest change of place, the mechanics of heavenly bodies and terrestrial masses, was developed. 
It was followed by the theory of molecular motion, physics, and immediately afterwards, almost alongside of it and in some places in advance of it, the science of the motion of atoms, chemistry. Only after these different branches of the knowledge of the forms of motion, governing non-living nature had attained a high degree of development, could the explanation of the processes of motion represented by the life process be successfully tackled. This advanced in proportion with the progress of mechanics, physics and chemistry. Consequently, while mechanics has for a fairly long time already been able adequately to refer to the effects in the animal body of the bony levers set into motion by muscular contraction, and to the laws that prevail also in non-living nature, the physico-chemical establishment of the other phenomena of life is still pretty much at the beginning of its course. Hence, in investigating here the nature of motion, we are compelled to leave the organic forms of motion out of account. We are compelled to restrict ourselves, in accordance with the state of science, to the forms of motion of non-living nature. All motion is bound up with some change of place, whether it be change of place of heavenly bodies, terrestrial masses, molecules, atoms, or ether particles. The higher the form of motion, the smaller this change of place. It in no way exhausts the nature of the motion concerned, but it is inseparable from the motion. It, therefore, has to be investigated before anything else. The whole of nature accessible to us forms a system, an interconnected totality of bodies. And by bodies we understand here all material existence, extending from stars to atoms indeed right to ether particles, in so far as one grants the existence of the last named. In the fact that these bodies are interconnected is already included that they react on one another, and it is precisely this mutual reaction that constitutes motion. It already becomes evident here that matter is unthinkable without motion, and if, in addition, matter confronts us as something given, equally uncreatable as indestructible, it follows that motion is also as uncreatable as indestructible. It became impossible to reject this conclusion as soon as it was recognized that the universe is a system, an interconnection of bodies. And since this recognition had been reached by philosophy, long before it came into effective operation in natural science, it is explicable why philosophy, fully 200 years before natural science, drew the conclusion of the uncreatability and indestructibility of motion. Even the form in which it did so is still superior to the present-day formulation of natural science. Descartes' principle, that the amount of motion present in the universe is always the same, has only the formal defect of applying a finite expression to an infinite magnitude. On the other hand, two expressions of the same law are at present current in natural science. Helmholtz's law of the conservation of force, and the newer, more precise, one of the conservation of energy. Of these, the one, as we shall see, says the exact opposite of the other, and moreover each of them expresses only one side of the relation. When two bodies act on each other so that a change of place of one or both of them results, this change of place can consist only in an approach or a separation. They either attract each other or they repel each other, or, as mechanics expresses it, the forces operating between them are central, acting along the line joining their centers. That this happens, that this is the case throughout the universe without exception, however complicated many movements may appear to be, is nowadays accepted as a matter of course. It would seem nonsensical to us to assume, when two bodies act on each other, and their mutual interaction is not opposed by any obstacle, or the influence of a third body, that this action should be effected otherwise than along the shortest and most direct path, that is, along the straight line joining their centers. It is well known, however, that Helmholtz, Erhaltung der Kraft, The Conservation of Force, Berlin, 1847, sections 1 and 2, has provided the mathematical proof that central action and unalterability of the quantity of motion are reciprocally conditioned and that the assumption of other than central actions leads to results in which motion could be either created or destroyed. Hence the basic form of all motion is approximation and separation, contraction and expansion, in short, the old polar opposites of attraction and repulsion. It is expressly to be noted that attraction and repulsion, 
are not regarded here as the so-called forces, but as simple forms of motion, just as Kant had already conceived matter as the unity of attraction and repulsion. What is to be understood by the conception of quote-unquote forces will be shown in due course. All motion consists in the interplay of attraction and repulsion. Motion, however, is only possible when each individual attraction is compensated by a corresponding repulsion somewhere else. Otherwise, in time, one side would get the preponderance over the other, and then motion would finally cease. Hence, all attraction and all repulsions in the universe must mutually balance one another. Thus the law of the indestructibility and uncreatability of motion takes the form that each movement of attraction in the universe must have as its complement an equivalent movement of repulsion and vice versa. Or as ancient philosophy, long before the natural scientific formulation of the law of conservation of force or energy expressed it, the sum of all attractions in the universe is equal to the sum of all repulsions. However, it appears that there are still two possibilities for all motion to cease at some time or other, either by repulsion and attraction finally cancelling each other out in actual fact, or by the total repulsion finally taking possession of one part of matter and the total attraction of the other part. For the dialectical conception, these possibilities are excluded from the outset. Dialectics has proved from the results of our experience of nature so far that all polar opposites in general are determined by the mutual action of the two opposite poles on one another, that the separation and opposition of these poles exists only within their unity and interconnection, and conversely, that their interconnection exists only in their separation and their unity only in their opposition. This once established, there can be no question of a final cancelling out of repulsion and attraction or of a final partition between the one form of motion in the one half of matter and the other form in the other half. Consequently, there can be no question of mutual penetration or of absolute separation of the two poles. It would be equivalent to demanding in the first case that the north and south poles of a magnet should mutually cancel themselves out, or in the second case, that dividing a magnet in the middle between the two poles should produce on one side a north half without a south pole, and on the other side a south half without a north pole. Although, however, the impermissibility of such assumptions follows at once from the dialectical nature of polar opposites, nevertheless, thanks to the prevailing metaphysical mode of thought of natural scientists, the second assumption at least, plays a certain part in physical theory. This will be dealt with in its place. How does motion present itself in the interaction of attraction and repulsion? We can best investigate this in the separate forms of motion itself. At the end, the general aspect of the matter will show itself. Let us take the motion of a planet about its central body. The ordinary school textbook of astronomy follows Newton in explaining the eclipse described as the result of the joint action of two forces, the attraction of the central body and a tangential force driving the planet along the normal to the direction of this attraction. Thus it assumes, besides the form of motion directed centrally, also another direction of motion, or so-called force, perpendicular to the line joining the central points. Thereby it contradicts the above-mentioned basic law, according to which all motion in our universe can only take place along the line joining the central points of the bodies acting on one another, or, as one says, is caused only by centrally acting forces. Equally, it introduces into the theory an element of motion which, as we have likewise seen, necessarily leads to the creation and destruction of motion, and therefore presupposes a creator. What had to be done, therefore, was to reduce this mysterious tangential force to a form of motion acting centrally, and this the Kant-Laplace theory of cosmogony accomplished. As is well known, according to this conception, the whole solar system arose from a rotating, extremely tenuous, gaseous mass by gradual contraction. The rotational motion is obviously strongest at the equator of this gaseous sphere, and individual gaseous rings separate themselves from the mass and clump themselves together into planets, planetoids, etc., which revolve round the central body in the direction of the original rotation. This rotation itself is usually explained from the motion characteristic of the individual particles of gas. This motion takes place in all directions, 
but finally an excess in one particular direction makes itself evident and so causes the rotating motion, which is bound to become stronger and stronger with the progressive contraction of the gaseous sphere. But whatever hypothesis is assumed of the origin of the rotation, it abolishes the tangential force, dissolving it in a special form of the phenomena of sensually acting motion. If the one element of planetary motion, the directly central one, is represented by gravitation, the attraction between the planet and the central body, then the other tangential element appears as a relic, in a derivative or altered form of the original repulsion of the individual particles of the gaseous sphere. Then the life process of a solar system presents itself as an interplay of attraction and repulsion, in which attraction gradually more and more gets the upper hand, owing to repulsion being radiated into space in the form of heat, and thus more and more becoming lost to the system. One sees at a glance that the form of motion here conceived as repulsion is the same as that which modern physics terms energy. By the contraction of the system and the resulting detachment of the individual bodies of which it consists today, the system has lost energy, and indeed this loss, according to Helmholtz's well-known calculation, already amounts to 453 out of 454 of the total quantity of motion, originally present in the form of repulsion. Let us take now a mass in the shape of a body on our Earth itself. It is connected with the Earth by gravitation, as the Earth in turn is with the Sun, but unlike the Earth it is incapable of a free planetary motion. It can be set up in motion only by an impulse from outside, and even then, as soon as the impulse ceases, its movement speedily comes to a standstill, whether by the effect of gravity alone, or by the latter in combination with the resistance of the medium in which it moves. This resistance is also in the last resort an effect of gravity, in the absence of which the Earth would not have on its surface any resistant medium, any atmosphere. Hence, in pure mechanical motion on the Earth's surface, we are concerned with a situation in which gravitation, attraction, decisively predominates where therefore the production of the motion shows both phases, first counteracting gravity, and then allowing gravity to act. In a word, production of rising and falling. Thus we have again a mutual action between attraction on the one hand, and a form of motion taking place in the opposite direction to it, hence a repelling form of motion on the other hand. But within the sphere of terrestrial pure mechanics, which deals with masses of given states of aggregation, and cohesion taken by it as unalterable. This repelling form of motion does not occur in nature. The physical and chemical conditions under which a lump of rock becomes separated from a mountain top or a fall of water becomes possible, lie outside our sphere. Therefore, in terrestrial pure mechanics, the repelling, raising motion must be produced artificially by human force, animal force, water or steam power, etc. And this circumstance, this necessity to combat the natural attraction artificially, causes the mechanicians to adopt the view that attraction, gravitation, or as they say, the force of gravity, is the most important, indeed the basic, form of motion in nature. When, for instance, a weight is raised and communicates motion to other bodies by falling directly or indirectly, then, according to the usual view of mechanics, it is not the raising of the weight which communicates this motion, but the force of gravity. Thus Helmholtz, for instance, makes, quote, The force which is the simplest and the one with which we are best acquainted, viz. gravity, act as the driving force. For instance, in grandfather clocks that are actuated by a weight, the weight cannot comply with the pull of gravity without setting the whole clockwork in motion, unquote. But it cannot set the clockwork in motion without itself sinking and it goes on sinking until the string from which it hangs is completely unwound. Quote, then the clock comes to a stop, for the operative capacity of the weight is exhausted for the time being. Its weight is not lost or diminished, it remains attracted to the same extent by the earth, but the capacity of this weight to produce movement has been lost. We can, however, wind up the clock by the power of the human arm, whereby the weight is once more raised up. As soon as this has happened, it regains its previous operative capacity and can again keep the clock in motion." Unquote. Helmholtz, Popular Lectures, German Edition, 
volume 2, pages 144 to 145. According to Helmholtz, therefore, it is not the active communication of motion, the raising of the weight, that sets the clock in motion, but the passive heaviness of the weight, although this same heaviness is only withdrawn from its passivity by the raising, and once again returns to passivity after the string of the weight has unwound. If then, according to the modern conception, as we saw above, energy is only another expression for repulsion, here in the older Helmholtz conception, force appears as another expression for the opposite of repulsion, for attraction. For the time being, we shall simply put this on record. When this process, as far as terrestrial mechanics is concerned, has reached its end, when the heavy mass has first of all been raised and then again let fall through the same height, what becomes of the motion that constituted it? For pure mechanics, it has disappeared. But we know now that it has by no means been destroyed. To a lesser extent, it has been conveyed into the air as oscillations of sound waves. To a much greater extent, into heat, which has been communicated in part to the resisting atmosphere, in part to the falling body itself, and finally in part to the floor, on which the weight comes to rest. The clock weight has also gradually given up its motion, in the form of frictional heat, to the separate driving wheels of the clockwork. But although, usually expressed in this way, it is not the falling motion, that is, the attraction, that has passed into heat, and therefore into a form of repulsion. On the contrary, as Helmholtz correctly remarks, the attraction, the heaviness, remains what it previously was, and, accurately speaking, becomes even greater. Rather, it is the repulsion communicated to the raised body by rising that is mechanically destroyed by falling and reappears as heat. The repulsion of masses is transformed into molecular repulsion. Heat, as already stated, is a form of repulsion. It sets the molecules of solid bodies into oscillation, thereby loosening the connections of the separate molecules, until finally the transition to the liquid state takes place. In the liquid state also, on continued addition of heat, it increases the motion of the molecules until a degree is reached at which the latter split off altogether from the mass, and, at a definite velocity determined for each molecule by its chemical constitution, they move away individually in the free state. With a still further addition of heat, this velocity is further increased, and so the molecules are more and more repelled from one another. But heat is a form of so-called energy. Here, once again, the latter proves to be identical with repulsion. In the phenomena of static electricity and magnetism, we have a polar division of attraction and repulsion. Whatever hypothesis may be adopted of the modus operandi of these two forms of motion, in view of the facts, no one has any doubt that attraction and repulsion, in so far as they are produced by static electricity or magnetism, and are able to develop unhindered, completely compensate one another, as in fact necessarily follows from the very nature of the polar division. The two poles whose activities did not completely compensate each other would indeed not be poles, and also have so far not been discovered in nature. For the time being, we will leave galvanism out of account, because in its case the process is determined by chemical reactions, which makes it more complicated. Therefore, let us investigate rather the chemical processes of motion themselves. When two parts by weight of hydrogen combine with 15.96 parts by weight of oxygen to form water vapor, an amount of heat of 68 0.924 heat units is developed during the process. Conversely, if 17.96 parts by weight of water vapor are to be decomposed into two parts by weight of hydrogen and 15.96 parts by weight of oxygen, this is only possible on condition that the water vapor has communicated to it an amount of motion equivalent to 68.924 heat units, whether in the form of heat itself or of electrical motion. The same thing holds for all other chemical processes. In the overwhelming majority of cases, motion is given off on combination and must be supplied on decomposition. Here too, as a rule, repulsion is the active side of the process more endowed with motion or requiring the addition of motion, while attraction is the passive side producing a surplus of motion and giving off motion. On this account, the modern theory also declares that on the whole, energy is set free on the combination of elements and is bound up on decomposition. 
and Helmholtz declares, quote, This force, chemical affinity, can be conceived as a form of attraction. This force of attraction between the atoms of carbon and oxygen performs work quite as much as that exerted on a raised weight by the Earth in the form of gravitation. When carbon and oxygen atoms rush at one another and combine to form carbonic acid, the newly formed particles of carbonic acid must be in very violent molecular motion, that is, in heat motion. When after they have given up their heat to the environment, we still have in the carbonic acid all the carbon, all the oxygen, and in addition, the affinity of both continuing to exist just as powerfully as before. But this affinity now expresses itself solely in the fact that the atoms of carbon and oxygen stick fast to one another and do not allow their being separated. Unquote. Helmholtz, Loco Citato, page 169. It is just as before. Helmholtz insists that in chemistry as in mechanics, force consists only in attraction, and therefore is the exact opposite of what other physicists call energy, and which is identical with repulsion. Hence, we have now no longer the two simple basic forms of attraction and repulsion, but a whole series of subforms in which the winding up and running down process of universal motion goes in opposition to both attraction and repulsion. It is, however, by no means merely in our minds that these manifold forms of appearance are comprehended under the single expression of motion. On the contrary, they themselves prove in action that they are forms of one and the same motion by passing into one another under given conditions. Mechanical motion of masses passes into heat, into electricity, into magnetism. Heat and electricity pass into chemical decomposition. Chemical combination in turn develops heat and electricity, and by means of the latter, magnetism. And finally, heat and electricity produce once more mechanical movement of masses. Moreover, these changes take place in such a way that a given quantity of motion of one form always has corresponding to it an exactly fixed quantity of another form. Further, it is a matter of indifference which form of motion provides the unit by which the amount of motion is measured, whether it serves for measuring mass motion, heat, so-called electromotive force, or the motion undergoing transformation in chemical process. We base ourselves here on the theory of the quote-unquote conservation of energy, established by J. R. Meyer in 1842, and afterwards worked out internationally with such brilliant success, and we have now to investigate the fundamental concepts nowadays made use of by this theory. These are the concepts of force, energy, and work. Footnote. Helmholtz, in his Pop Vorlesungen, Popular Lectures, Volume 2, page 113, appears to ascribe a certain share in the natural scientific proof of Descartes' principle of the quantitative immutability of motion to himself, as well as to Mayer, Joule, and Codling. Quote, I myself, without knowing anything of Meyer and Codling, and only becoming acquainted with Joule's experiments at the end of my work, proceeded along the same path. I occupied myself especially with searching out all the relations between the various processes of nature that could be deduced from the given mode of consideration. And I published my investigations in 1847 in a little work entitled Über die Erhaltung der Kraft on the Conservation of Force. Unquote. But in this work there is to be found nothing new for the position in 1847 beyond the above-mentioned mathematically very valuable development that quote-unquote conservation of force and central action of the forces active between the various bodies of a system are only two different expressions for the same thing. And further, a more accurate formulation of the law that the sum of the live and tensional forces in a given mechanical system is constant. In every other respect, it was already superseded since Mayer's second paper of 1845. Already in 1842, Mayer maintained the quote-unquote indestructibility of force, and from his new standpoint of 1845, he had much more brilliant things to say about the quote, relations between the various processes of nature, unquote, than Helmholtz had in 1847. End of footnote. It has been shown above that according to the modern view, now fairly generally accepted, Energy is the term used for repulsion, while Helmholtz generally uses the word force to express attraction. One could regard this as a mere distinction of form, inasmuch as attraction and repulsion compensate each other in the universe, 
and accordingly it would appear a matter of indifference which side of the relation is taken as positive and which as negative, just as it is of no importance in itself whether the positive abscisse are counted to the right or the left of a point in a given line. Nevertheless, this is not absolutely so. For we are concerned here, first of all, not with the universe, but with phenomena occurring on the Earth and conditioned by the exact position of the Earth in the solar system, and of the solar system in the universe. At every moment, however, our solar system gives out enormous quantities of motion into space, and motion of a very definite quality, viz. the sun's heat, that is, repulsion. But our Earth itself allows of the existence of life on it only owing to the sun's heat, and it in turn finally radiates into space the sun's heat received, after it has converted a portion of this heat into other forms of motion. Consequently, in the solar system and above all on the Earth, attraction already considerably preponderates over repulsion. Without the repulsive motion radiated to us from the sun, all motion on the Earth would cease. If tomorrow the sun were to become cold, the attraction on the Earth would still, other circumstances remaining the same, be what it is today. As before, a stone of 100 kilograms, wherever situated, would weigh 100 kilograms. But the motion, both of masses and of molecules and atoms, would come to what we regard as an absolute standstill. Therefore it is clear that for processes occurring on the Earth today, it is by no means a matter of indifference whether attraction or repulsion is conceived as the active side of motion, hence as quote-unquote force or quote-unquote energy. On the contrary, on the Earth today, attraction has already become altogether passive, owing to its decisive preponderance over repulsion. We owe all active motion to the supply of repulsion from the sun. Therefore, the modern school, even if it remains unclear about the nature of the relation constituting motion, Nevertheless, in point of fact, and for terrestrial processes, indeed for the whole solar system, is absolutely right in conceiving energy as repulsion. The expression energy by no means correctly expresses all the relationships of motion, for it comprehends only one aspect, the action but not the reaction. It still makes it appear as if energy was something external to matter, something implanted in it but in all circumstances it is to be preferred to the expression force. As conceded on all hands, from Hegel to Helmholtz, the notion of force is derived from the activity of the human organism within its environment. We speak of muscular force, of the lifting force of the arm, of the leaping power of the legs, of the digestive force of the stomach and the intestinal canal, of the sensory force of the nerves, of the secretory force of the glands, etc., in other words, in order to save having to give the real cause of a change brought about by a function of our organism, we fabricate a fictitious cause, a so-called force corresponding to the change. Then we carry this convenient method over to the external world also, and so invent as many forces as there are diverse phenomena. In Hegel's time, natural science, with the exception perhaps of heavenly and terrestrial mechanics, was still in this naive state and Hegel quite correctly attacks the prevailing way of denoting forces, in parentheses, passage to be quoted. Footnote, see Appendix 2, page 881. End of footnote. Similarly, in another passage, quote, It is better to say that a magnet has a soul, as Thales expressed it, than that it has an attracting force. Force is a kind of property which is separable from matter, and put forward as a predicate, while soul, on the other hand, is its movement identical with the nature of matter? Unquote. Geschichte der Philosophie, History of Philosophy, Volume 1, page 208. Today, we no longer make it so easy for ourselves in regard to forces. Let us listen to Helmholtz. Quote, if we are fully acquainted with the natural law, we must also demand that it should operate without exception. Thus the law confronts us as an objective power, and accordingly we term it a force. For instance, we objectivize the law of the refraction of light as a refractive power of transparent substances, the law of chemical affinities as a force of affinity of the various substances for one another. Thus we speak of the electrical force of contact of metals, of the force of adhesion, capillary force, and so on. These names objectivize laws which, in the first place, 
embrace only a limited series of natural processes, the conditions for which are still rather complicated. Force is only the objectivized law of action. The abstract idea of force introduced by us only makes the addition that we have not arbitrarily invented this law, but that it is a compulsory law of phenomena. Hence our demand to understand the phenomena of nature, that is, find out their laws, takes on another form of expression, viz., that we have to seek out the forces which are the causes of the phenomena. Unquote. Loco Citato, pages 189 to 191, Innsbruck Lecture of 1869. Firstly, it is certainly a peculiar manner of quote-unquote objectivizing if the purely subjective notion of force is introduced into a natural law that has already been established as independent of our subjectivity and therefore completely objective. At most, an old Hegelian of the strictest type might permit himself such a thing, but not a neo-Kantian like Helmholtz. Neither the law, when once established, nor its objectivity, nor that of its action, acquires the slightest new objectivity by our interpolating a force into it. What is added is our subjective assertion that it acts in virtue of some so far entirely unknown force. The secret meaning, however, of this interpolation is seen as soon as Helmholtz gives us examples. Refraction of light, chemical affinity, contact electricity, adhesion, capillary, and confers on the laws that govern these phenomena the quote-unquote objective honorary rank of forces. Quote, these names objectivize laws which in the first place embrace only a limited series of natural processes, the conditions for which are still rather complicated, unquote. And it is just here that the quote-unquote objectivizing, which is rather subjectivizing, gets its meaning, not because we have become fully acquainted with the law, but just because that is not the case. Just because we are not yet clear about the quote-unquote rather complicated conditions of these phenomena, we often resort here to the word force. We express thereby not our scientific knowledge, but our lack of scientific knowledge of the nature of the law and its mode of action. In this sense, as a short expression for a causal connection that has not yet been explained, as a makeshift expression, it may pass for current usage. Anything more than that is bad. With just as much right as Helmholtz explains physical phenomena from a so-called refractive force, electrical force of contact, etc., the medieval scholastics explained temperature changes by means of a vis calorifica and a vis frigifaciens and thus saved themselves all further investigation of heat phenomena. And even in this sense it is one-sided, for it expresses everything in a one-sided manner. All natural processes are two-sided. They rest on the relation of at least two effective parts, action and reaction. The notion of force, however, owing to its origin from the action of the human organism on the external world, and further because of terrestrial mechanics, implies that only one part is active, effective, the other being passive, receptive. Hence it lays down a not yet demonstrable extension of the difference between the sexes to non-living objects. The reaction of the second part, on which the force works, appears at most as a passive reaction, as a resistance. This mode of conception is permissible in a number of fields, even outside pure mechanics, namely where it is a matter of the simple transference of motion and its quantitative calculation. But already in the more complicated physical processes, it is no longer adequate, as Helmholtz's own examples prove. The refractive force lies just as much in the light itself as in the transparent bodies. In the case of adhesion and capillary, it is certain that the quote-unquote force is just as much situated in the surface of the solid as in the liquid. In contact electricity, at any rate, it is certain that both metals contribute to it, and quote-unquote chemical affinity also is situated, if anywhere, in both parts entering into combination. But a force which consists of separate forces an action which does not evoke its reaction, but which exists solely by itself, is no force in the sense of terrestrial mechanics, the only science in which one really knows what is meant by a force. For the basic conditions of terrestrial mechanics are, firstly, refusal to investigate the causes of the impulse, that is, the nature of the particular force, and secondly, 
the view of the one-sidedness of the force, it being everywhere opposed by an identical gravitational force, such that in comparison with any terrestrial distance of fall, the Earth's radius equals infinity. But let us see further how Helmholtz quote-unquote objectifies his quote-unquote forces into natural laws. In a lecture of 1854, Loco Citato, page 119, he examines the quote-unquote store of working force, originally contained in the nebular sphere from which our solar system was formed. Quote, In point of fact, it received an enormously large legacy in this respect, if only in the form of the general force of attraction of all its parts for one another, unquote. This indubitably is so, but it is equally indubitable that the whole of this legacy of gravitation is present undiminished in the solar system today, apart perhaps from the minute quantity that was lost together with the matter. We should now call this potential energy, which was flung out, possibly irrevocably, into space. Further, quote, the chemical forces too must have been already present and ready to act, but as these forces could become effective only on intimate contact of the various kinds of masses, condensation had to take place before they came into play, unquote. If, as Helmholtz does above, we regard these chemical forces as forces of affinity, hence as attraction, then again we are bound to say that the sum total of these chemical forces of attraction still exists undiminished within the solar system. But on the same page, Helmholtz gives us the results of his calculations, quote, that perhaps only the 454th part of the original mechanical force exists as such, unquote. That is to say, in the solar system. How is one to make sense of that? The force of attraction, general as well as chemical, is still present unimpaired in the solar system. Helmholtz does not mention any other certain source of force. In any case, according to Helmholtz, these forces have performed tremendous work, but they have neither increased nor diminished on that account. As it is with the clock weight mentioned above, so it is with every molecule in the solar system and with the solar system itself. Quote, its gravitation is neither lost nor diminished. Unquote. What happens to carbon and oxygen, as previously mentioned, holds good for all chemical elements. The total given quantity of each one remains, and, quote, the total force of affinity continues to exist just as powerfully as before, unquote. What have we lost then, and what, quote-unquote, force has performed the tremendous work, which is 453 times as big as that which, according to his calculation, the solar system is still able to perform? Up to this point, Helmholtz has given no answer. But further on he says, quote, Whether a further reserve of force in the shape of heat was present, we do not know. Unquote. But if we may be allowed to mention it, heat is a repulsive force. It acts therefore against the direction of both gravity and chemical attraction, being minus if these are put as plus. Hence if, according to Helmholtz, the original store of force is composed of general and chemical attraction, an extra reserve of heat would have to be not added to that reserve of force, but subtracted from it. Otherwise the sun's heat would have had to strengthen the force of attraction of the earth when it causes water to evaporate in direct opposition to this attraction and the water vapor to rise. Or the heat of an incandescent iron tube through which steam is passed would strengthen the chemical attraction of oxygen and water, whereas it puts it out of action. Or to make the same thing clear in another form, let us assume that the nebular sphere with radius r, and therefore with volume four-thirds in parentheses pi r to the power of three, has a temperature t. Let us further assume a second nebular sphere of equal mass having at the higher temperature capital T, the larger radius capital R, and volume four-thirds in parentheses pi, capital R to the power of three. Now it is obvious that in the second nebular sphere, the attraction, mechanical as well as physical and chemical, can act with the same force as in the first, only when it has shrunk from radius capital R to radius lowercase r. That is, when it has radiated into world space, heat corresponding to the temperature difference capital T lowercase t. A hotter nebular sphere will therefore condense later than a colder one, 
Consequently, the heat, considered from Helmholtz's standpoint as an obstacle to condensation, is no plus but a minus of the quote-unquote reserve of force. Helmholtz, by presupposing the possibility of a quantum of repulsive motion in the form of heat becoming added to the attractive forms of motion and increasing the total of these latter, commits a definite error of calculation. Let us now bring the whole of this quote-unquote reserve of force, possible as well as demonstrable, under the same mathematical sign, so that an addition is possible. Since for the time being we cannot reverse the heat, and replace its repulsion by the equivalent attraction, we shall have to perform this reversal with the two forms of attraction. Then, instead of the general force of attraction, instead of the chemical affinity, and instead of the heat, which moreover possibly already exists as such at the outset, we have simply to put the sum of the repulsive motion or so-called energy present in the gaseous sphere at the moment when it becomes independent. And by doing so, Helmholtz's calculation will also hold, in which he wants to calculate, quote, the heating that must arise from the assumed initial condensation of the heavenly bodies of our system from nebulously scattered matter, unquote. By thus reducing the whole, quote-unquote, reserve of force to heat, repulsion, he also makes it possible to add on the assumed, quote-unquote, heat reserve force. The calculation then asserts that 453 out of 454 of all energy, that is, repulsion, originally present in the gaseous sphere has been radiated into space in the form of heat, or, to put it accurately, that the sum of all attraction in the present solar system is the sum of all repulsion, still present in the same as 453 to 1. But then it directly contradicts the text of the lecture to which it is added as proof. If then the notion of force, even in the case of a physicist like Helmholtz, gives rise to such confusion of ideas, this is the best proof that it is in general not susceptible of scientific use in all branches of investigation, which go beyond the calculations of mechanics. In mechanics, the causes of motion are taken as given, and their origin is disregarded, only their effects being taken into account. Hence, if a cause of motion is termed a force, this does no damage to mechanics as such, but it becomes the custom to transform this term also to physics, chemistry and biology, and then confusion is inevitable. We have already seen this and shall frequently see it again. For the concept of work, see the next chapter. The Measure of Motion, Work Quote, On the other hand, I have always found hitherto that the basic concepts in this field, that is, quote, the basic physical concepts of work and their unalterability, unquote, seem very difficult to grasp for persons who have not gone through the school of mathematical mechanics, in spite of all zeal, all intelligence, and even a fairly high degree of scientific knowledge. Moreover, it cannot be denied that they are abstractions of a quite peculiar kind. It was not without difficulty that even such an intellectual as that of I. Kant succeeded in understanding them, as is proved by his polemic against Leibniz on this subject. Unquote. So says Helmholtz, Popular Scientific Lectures, Volume 2, Preface. According to this, we are venturing now into a very dangerous field, the more so since we cannot very well take the liberty of guiding the reader, quote, through the school of mathematical mechanics, unquote. Perhaps, however, it will turn out that, where it is a question of concepts, dialectical thinking will carry us at least as far as mathematical calculation. Galileo discovered, on the one hand, the law of falling, according to which the distances traveled by falling bodies are proportional to the squares of the time taken in falling. On the other hand, as we shall see, he put forward the not quite compatible law that the magnitude of motion of a body, its impeto or momento, is determined by the mass and velocity in such a way that for constant mass it is proportional to the velocity. Descartes adopted this law and made the product of the mass and the velocity of the moving body quite generally into the measure of its motion. Huygens had already found that, on elastic impact, the sum of the products of the masses, multiplied by the squares of their velocities, remains the same before and after impact, and that an analogous law, 
holds good in various other cases of motion to a system of connected bodies. Leibniz was the first to realize that the Cartesian measure of motion was in contradiction to the law of falling. On the other hand, it could not be denied that in many cases the Cartesian measure was correct. Accordingly, Leibniz divided moving forces into dead forces and live forces. The dead were the quote-unquote pushes or pulls of resting bodies, and their measure the product of the mass and the velocity with which the body would move if it were to pass from a state of rest to one of motion. On the other hand, he put forward as the measure of vis viva, of the real motion of a body, the product of the mass and the square of the velocity. This new measure of motion he derived directly from the law of falling. The same force is required, so Leibniz concluded, quote, to raise a body of four pounds in weight one foot, as to raise a body of one pound in weight four feet. But the distances are proportional to the square of the velocity, for when a body has fallen four feet, it attains twice the velocity reached on falling only one foot. However, bodies on falling acquire the force for rising to the same height as that from which they fell. Hence the forces are proportional to the square of the velocity. Unquote. Suter, Geschichte der Mathematik, History of Mathematics, Volume 2, page 367. But he showed further that the measure of motion, mv, is in contradiction to the Cartesian law of the constancy of the quantity of motion, for if it was really valid, the force, that is, the quantity of motion in nature, would continually increase or diminish. He even devised an apparatus, in parentheses, 1690, Acta eruditorum, which, if the measure mv were correct, would be bound to act as a perpetuum mobile, with continual gain of force, which, however, would be absurd. Recently, Helmholtz has again frequently employed this kind of argument. The Cartesians protested with might and main, and there developed a famous controversy lasting many years, in which Kant also participated in his very first work, Gedanken von der Waren, Schätzung der lebendigen Kräfte, Thoughts on the True Estimation of Life Forces, 1746, without, however, seeing clearly into the matter. Mathematicians today look down with a certain amount of scorn on this quote-unquote barren controversy, which, quote, dragged out for more than 40 years and divided the mathematicians of Europe into two hostile camps, until at last D'Alembert, by his Traite de Dynamique, 1743, as it were, by a final verdict, put an end to the useless verbal dispute, for it was nothing else. Unquote. Suter, Ibid, page 366. It would, however, seem that a controversy could not rest entirely on a useless verbal dispute when it had been initiated by a Leibniz against a Descartes, and had occupied a man like Kant to such an extent that he devoted to it his first work, a fairly large volume. And in point of fact, how is it to be understood that motion has two contradictory measures, that on one occasion it is proportional to the velocity, and on another to the square of the velocity? Suter makes it very easy for himself. He says both sides were right and both were wrong. Quote, Nevertheless, the expression vis viva has endured up to the present day, only it no longer serves as the measure of force, but is merely a term that was once adopted for the product of the mass and half the square of the velocity, a product so full of significance in mechanics. Unquote. Hence, mv remains the measure of motion, and vis viva is only another expression for mv squared divided by 2, concerning which formula we learn indeed that it is of great significance for mechanics, but now most certainly do not know what significance it has. Let us, however, take up the salvation bringing Traite de Dynamique and look more closely at D'Alembert's quote-unquote final verdict. It is to be found in the preface. In the text it says, The whole question does not occur on account of l'unitilité parfait don elle est pour la mécanique. This is quite correct for purely mathematical mechanics, in which, as in the case of Suter above, words used as designations are only other expressions or names, 
for algebraic formulae, names in connection with which it is best not to think at all. Nevertheless, since such important people have concerned themselves with the matter, he desires to examine it briefly in the preface. Clearness of thought demands that by the force of moving bodies one should understand only their property of overcoming obstacles or resisting them. Hence, force is to be measured neither by mv squared nor by xxx, but solely by the obstacles and the resistance they offer. Now, there are, he says, three kinds of obstacles. One, insuperable obstacles which totally destroy the motion and for that very reason cannot be taken into account here. 2. Obstacles whose resistance suffices to arrest the motion and to do so instantaneously, the case of equilibrium. 3. Obstacles which only gradually arrest the motion, the case of retarded motion. Quote, Everyone will agree that the two bodies are in equilibrium when the products of their masses and virtual velocities, that is to say, the velocities with which they tend to move are equal on each side. Hence, in equilibrium, the product of the mass and the velocity, or what is the same thing, the quantity of motion, can represent the force. Everyone will agree also that in retarded motion, the number of obstacles overcome is as the square of the velocity, so that, for instance, a body which has compressed a spring with a certain velocity could, with twice the velocity, compress simultaneously or successively not two but four springs similar to the first, or nine with triple the velocity, and so on. Hence the partisans of vis viva, the Leibnizians, conclude that the force of bodies actually in motion is in general proportional to the product of the mass and the square of the velocity. Basically, what inconvenience could there be in forces being measured differently in equilibrium and in retarded motion, since if one wants to use only clearer views in reasoning, one should understand by the word force only the effect produced in surmounting the obstacle or resisting it. Unquote. Preface, pages 19 to 20, of the original edition. The Allenbert, however, is far too much of a philosopher not to realize that the contradiction of a twofold measure of one and the same force is not to be got over so easily. Therefore, after repeating what is basically only the same thing as Leibniz had already said, for his equilibre is precisely the same thing as the quote-unquote dead pressure of Leibniz, he suddenly goes over to the side of the Cartesians and finds the following expedient. The product mv can serve as a measure of force even in the case of delayed motion. Quote, if in this last case the force is measured, not by the absolute magnitude of the obstacles, but by the sum of the resistance of these same obstacles. For it could not be doubted that this sum of the resistances would be proportional to the quantity of motion, in parentheses mv, since by general agreement the quantity of motion lost by the body at each instant is proportional to the product of the resistance and the infinitely small duration of the instant, and the sum of these products evidently makes up the total resistance. Unquote. This latter mode of calculation seems to him the more natural one, quote, for an obstacle is only such, inasmuch as it offers resistance, and properly speaking, it is the sum of the resistances that constitutes the obstacle overcome. Moreover, in estimating the force in this way, one has the advantage of having a common measure for the equilibrium and for the retarded motion, unquote. pages 20 to 21. Still, everyone can take that as he likes. And so, believing he has solved the question, by what, as Souter himself acknowledges, is a mathematical blunder, he concludes with unkind remarks on the confusion reigning among his predecessors, and asserts that after the above remarks there is possible only a very futile metaphysical discussion, or a still more discreditable, purely verbal dispute. The Allenbert's proposal for reaching a reconciliation amounts to the following calculation. A mass 1 with velocity 1 compresses one spring in unit time. A mass 1 with velocity 2 compresses four springs, but requires two units of time, that is, only two springs per unit of time. A mass with velocity 3 compresses nine springs in three units of time, 
that is, only three springs per unit of time. Hence, if we divide the effect by the time required for it, we again come from mv squared to mv. This is the same argument that Catalan in particular had already employed against Leibniz. It is true that a body with velocity 2 rises against gravity four times as high as one with velocity 1, but it requires double the time for it. Consequently, the quantity of motion must be divided by the time, and equals 2, not equals 4. Curiously enough, this is also Suter's view, who indeed deprived the expression vis viva of all logical meaning and left it only a mathematical one. But this is natural. For Suter, it is a question of saving the formula mv in its significance as sole measure of the quantity of motion. Hence, logically, mv squared is sacrificed in order to arise again transfigured in the heaven of mathematics. However, this much is correct. Catalan's argument provides one of the bridges connecting mv with mv squared, and so is of importance. The mechanicians subsequent to D'Alembert by no means accepted his verdict, for his final verdict was indeed in favor of mv as the measure of motion. They adhered to his expression of the distinction which Leibniz had already made between dead and live forces. mv is valid for equilibrium, that is, for statics. mv squared is valid for motion against resistance, that is, for dynamics. Although on the whole correct, the distinction in this form has, however, logically no more meaning than the famous pronouncement of the junior officer, on duty always to me, off duty always me. It is accepted tacitly, it just exists. We cannot alter it, and if a contradiction lurks in this double measure, how can we help it? Thus, for instance, Thomson and Tate say, in parentheses, a treatise on natural philosophy, Oxford, 1867, page 162, quote, the quantity of motion or the momentum of a rigid body moving without rotation is proportional to its mass and velocity conjointly. Double mass or double velocity would correspond to double quantity of motion, unquote. And immediately below that they say, quote, the vis viva or kinetic energy of a moving body is proportional to the mass and the square of the velocity conjointly, unquote. The two contradictory measures of motion are put side by side in this very glaring form. Not so much as the slightest attempt is made to explain the contradiction, or even to disguise it. In the book by these two Scotsmen, thinking is forbidden, only calculation is permitted. No wonder that at least one of them, Tate, is accounted one of the most pious Christians of pious Scotland. In Kirchhoff's Vorlesungen über mathematische Mechanik, Lectures on Mathematical Mechanics, the formulae mv and mv squared, do not occur at all in this form. Perhaps Helmholtz will aid us. In his Erhaltung der Kraft, Conservation of Force, he proposes to express vis viva by mv squared divided by 2, a point to which we shall return later. Then on page 20 at sec, he enumerates briefly the cases in which so far the principle of the conservation of vis viva, hence of mv squared divided by 2, has been recognized and made use of. Included therein under number 2 is, quote, the transference of motion by incompressible solid and fluid bodies, insofar as friction or impact of inelastic materials does not occur. For these cases, our general principle is usually expressed in the rule that motion propagated and altered by mechanical powers always decreases in intensity of force in the same proportion as it increases in velocity. If therefore we imagine a weight, m, being raised with velocity c by a machine in which a force for performing work is produced uniformly by some process or other, then with a different mechanical arrangement the weight, n m, could be raised only with velocity c divided by n so that in both cases the quantity of tensile force produced by the machine in unit time is represented by mgc, where g is the intensity of the gravitational force. Unquote. Thus, here too, we have the contradiction that a quote-unquote intensity of force, which decreases and increases in simple proportion to the velocity, 
has to serve as proof for the conservation of an intensity of force which decreases and increases in proportion to the square of the velocity. In any case, it becomes evident here that mv and mv squared serve to determine two quite distinct processes, but we certainly knew long ago that mv squared cannot equal mv unless v equals l. In any case, it becomes evident here that mv and mv squared divided by 2 serve to determine two quite distinct processes, but we certainly knew that long ago, for mv squared cannot equal mv unless v equals 1. What has to be done is to make it comprehensible why motion should have a twofold measure, a thing which is surely just as impermissible in science as in commerce. Let us therefore attempt this in another way. By mv, then, one measures, quote, a motion propagated and altered by mechanical powers, unquote. Hence this measure holds good for the lever and all its derivatives, for wheels, screws, etc., in short, for all machinery for the transference of motion. But from a very simple and by no means new consideration, it becomes evident that in so far as mv applies here, so also does mv squared. Let us take any mechanical contrivance in which the sums of the lever arms on two sides are related to each other as four to one, in which, therefore, a weight of one kilogram holds a weight of four kilogram in equilibrium. Hence, by a quite insignificant additional force on one arm of the lever, we can raise one kilogram by twenty meters. The same additional force, when applied to the other arm of the lever, raises four kilogram a distance of five meters, and the preponderating weight sinks in the same time that the other weight requires for rising. Mass and velocity are inversely proportional to one another. mv 1 times 20 equals m prime v prime 4 times 5. On the other hand, if we let each of the weights, after it has been raised, fall freely to the original level, then the 1, 1 kilogram after falling a distance of 20 meters, in parentheses, the acceleration due to gravity is put in round figures, 10 meters instead of 9.81 meters, attains a velocity of 20 meters. The other, 4 kilogram, after falling a distance of 5 meters, attains a velocity of 10 meters. mv squared equals 1 times 20 times 20 equals 400 equals m prime v prime squared equals 4 times 10 times 10 equals 400. On the other hand, the times of fall are different. The 4 kilogram traversed their 5 meters in 1 second. The 1 kilogram traverses its 20 meters in 2 seconds. Friction and air resistance are, of course, neglected here. But after each of the two bodies has fallen from its height, its motion ceases. Therefore, mv appears here as the measure of simple, transferred, hence lasting mechanical motion, and mv squared as the measure of the vanished mechanical motion. Further, the same thing applies to the impact of perfectly elastic bodies. The sum of both mv and of mv squared is unaltered before and after impact. Both measures have the same validity. This is not the case on impact of inelastic bodies. Here too, the current elementary textbooks, higher mechanics is hardly concerned at all with such trifles, teach that before and after impact, the sum of mv remains the same. On the other hand, a loss of vis viva occurs, for if the sum of mv squared after impact is subtracted from the sum of mv squared before impact, there is under all circumstances a positive remainder. By this amount, or the half of it, according to the notation adopted, the vis viva is diminished owing both to the mutual penetration and to the change of form of the colliding bodies. The latter is now clear and obvious, but not so the first assertion that the sum of mv remains the same before and after impact. In spite of Suter, vis viva is motion, and if a part of it is lost, motion is lost. Consequently, either mv here incorrectly expresses the quantity of motion, or the above assertion is untrue. In general, the whole theorem has been handed down from a period when there was as yet no inkling of the transformation of motion.
When, therefore, a disappearance of mechanical motion was only conceded where there was no other way out. Thus, the equality here of the sum of mv before and after impact was taken as proved by the fact that no loss or gain of this sum had been introduced. If, however, the bodies lose vis viva in internal friction corresponding to their inelasticity, they also lose velocity, and the sum of mv after impact must be smaller than before. For it is surely not possible to neglect the internal friction in calculating mv when it makes itself felt so clearly in calculating mv squared. But this does not matter. Even if we admit the theorem and calculate the velocity after falling, on the assumption that the sum of mv has remained the same, this decrease of the sum of mv squared is still found. Here, therefore, mv and mv squared conflict, and they do so by the difference of the mechanical motion that has actually disappeared. Moreover, the calculation itself shows that the sum of mv squared expresses the quantity of motion correctly, while the sum of mv expresses it incorrectly. Such are pretty nearly all the cases in which mv is employed in mechanics. Let us now glance at some cases in which mv squared is employed. When a cannonball is fired, it uses up in its course an amount of motion that is proportional to mv squared, irrespective of whether it encounters a solid target or comes to a standstill owing to the air resistance and gravitation. If a railway train runs into a stationary one, the violence of the collision and the corresponding destruction is proportional to its mv squared. Similarly, mv squared serves wherever it is necessary to calculate the mechanical force required for overcoming a resistance. But what is the meaning of this convenient phrase, so current in mechanics, overcoming a resistance? If we overcome the resistance of gravity by raising a weight, there disappears a quantity of motion, a quantity of mechanical force, equal to that produced anew by the direct or indirect fall of the raised weight from the height reached back to its original level. The quantity is measured by half the product of the mass and the final velocity after falling, mv squared divided by 2. What then occurred on raising the weight? Mechanical motion or force disappeared as such, but it has not been annihilated. It has been converted into mechanical force of tension, to use Helmholtz's expression, into potential energy, as the moderns say, into ergal, as Clausius calls it, and this can at any moment, by any mechanically appropriate means, be reconverted into the same quantity of mechanical motion as was necessary to produce it. The potential energy is only the negative expression of the vis viva and vice versa. A 24-pound cannonball, moving with a velocity of 400 meters per second, strikes the one meter thick armor plating of a warship and under these conditions has apparently no effect on the armor. Consequently, an amount of mechanical motion has vanished equal to mv squared divided by 2, that is, since 24 pounds equals 12 kilograms, equals 12 times 400 times 400 times 1 divided by 2, equals 960,000 kilometer meters. What has become of it? A small portion has been expended in the concussion and molecular alteration of the armor plate. A second portion goes in smashing the cannonball into innumerable fragments. But the greater part has been converted into heat and raises the temperature of the cannonball to red heat. When the Prussians, in passing over to Alsen in 1864, brought their heavy batteries into play against the armored sides of the Rolf Krake, after each hit they saw in the darkness the flare produced by the suddenly glowing shot. Even earlier, Whitworth had proved by experiment that explosive shells need no detonator when used against armored warships. The glowing metal itself ignites the charge. Taking the mechanical equivalent of the unit of heat as 424 kilogram meters, the quantity of heat corresponding to the above-mentioned amount of mechanical motion is 2,264 units. The specific heat of iron equals 0 0.1140. That is to say, the amount of heat that raises the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius, which serves as the unit of heat, 
suffices to raise the temperature of 1 divided by 0 0.1140 equals 8.772 kilograms of iron by 1 degree Celsius. Therefore, the 2264 heat units mentioned above raise the temperature of 1 kilogram of iron by 8.772 times 2264 equals 19,860 degrees Celsius or 19,866 of iron by 1 degree Celsius. Since this quantity of heat is distributed uniformly in the armor and the shot, the latter has its temperature raised by 19,860 divided by 2 times 12 equals 828 degrees, amounting to quite a good glowing heat. But since the foremost striking end of the shot receives at any rate by far the greater part of the heat, certainly double that of the rear half, the former would be raised to a temperature of 1,104 degrees Celsius, and the latter to 552 degrees Celsius, which would fully suffice to explain the glowing effect, even if we make a big deduction for the actual mechanical work performed on impact. Mechanical motion disappears in friction to reappear as heat. It is well known that by the most accurate possible measurement of the two processes, Joule in Manchester and Codling in Copenhagen were the first to make an approximate experimental measurement of the mechanical equivalent of heat. The same thing applies to the production of an electric current in a magneto-electrical machine by means of a mechanical force, for example from a steam engine. The quantity of so-called electromotive force produced in a given time is proportional to the quantity of mechanical motion used up in the same period, being equal to it if expressed in the same units. We can imagine this quantity of mechanical motion being produced not by a steam engine, but by a weight falling in accordance with the pressure of gravity. The mechanical force that this is capable of supplying is measured by the vis viva that it would obtain on falling freely through the same distance, or by the force required to raise it again to the original height, in both cases mv squared divided by 2. Hence we find that while it is true that mechanical motion has a twofold measure, each of these measures holds good for a very definitely demarcated series of phenomena. If already existing mechanical motion is transferred in such a way that it remains as mechanical motion, the transference takes place in proportion to the product of the mass and the velocity. If, however, it is transferred in such a way that it disappears as mechanical motion in order to reappear in the form of potential energy, heat, electricity, etc., in short, if it is converted into another form of motion, then the quantity of this new form of motion is proportional to the product of the originally moving mass and the square of the velocity. In short, mv is mechanical motion measured as mechanical motion. mv squared divided by 2 is mechanical motion measured by its capacity to become converted into a definite quantity of another form of motion. And as we have seen, these two measures, because different, do not contradict one another. It becomes clear from this that Leibniz's quarrel with the Cartesians was by no means a mere verbal dispute, and that d'Alembert's verdict in point of fact settled nothing at all. D'Alembert might have spared himself his tirades on the unclearness of his predecessors, for he was just as unclear as they were. In fact, as long as it was not known what becomes of the apparently annihilated mechanical motion, the absence of clarity was inevitable. As long as mathematical mechanicians like Suter remain obstinately shut in by the four walls of their special science, they are bound to remain just as unclear as d'Alembert and to put us off with empty and contradictory phrases. But how does modern mechanics express this conversion of mechanical motion into another form of motion, proportional in quantity to the former? It has performed work, and indeed a definite amount of work. But this does not exhaust the concept of work in the physical sense of the word. If, as in a steam or heat engine, heat is converted into mechanical motion, that is, molecular motion is converted into mass motion, if heat breaks up a chemical compound, if it becomes converted into electricity in a thermopile, if an electric current sets free the elements of water from dilute sulfuric acid, or conversely, if the motion, alias energy, produced in the chemical process of a current-producing cell, takes the form of electricity, and this in the circuit once more becomes converted into heat, 
In all these processes, the form of motion that initiates the process, and which is converted by it into another form, performs work, and indeed a quantity of work corresponding to its own quantity. Work, therefore, is change of form of motion regarded in its quantitative aspect. But how so? If a raised weight remains suspended and at rest, is its potential energy during the period of rest also a form of motion? Certainly, even Tate arrives at the conviction that potential energy is subsequently resolved into a form of actual motion. Nature, volume 14, page 459. And apart from that, Kirchhoff goes much further in saying, Mathematical Mechanics, page 32, quote, Rest is a special case of motion, unquote, and thus proves that he can not only calculate, but can also think dialectically. Hence, by a consideration of the two measures of mechanical motion, we arrive incidentally, easily and almost as a matter of course, at the concept of work, which was described to us as being so difficult to comprehend without mathematical mechanics. At any rate, we now know more about it than from Helmholtz's lecture on the conservation of force, 1862, which was intended precisely, quote, to make as clear as possible the fundamental physical concepts of work and their invariability, unquote. All that we learn there about work is that it is something which is expressed in foot-pounds or in units of heat, and that the number of these foot-pounds or units of heat is invariable for a definite quantity of work, and further, that besides mechanical forces and heat, chemical and electric forces can perform work, but that all these forces exhaust their capacity for work in the measure that they actually result in work. We learn also that it follows from this that the sum of all effective quantities of work in nature as a whole remains eternally and invariably the same throughout all the changes taking place in nature. The concept of work is neither developed nor even defined. Footnote. We get no further by consulting Clark Maxwell. The latter says, in parentheses, Theory of Heat, 4th edition, London, 1875, page 87, quote, Work is done when resistance is overcome, unquote. And on page 183, quote, The energy of a body is its capacity for doing work, unquote. That is all that we learn about it. End of footnote. And it is precisely the quantitative invariability of the magnitude of work which prevents him from realizing that the qualitative alteration, the change of form, is the basic condition for all physical work. And so Helmholtz can go as far as to assert that, quote, friction and inelastic impact are processes in which mechanical work is destroyed and heat is produced instead, unquote. Popular Lectures, Volume 2, page 166. Just the contrary. Here mechanical work is not destroyed, here mechanical work is performed. It is mechanical motion that is apparently destroyed, but mechanical motion can never perform even a millionth part of a kilogram meter of work, without apparently being destroyed as such, without becoming converted into another form of motion. But as we have seen, the capacity for work contained in a given quantity of mechanical motion is what is known as its vis viva, and until recently was measured by mv squared. And here a new contradiction arose. Let us listen to Helmholtz, Conservation of Force, page 9. We read there that the magnitude of work can be expressed by a weight m being raised to a height h, when if the force of gravity is put as g, the magnitude of work equals mgh. For the body m to rise freely to the vertical height h, it requires a velocity v equals square root of 2gh, and it attains the same velocity on falling. Consequently, mgh equals mv squared divided by 2, and Helmholtz proposes, quote, to take the magnitude of mv squared divided by 2 as its quantity of vis viva, whereby it becomes identical with the measure of the magnitude of work. From the viewpoint of how the concept of vis viva has been applied hitherto, this change has no significance, but it will offer essential advantages in the future." Unquote. It is scarcely to be believed. In 1847, Helmholtz was so little clear about the mutual relations of vis viva and work 
that he totally fails to notice how he transforms the former proportional measure of vis viva into its absolute measure and remains quite unconscious of the important discovery that he has made by his audacious handling, recommending his mv squared divided by 2 only because of its convenience as compared with mv squared. And it is as a matter of convenience that mechanicians have adopted mv squared divided by 2. Only gradually was mv squared divided by 2 also proved mathematically. Naumann, General Chemistry, page 7, gives an algebraic proof. Clausius, Mechanische Verm Theory, The Mechanical Theory of Heat, 2nd edition, page 18, an analytical one, which is then to be met with in another form and a different method of deduction in Kirchhoff, Ibid, page 27. Clark Maxwell gives an elegant algebraic proof of the deduction of mv squared divided by 2 from mv. This does not prevent our two Scotsmen, Thompson and Tate, from asserting, Ibid, page 164, quote, The vis viva or kinetic energy of a moving body is proportional to the mass and the square of the velocity conjointly. If we adopt the same units of mass as above, namely, unit of mass moving with unit velocity, there is a particular advantage in defining kinetic energy as half the product of the mass and the square of the velocity. Unquote. Here, therefore, we find that not only the ability to think, but also to calculate, has come to a standstill in the two foremost mechanicians of Scotland. The particular advantage, the convenience of the formula, accomplishes everything in the most beautiful fashion. For us who have seen that vis viva is nothing but the capacity of a given quantity of mechanical motion to perform work, it is obvious on the face of it that the expression in mechanical terms of this capacity for work and the work actually performed by the latter must be equal to each other, and that consequently, if mv squared divided by 2 measures the work, the vis viva must likewise be measured by mv squared divided by 2. But that is what happens in science. Theoretical mechanics arrives at the concept of vis viva, the practical mechanics of the engineer arrives at the concept of work, and forces it on the theoreticians. And, immersed in their calculations, the theoreticians have become so unaccustomed to thinking that for years they fail to recognize the connection between the two concepts, measuring one of them by mv squared, the other by mv squared divided by 2, and finally accepting mv squared divided by 2 for both, not from comprehension, but for the sake of simplicity of calculation. Footnote. The word work and the corresponding idea is derived from English engineers. But in English, practical work is called work, while work in the economic sense is called labor. Hence, physical work is also termed work, thereby excluding all confusion with work in the economic sense. This is not the case in German. Therefore, it has been possible in recent pseudo-scientific literature to make various peculiar applications of work in the physical sense to the economic conditions of labor and vice versa. But we have also the word Werk, W-E-R-K, which like the English word work, is excellently adapted for signifying physical work. Economics, however, being a sphere far too remote from our natural scientists, they will scarcely decide to introduce it to replace the word Arbeit, which has already obtained general currency. Unless, perhaps, when it is too late. Only Clausius has made the attempt to retain the expression Werk, at least alongside the expression Arbeit. End of footnote. Heat. As we have seen, there are two forms in which mechanical motion vis viva disappears. The first is its conversion into mechanical potential energy, for instance on lifting a weight. This form has the peculiarity that not only can it be retransformed into mechanical motion, this mechanical motion moreover having the same vis viva as the original one, but also that it is capable only of this change of form. Mechanical potential energy can never produce heat or electricity, unless it has been converted first into real mechanical motion. To use Clausius's term, it is a quote-unquote reversible process. The second form in which mechanical motion disappears is in friction and impact, which differ only in degree. Friction can be conceived as a series of small impacts, 
occurring successively and side by side, impact as friction, concentrated at one spot and in a single moment of time. Friction is chronic impact, impact is acute friction. The mechanical motion that disappears here, disappears altogether as such. It can never be restored immediately out of itself. The process is not directly reversible. The motion has been transformed into qualitatively different forms of motion, into heat, electricity, into forms of molecular motion. Hence, friction and impact lead from the motion of masses, the subject matter of mechanics, to molecular motion, the subject matter of physics. In calling physics the mechanics of molecular motion, it has not been overlooked that this expression by no means covers the entire field of contemporary physics. On the contrary, ether vibrations, which are responsible for the phenomena of light and radiant heat, are certainly not molecular motions in the modern sense of the word, but their terrestrial actions concern molecules first and foremost. Refraction of light, polarization of light, etc., are determined by the molecular constitution of the bodies concerned. Similarly, almost all the most important scientists now regard electricity as a motion of ether particles. Footnote. At this time, the ideas of Faraday and Maxwell were dominant, and physicists tended to regard electricity as primarily located in the field between charged bodies. End of footnote. And Clausius even says of heat that in, quote, the movement of ponderable atoms, in parentheses, it would be better to say molecules, the ether within the body can also participate, unquote. Mechanische Verm Theory, Mechanical Theory of Heat, Volume 1, page 22. Footnote. See Appendix 2, pages 333 to 334. A body at any temperature is in equilibrium with a certain density of radiation, though very little of the energy in a given volume is, quote-unquote, in the ether, that is, in the form of radiation at ordinary temperatures. End of footnote. But in the phenomena of electricity and heat, once again, it is primarily molecular motions that have to be considered. It could not be otherwise, so long as our knowledge of the ether is so small. But when we have got so far as to be able to present the mechanics of the ether, this subject will include a great deal that is now of necessity allocated to physics. Footnote. This has certainly been verified in the sense that, for modern physics, the properties of particles can be regarded as essentially repulsions and attractions in the space around them, which is also full of radiation. On the other hand, the idea of the ether has proved so full of internal contradictions that the word is now little used. End of footnote. The physical processes in which the structure of the molecule is altered, or even destroyed, will be dealt with later on. They form the transition from physics to chemistry. Only with molecular motion does the change of form of motion acquire complete freedom. Whereas at the boundary of mechanics, the motion of masses can assume only a few other forms, heat or electricity, here a quite different and more lively capacity for change of form is to be seen. Heat passes into electricity in the thermopile, it becomes identical with light at a certain stage of radiation, and in its turn reproduces mechanical motion. Footnote. As we saw, some of the heat in a body takes the form of radiation. When the body gets red hot, this becomes partially visible, that is, light. End of footnote. Electricity and magnetism, a twin pair like heat and light, not only become transformed into each other, but also into heat and light as well as mechanical motion. And this takes place in such definite measure relations that a given quantity of any one of these forms of energy can be expressed in any other, in kilogram meters, in heat units, in volts, and similarly any unit of measurement can be translated into any other. Footnote. This is of course a mistake. Volt is not an energy unit, as Engels would soon have known had he ever had to pay an electricity bill. End of footnote. The practical discovery of the conversion of mechanical motion into heat is so very ancient that it can be taken as dating from the beginning of human history. Footnote. Even Sinanthropus, 
a type of man very different physically from ourselves, possessed fire, though of course we do not know how he made it. End of footnote. Whatever discoveries in the way of tools and domestication of animals may have preceded it, the making of fire by friction was the first instance of men pressing a non-living force of nature into their service. Footnote. The use of fire immensely preceded domestication. End of footnote. Popular superstitions today still show how greatly the almost immeasurable import of this gigantic advance impressed itself on the mind of mankind. Long after the introduction of the use of bronze and iron, the discovery of the stone knife, the first tool, continued to be celebrated, all religious sacrifices being performed with stone knives. According to the Jewish legend, Joshua decreed that men born in the wilderness should be circumcised with stone knives. The Celts and Germans used stone knives exclusively in their human sacrifices. But all this long ago passed into oblivion. It was different with the making of fire by friction. Long after other methods of producing fire had become known, every sacred fire among the majority of peoples had to be obtained by friction. But even today, popular superstition in the majority of the European countries insists that fire with miraculous powers, for example our German bonfire against epidemics, may be lighted only by means of friction. Thus, down to our own day, the grateful memory of the first great victory of mankind over nature lives on, half unconsciously in popular superstition, in the relics of heathen mythological recollections among the most educated peoples in the world. However, the process of making fire by friction is still one-sided. By it, mechanical motion is converted into heat. To complete the process, it must be reversed. Heat must be converted into mechanical motion. Only in that case is justice done to the dialectics of the process, the cycle of the process being completed, for the first stage at least. But history has its own pace, and however dialectical its course may be in the last analysis, dialectics has often to wait for history a fairly long time. Many thousands of years must have elapsed between the discovery of fire by friction and the time when Heron of Alexandria, circa 120 BC, invented a machine which was set in rotary motion by the steam issuing from it, and almost another 2,000 years elapsed before the first steam engine was built, the first apparatus for the conversion of heat into really usable mechanical motion. The steam engine was the first really international invention, and this fact, in turn, testifies to a mighty historical advance. The Frenchman, Papin, invented the first steam engine, and he invented it in Germany. It was the German, Leibniz, scattering around him, as always, brilliant ideas, without caring whether the merit for them would be awarded to him or someone else, who, as we know now, from Papin's correspondence, published by Gerland, gave him the main idea of the machine, the employment of a cylinder and piston. Soon after that, the Englishmen, Savory and Newcomen, invented similar machines. Finally, their fellow countryman, Watt, by introducing a separate condenser, brought the steam engine in principle up to the level of today. The cycle of inventions in this sphere was completed. The conversion of heat into mechanical motion was achieved. What came afterwards were improvements in details. Practice, therefore, solved after its own fashion the problem of the relations between mechanical motion and heat. It had, to begin with, converted the first into the second, and then it converted the second into the first. But how did matters stand in regard to theory? The situation was pitiable enough. Although it was just in the 17th and 18th centuries that innumerable accounts of travel appeared, teeming with descriptions of savages who knew no way of producing fire other than by friction, yet physicists were almost uninterested in it. They were equally indifferent to the steam engine during the whole of the 18th century and the first decades of the 19th. For the most part, they were satisfied simply to record the facts. Finally, in the 20s, Sadi Carnot took the matter in hand, and indeed so very skillfully that his best calculations, afterwards presented by Clapeyron in geometrical form, have been accepted up to the present day by Clausius and Clark Maxwell. Sadi Carnot almost got to the bottom of the question. 
It was not the lack of factual data that prevented him from completely solving it, but solely a preconceived false theory. Moreover, this false theory was not one which had been forced upon physicists by some variety of malicious philosophy, but was a theory contrived by the physicists themselves, by means of their naturalistic mode of thought, so very superior to the metaphysical philosophical method. In the 17th century, heat was regarded, at any rate in England, as a property of bodies, as, quote, a motion of a particular kind, the nature of which has never been explained in a satisfactory manner, unquote. This is what Theodore Thomson called it, two years before the discovery of the mechanical theory of heat, Outline of the Sciences of Heat and Electricity, 2nd edition, London, 1840. But in the 18th century, the view came more and more to the fore that heat, as also light, electricity and magnetism, is a special substance, and that all these peculiar substances differ from ordinary matter in having no weight, in being imponderable. Electricity Footnote For the factual material in this chapter, we rely mainly on Wiedermann's Lehre vom Galvanismus und Elektromagnetismus Theory of Galvanism and Electromagnetism Two volumes in three parts Second edition, Braunschweig, 1874 in Nature, June 15, 1882, there is a reference to this, quote, admirable treatise, which, in its forthcoming shape, with electrostatics added, will be the greatest experimental treatise on electricity in existence, unquote. End of footnote. Electricity, like heat, only in a different way, has also a certain omnipresent character. Hardly any change can occur in the world without it being possible to demonstrate the presence of electrical phenomena. If water evaporates, if a blame burns, if two different metals or two metals of different temperature touch, or if iron touches a solution of copper sulfate and so on, electrical processes take place simultaneously with the more apparent physical and chemical phenomena. The more exactly we investigate natural processes of the most diverse nature, the more do we find evidence of electricity. In spite of its omnipresence, in spite of the fact that, for half a century, electricity has become more and more pressed into the industrial service of mankind, it remains precisely that form of motion, the nature of which is still enveloped in the greatest obscurity. The discovery of the galvanic current is approximately 25 years younger than that of oxygen, and is at least as significant for the theory of electricity as the latter discovery for chemistry. Yet what a difference obtains even today between the two fields. In chemistry, thanks especially to Dalton's discovery of atomic weights, there is order, relative certainty about what has been achieved, and systematic, almost planned, attack on the territory still unconquered, comparable to the regular siege of a fortress. In the theory of electricity, there is a barren lumber of ancient, doubtful experiments, neither definitely confirmed nor definitely refuted, an uncertain fumbling in the dark, uncoordinated research and experiment on the part of numerous isolated individuals who attack the unknown territory with their scattered forces like the attack of a swarm of nomadic horsemen. It must be admitted, indeed, that in the sphere of electricity, a discovery like that of Dalton, giving the whole science a central point and firm basis for research, is still to seek. Footnote the central discovery was J. J. Thomson's discovery of the electron. End of footnote. It is essentially this unsettled state of the theory of electricity, which for the time being makes it impossible to establish a comprehensive theory, that is responsible for the fact that a one-sided empiricism prevails in this sphere. An empiricism which, as far as possible, itself forbids thought, and which precisely for that reason not only thinks incorrectly, but also is incapable of faithfully pursuing the facts, or even of reporting them faithfully, and which, therefore, becomes transformed into the opposite of true empiricism. If in general, those natural scientists, who cannot say anything bad enough of the crazy a priori speculations of the German philosophy of nature, are to be recommended to read the theoretical-physical works of the empirical school, not only of the contemporary, but even of a much later period. This holds good especially for the theory of electricity. 
Let us take a work of the year 1840, An Outline of the Sciences of Heat and Electricity by Thomas Thompson. Old Thompson was indeed an authority in his day. Moreover, he had already at his disposal a very considerable part of the work of the greatest electrician so far, Faraday. Yet his book contains at least just as crazy things as the corresponding section of the much older Hegelian philosophy of nature. The description of the electric spark, for instance, might have been translated directly from the corresponding passage in Hegel. Both enumerate all the wonders that people sought to discover in the electric spark prior to knowledge of its real nature and manifold diversity, and which have now been shown to be mainly special cases or errors. Still better, Thompson recounts quite seriously on page 446 Desain's cock and bull stories, such as that with a rising barometer and falling thermometer, glass, resin, silk, etc., become negatively electrified on immersion in mercury, but positively if instead the barometer is falling and the temperature rising, that in summer gold and several other metals become positive on warming and negative on cooling, but in winter the reverse, that with a high barometer and northerly wind they are strongly electric, positive if the temperature is rising, and negative if it is falling, etc. So much for the treatment of facts. As regards a priori speculation, Thompson favors us with the following treatment of the electric spark, derived from no lesser person than Faraday himself. Quote, the spark is a discharge or weakening of the polarized inductive state of many dielectric particles by means of a peculiar action of a few of these particles occupying a very small and limited space. Faraday assumes that the few particles situated where the discharge occurs are not merely pushed apart, but assume a peculiar, highly exalted condition for the time, that is, that they have thrown on them all the surrounding forces, in succession, and are thus brought into a proportionate intensity of condition, perhaps equal to that of chemically combining atoms, that they then discharge the powers, in the same manner as the atoms do theirs, in some way at present unknown to us, and so the end of the whole. The ultimate effect is exactly as if a metallic wire had been put into the place of the discharging particles, and it does not seem impossible that the principles of action in both cases may hereafter prove to be the same. Unquote. Footnote. See Appendix 2, page 334. End of footnote. I have, adds Thompson, given this explanation of Faraday's in his own words, because I do not understand it clearly. This will certainly have been the experience of other persons also, quite as much as when they read in Hegel that in the electric spark, quote, the special materiality of the charged body does not as yet enter into the process, but is determined within it only in the elementary and spiritual way, unquote, and that electricity is, quote, the anger, the effervescence proper to the body, unquote, its, quote-unquote, angry self, that, quote, is exhibited by every body when excited. Unquote. Philosophy of Nature, paragraph 324, addendum. Yet the basic thought of both Hegel and Faraday is the same. Both oppose the idea that electricity is not a state of matter, but a special distinct variety of matter. And since in the spark, electricity is apparently exhibited as independent, free from any foreign material substratum, separated out and yet perceptible to the senses, they arrive at the necessity, in the state of science at the time, of having to conceive of the spark as a transient phenomenal form of a quote-unquote force momentarily freed from all matter. For us, of course, the riddle is solved, since we know that on the spark, discharge between metal electrodes, real quote-unquote metallic particles leap across, and hence in actual fact, quote, the special materiality of the charged body enters into the process, unquote. As is well known, electricity and magnetism, like heat and light, were at first regarded as special, imponderable substances. As far as electricity is concerned, it is well known that the view soon developed that there are two opposing substances, two quote-unquote fluids, one positive and one negative, which in the normal state neutralize each other until they are forced apart by a so-called electric force of separation. It is then possible to charge two bodies one with positive, the other with negative electricity. On uniting them by a third conducting body, equalization occurs. 
either suddenly or by means of a lasting current, according to circumstances. The sudden equalization appeared very simple and comprehensible, but the current offered difficulties. The simplest hypothesis, that the current, in every case, is a movement of either purely positive or purely negative electricity, was opposed by Fechner, and in more detail by Weber, with the view that, in every circuit, two equal currents of positive and negative electricity flow in opposite directions in channels lying side by side between the ponderable molecules of the bodies. Footnote. We now know that a current in metals is due to the movement of electrons, whereas in electrolytes, for example salt water and gases, molecules with both positive and negative charges carry it. End of footnote. Weber's detailed mathematical working out of this theory finally arrives at the result that a function of no interest to us here is multiplied by a magnitude L divided by R, the latter signifying, quote, the ratio of the unit of electricity to the milligram, unquote. Wiedemann, Lele vom Galvanismus, etc., 2nd edition, volume 3, page 569. The ratio to a measure of weight can naturally only be a weight ratio, Hence, one-sided empiricism had already to such an extent forgotten the practice of thought in calculating that here it even makes the imponderable electricity ponderable and introduces its weight into the mathematical calculation. The formula derived by Weber sufficed only within certain limits, and Helmholtz in particular, only a few years ago, calculated results that come into conflict with the principle of the conservation of energy. In opposition to Weber's hypothesis of the double current flowing in opposite directions, C. Naumann, in 1871, put forward the hypothesis that in the current only one of the two electricities, for instance the positive, moves, while the other negative one remains firmly bound up with the mass of the body. On this, Wiedemann includes the remark, quote, This hypothesis could be linked up with that of Weber if to Weber's supposed double current of electric masses plus minus 1 divided by 2 e, flowing in opposite directions, there were added a further current of neutral electricity, externally inactive, which carried with it amounts of electricity plus minus 1 divided by 2 e in the direction of the positive current. Unquote. Volume 3, page 577. This statement is again characteristic of one-sided empiricism. In order to bring about the flow of electricity at all, it is decomposed into positive and negative. All attempts, however, to explain the current with these two substances meet with difficulties. Both the assumption that only one of them is present in the current and that the two of them flow in opposite directions simultaneously, and finally the third assumption, also that one flows and the other is at rest. If we adopt this last assumption, how are we to explain the inexplicable idea that negative electricity which is mobile enough in the electrostatic machine and the leaden jar, in the current is firmly united with the mass of the body. Quite simply, besides the positive current plus E flowing through the wire to the right and the negative current minus E flowing to the left, we make yet another current, this time of neutral electricity, plus minus 1 divided by 2 E flow to the right. First we assume that the two electricities, to be able to flow at all, must be separated from one another, and then, in order to explain the phenomena that occur on the flow of the separated electricities, we assume that they can also flow unseparated. First we make a supposition to explain a particular phenomena, and the first difficulty encountered, we make a second supposition, which directly negates the first one. What must be the sort of philosophy that these gentlemen have the right to complain of? However, alongside this view of the material nature of electricity, there soon appeared a second view, according to which it is to be regarded as a mere state of the body, a quote-unquote force, or, as we would say today, a special form of motion. We saw above that Hegel, and later Faraday, adhered to this view. After the discovery of the mechanical equivalent of heat had finally disposed of the idea of a special heat stuff, and heat was shown to be a molecular motion, the next step was to treat electricity, also according to the new method, and to attempt to determine its mechanical equivalent. This attempt was fully successful. Particularly owing to the experiments of Joule, Favre, and Raoul, not only was the mechanical and thermal equivalent of the so-called electromotive force of the galvanic current established, 
but also its complete equivalence with the energy liberated by chemical processes in the exciting cell or used up in the decomposition cell. This made the assumption that electricity is a special material fluid more and more untenable. The analogy, however, between heat and electricity was not perfect. The galvanic currents still differed in very essential respects from the conduction of heat. It was still not possible to say what it was that moved in the electrically affected bodies. The assumption of a mere molecular vibration, as in the case of heat, seemed insufficient. In view of the enormous velocity of motion of electricity, even exceeding that of light, it remained difficult to overcome the view that here some material substance is in motion between the molecules of the body. Footnote. The notion that electricity can move faster than light is incorrect, but was generally stated in textbooks at the time when Engels wrote. End of footnote. Here, the most recent theories put forward by Clark Maxwell, 1864, Hunkel, 1865, Renat, 1870, and Edlund, 1872, are in complete agreement with the assumption already advanced in 1846, first of all as a suggestion by Faraday that electricity is a movement of the elastic medium permeating the whole of space and hence all bodies as well, the discrete particles of which medium repel one another according to the law of the inverse square of the distance. In other words, it is a motion of ether particles, and the molecules of the body take part in this motion. As to the manner of this motion, the various theories are divergent, those of Maxwell, Hunkel, and Renault, taking as their basis modern investigations of vortex motion, explain it in various ways from vortices, so that the vortex of old Descartes also once more comes into favor in an increasing number of new fields. We refrain from going more closely into the details of these theories. They differ strongly from one another, and they will certainly still experience many transformations. But a decisive advance appears to lie in their common basic conception, that electricity is a motion of the particles of the luminiferous ether that permeates all ponderable matter, this motion reacting on the molecules of the body. This conception reconciles the two earlier ones. According to it, it is true that in electrical phenomena, it is something substantial that moves, something different from ponderable matter. But this substance is not electricity itself, which in fact proves rather to be a form of motion, although not a form of the immediate, direct motion of ponderable matter. While on the one hand, the ether theory shows a way of getting over the primitive, clumsy idea of two opposed electrical fluids, on the other hand it gives a prospect of explaining what the real substantial substratum of electrical motion is, what sort of a thing it is, whose motion produces electrical phenomena. Footnote. The view that electrical energy was located in the ether was the basis of the experiments which gave us radio. It seemed in turn to have been negated by the discovery of electrons. However, the electron in turn is now regarded by many physicists as a system of waves rather than a well-defined particle. End of footnote. The ether theory has already had one decisive success. As is well known, there is at least one point where electricity directly alters the motion of light. It rotates the latter's plane of polarization. On the basis of his theory mentioned above, Clark Maxwell calculates that the electric specific inductive capacity of a body is equal to the square of its index of refraction. Boltzmann has investigated dielectric coefficients of various non-conductors, and he found that in sulfur, rosin, and paraffin, the square roots of these coefficients were respectively equal to their indices of refraction. The highest deviation, in sulfur, amounted to only 4%. Consequently, the Maxwellian ether theory in this particular has hereby been experimentally confirmed. Footnote. Every broadcast is a confirmation of this theory today. End of footnote. It will, however, require a lengthy period and cost much labor before a new series of experiments will have extracted a firm kernel from these mutually contradictory hypotheses. Until then, or until the ether theory too, is perhaps supplanted by an entirely new one, the theory of electricity finds itself in the uncomfortable position of having to employ a mode of expression which it itself admits to be false. 
Its whole terminology is based on the idea of two electric fluids. It still speaks quite unashamedly of, quote, electric masses flowing in the bodies, unquote, of, quote, a division of electricities in every molecule, unquote, etc. This is a misfortune which, for the most part, as already said, follows inevitably from the present transitional state of science, but which also, with the one-sided empiricism particularly prevalent in this branch of investigation, contributes not a little to preserving the existing confusion of thought. The opposition between so-called static or frictional electricity and dynamic electricity or galvanism can now be regarded as bridged over, since we have learned to produce constant currents by means of the electric machine, and conversely, by means of the galvanic current, to produce so-called static electricity, to charge lead and jars, etc. We shall not here touch on the sub-form of static electricity, nor likewise on magnetism, which is now recognized to be also a sub-form of electricity. The theoretical explanation of the phenomena belonging here will, under all circumstances, have to be sought in the theory of the galvanic current, and consequently we shall keep mainly to this. A constant current can be produced in many different ways. Mechanical mass motion produces directly by friction, in the first place only static electricity, and a constant current only with great dissipation of energy. For the major part, at least to become transformed into electric motion, the intervention of magnetism is required, as in the well-known magneto-electric machines of Grumma, Siemens, and others. Footnote. Magneto-electric machines are now called dynamos. End of footnote. Heat can be converted directly into current electricity, as especially occurs at the junction of two different metals. The energy set free by chemical action, which under ordinary circumstances appears in the form of heat, is converted under appropriate conditions into electric motion. Conversely, the latter form of motion, as soon as the requisite conditions are present, passes into any other form of motion, into mass motion, to a very small extent directly into electrodynamic attractions and repulsions, to a large extent, however, by the intervention of magnetism in the electromagnetic machine, into heat, throughout a closed circuit, unless other changes are brought about, into chemical energy, in decomposition cells and voltmeters introduced into the circuit, where the current disassociates compounds that are attacked in vain by other means. All these transformations are governed by the basic law of quantitative equivalence of motion through all its changes of form, or, as Wiedemann expresses it, quote, by the law of conservation of force, the mechanical work exerted in any way for the production of the current must be equivalent to the work exerted in producing all the effects of the current, unquote. The conversion of mass motion or heat into electricity offers us no difficulties here. Footnote by Engels, I use the term electricity in the sense of electric motion with the same justification that the general term heat is used to express the form of motion that our senses perceive as heat. This is the less open to objection inasmuch as any possible confusion with the state of stress of electricity is here expressly excluded in advance. End of footnote. It has been shown that the so-called electromotive force in the first case is equal to the work expended on that motion, and in the second case, it is, quote, at every junction of the thermopile, directly proportional to its absolute temperature, unquote. Wiedemann, volume 3, page 482, that is, to the quantity of heat present at every junction measured in absolute units. Footnote. Once more, it must be remembered that this term, electromotive force, was very loosely used 60 years ago, and now has a definite meaning, not of course equivalent to any form of energy. End of footnote. The same law has in fact been proved valid, also for electricity produced from chemical energy. But here the matter seems to be not so simple, at least for the theory now current. Let us, therefore, go into this somewhat more deeply. One of the most beautiful series of experiments on the transformations of form of motion as a result of the action of a galvanic cell is that of Favre, 1857-58. He put a small cell of five elements in a calorimeter. In a second calorimeter, he put a small electromagnetic motor with the main axle and driving wheel 
projecting so as to be available for any kind of coupling. Each production in the cell of 1 gram of hydrogen or solution of 32.6 grams of zinc, the old chemical equivalent of zinc, equal to half now accepted atomic weight, 65.2 and expressed in grams, gave the following results. A. The cell enclosed in the calorimeter, excluding the motor, heat production 18,682 or 18,674 units of heat. B. Cell and motor linked in the circuit, but the motor prevented from moving. Heat in the cell 16,448, in the motor 2,219, together 18,667 units of heat. C. As B, but the motor in motion without however lifting a weight. Heat in the cell 13,888, in the motor 4,769, together 18,657 units of heat. D. As C, but the motor raises a weight and so performs mechanical work. Equals 131.24 kilogram meters. Heat in the cell 15,427, in the motor 2,949, total 18,374 units of heat. Loss in contrast to the above 18,682 equals 308 units of heat. But the mechanical work performed, amounting to 131.24 kilogram meters multiplied by 1,000, in order to bring the kilograms into line with the grams of the chemical results, and divided by the mechanical equivalent of heat, equals 423.5 kilogram meters, gives 309 units of heat. Hence, exactly the loss mentioned above, as the heat equivalent of the mechanical work performed. The equivalence of motion in all its transformations is therefore strikingly proved for electric motion also, within the limits of unavoidable error, and it is likewise proved that the quote-unquote electromotive force of the galvanic battery is nothing but chemical energy converted into electricity, and the battery itself nothing but an apparatus that converts chemical energy on its liberation into electricity, just as a steam engine transforms the heat supplied to it into chemical motion, without in either case the converting apparatus supplying further energy on its own account. A difficulty arises here, however, in relation to the traditional mode of conception. The latter ascribed a quote-unquote electric force of separation to the battery in virtue of the conditions of contact present in it between the fluids and metals, which force is proportional to the electromotive force, and therefore for a given battery represents a definite quantity of energy. What then is the relation of this electric force of separation which, according to the traditional mode of conception of the battery as such, is inherently a source of energy even without chemical action, to the energy set free by chemical action. And if it is a source of energy independent of the latter, whence comes the energy furnished by it? This question, in a more or less unclear form, constitutes the point of dispute between the contact theory, founded by Volta, and the chemical theory of the galvanic current, that arose immediately afterwards. The contact theory explained the current from the electric stresses arising in the battery on contact of the metals with one or more of the liquids, or even merely on contact of the liquids themselves, and from their neutralization or that of the opposing electricities thus generated in the circuit. The pure contact theory regarded any chemical changes that might thereby occur as quite secondary. On the other hand, as early as 1805, Ritter maintained that a current could only be formed if the accidents reacted chemically even before closing the circuit. In general, this older chemical theory is summarized by Wiedemann, volume 1, page 284, to the effect that, according to it, so-called contact electricity, quote, makes its appearance only if at the same time there comes into play a real chemical action of the bodies in contact, or at any rate, a disturbance of the chemical equilibrium, even if not directly bound up with chemical processes, a tendency towards chemical action between the bodies in contact. Unquote.
it is seen that both sides put the question of the source of energy of the current only indirectly, as indeed could hardly be otherwise at the time. Volta and his successors found it quite in order that the mere contact of heterogeneous bodies should produce a constant current, and consequently be able to perform definite work without equivalent return. Ritter and his supporters are just as little clear how the chemical action makes the battery capable of producing the current and its performance of work. But if this point has long ago been cleared up for chemical theory by Joule, Favre, Raoul and others, the opposite is the case for the contact theory. In so far as it has persisted, it remains essentially at the point where it started. Notions belonging to a period long outlived, a period when one had to be satisfied to ascribe a particular effect to the first available apparent cause that showed itself on the surface, regardless of whether motion was thereby made to arise out of nothing, notions that directly contradict the principle of the conservation of energy thus continue to exist in the theory of electricity of today. And if the objectionable aspects of these ideas are shorn off, weakened, watered down, castrated, glossed over, this does not improve matters at all. The confusion is bound to become only so much the worse. As we have seen, even the older chemical theory of the current declares the contact relations of the battery to be absolutely indispensable for the formation of the current. It maintains only that these contacts can never achieve a constant current without simultaneous chemical action. Even today, it is still taken as a matter of course that the contact arrangements of the battery provide precisely the apparatus by means of which liberated chemical energy is transformed into electricity, and that it depends essentially on these contact arrangements whether and how much chemical energy actually passes into electric motion. Wiedemann, as a one-sided empiricist, seeks to save what can be saved of the old contact theory. Let us follow what he has to say. He declares, Volume 1, page 799, quote, In contrast to what was formerly believed, the effect of contact of chemically indifferent bodies, for example of metals, is neither indispensable for the theory of the pile, nor proved by the facts that Ohm derived his law from it, although that can be derived without this assumption, and that Fechner, who confirmed this law experimentally, likewise defended the contact theory. Nevertheless, the excitation of electricity by metallic contact, according to the experiments now available at least, is not to be denied, even though the quantitative results obtainable in this respect may always be tainted with an inevitable uncertainty owing to the impossibility of keeping absolutely clean the surfaces of the bodies in contact." Unquote. It is seen that the contact theory has become very modest. It concedes that it is not at all indispensable for explaining the current, and neither proved theoretically by Ohm, nor experimentally by Fechner. It even concedes then that the so-called fundamental experiments, on which alone it can still rest, can never furnish other than uncertain results in a quantitative respect, and finally it asks us merely to recognize that in general it is by contact, although only of metals, that electric motion occurs. If the contact theory remained content with this, there would not be a word to say against it. It will certainly be granted that on the contact of two metals, electrical phenomena occur, in virtue of which a preparation of a frog's leg can be made to twitch, an electroscope charged, and other movements brought about. The only question that arises in the first place is, whence comes the energy required for this? To answer this question, we shall, according to Wiedemann, volume 1, page 14, quote, adduce more or less the following considerations. If the heterogeneous metal plates, A and B, are brought within a close distance of each other, they attract each other in consequence of the forces of adhesion. On mutual contact, they lose the vis viva, in parentheses, that is, kinetic energy, of motion imparted to them by this attraction. If we assume that the molecules of the metals are in a state of permanent vibration, it could also happen that, if on contact of the heterogeneous metals, the molecules not vibrating simultaneously come into contact, an alteration of their vibration is thereby brought about with loss of vis viva. The lost vis viva 
is to a large extent converted into heat. A small portion of it, however, is expended in bringing about a different distribution of the electricities previously unseparated. As we have already mentioned above, the bodies brought together become charged with equal quantities of positive and negative electricity, possibly as the result of an unequal attraction for the two electricities. Unquote. The modesty of the contact theory becomes greater and greater. At first, it is admitted that the powerful electric force of separation, which has later such a gigantic work to perform, in itself possesses no energy of its own, and that it cannot function if energy is not supplied to it from outside, and then it has allotted to it a more than diminutive source of energy, the vis viva of adhesion, which only comes into play at scarcely measurable distances, and which allows the bodies to travel a scarcely measurable length. But it does not matter. It indisputably exists, and equally undeniably vanishes on contact. But even this minute source still furnishes too much energy for our purpose. A large part is converted into heat, and only a small portion serves to evoke the electric force of separation. Now, although it is well known that cases occur in nature, where extremely minute impulses bring about extremely powerful effects, Wiedemann himself seems to feel that his hardly trickling source of energy can with difficulty suffice here, and he seeks a possible second source in the assumption of an interference of the molecular vibrations of the two metals at the surfaces of contact. Apart from the other difficulties encountered here, Grove and Gassiot have shown that for exciting electricity, actual contact is not at all indispensable, as Wiedemann himself tells us on the previous page. In short, the more we examine it, the more does the source of energy for the electric force of separation dwindle to nothing. Yet up to now, we hardly know of any other source for the excitation of electricity on metallic contact. According to Naumann, General and Physical Chemistry, Heidelberg, 1877, page 675, quote, The contact electromotive forces convert heat into electricity, unquote. He finds, quote, the assumption natural that the ability of these forces to produce electric motion depends on the quantity of heat present, or, in other words, that it is a function of the temperature, unquote, as has also been proved experimentally by Leroux. Here, too, we find ourselves groping in the dark. The law of the voltaic series of metals forbids us to have recourse to the chemical processes that to a small extent are continually taking place at the contact surfaces which are always covered by a thin layer of air and impure water, a layer as good as inseparable as far as we are concerned. An electrolyte should produce a constant current in the circuit, but the electricity of mere metallic contact, on the contrary, disappears on closing the circuit. And here we come to the real point. Whether and in what manner the production of a constant current on the contact of chemically indifferent bodies is made possible by this quote-unquote electric force of separation, which Wiedemann himself, first of all, restricted to metals, declaring it incapable of functioning without energy being supplied from outside, and then referred exclusively to a truly microscopical source of energy. The voltaic series arranges the metals in such a sequence that each one behaves as electronegative in relation to the preceding one and as electropositive in relation to the one that follows it. Hence, if we arrange a series of pieces of metal in this order, for example, zinc, tin, iron, copper, platinum, we shall be able to obtain differences of electric potential at the two ends. If, however, we arrange the series of metals to form a circuit so that the zinc and platinum are in contact, the electric stress is at once neutralized and disappears. Quote, Therefore, the production of a constant current of electricity is not possible in a closed circuit of bodies belonging to the voltaic series. Unquote. Wiedemann further supports this statement by the following theoretical consideration. Quote, in fact, if a constant electric current were to make its appearance in the circuit, it would produce heat in the metallic conductors themselves and this heat could at the most be counterbalanced by cooling at the metallic junctions. 
In any case, it would give rise to an uneven distribution of heat. Moreover, an electromagnetic motor could be driven continuously by the current without any sort of supply from outside, and thus work would be performed, which is impossible, since by firmly joining the metals, for instance by soldering, no further changes to compensate for this work could take place even at the contact surfaces. Unquote. And not content with the theoretical and experimental proof that the contact electricity of metals by itself cannot produce any current, we shall see that Wiedemann finds himself compelled to put forward a special hypothesis to abolish its activity, even where it might perhaps make itself evident in the current. Let us, therefore, try another way of passing from contact electricity to the current. Let us imagine, with Wiedemann, quote, two metals, such as a zinc rod and a copper rod, soldered together at one end, but with their free ends connected by a third body that does not act electromotively in relation to the two metals, but only conducts the opposing electricities collected on its surfaces, so that they are neutralized in it. Then the electric force of separation would always restore the previous difference of potential. Thus a constant electric current would make its appearance in the circuit, a current that would be able to perform work without any compensation, which again is impossible. Accordingly, there cannot be a body which only conducts electricity without electromotive activity in relation to the other bodies. Unquote. We are no better off than before. The impossibility of creating motion again bars the way. By the contact of chemically indifferent bodies, hence by contact electricity as such, we shall never produce a current. Let us therefore go back again and try a third way pointed out by Wiedemann. Quote, Finally, if we immerse a zinc plate and a copper plate in a liquid that contains a so-called binary compound, footnote, as we should now say, an electrolyte, end of footnote, which therefore can be decomposed into two chemically distinct constituents that completely saturate one another, for example, dilute hydrochloric acid, H plus Cl, etc. Then, according to paragraph 27, the zinc becomes negatively charged and the copper positively. On joining the metals, these electricities neutralize one another through the place of contact, through which, therefore, a current of positive electricity flows from the copper to the zinc. Moreover, since the electric force of separation making its appearance on the contact of these two metals carries away the positive electricity in the same direction. The effects of the electric forces of separation are not abolished as in a closed metallic circuit. Hence there arises a constant current of positive electricity flowing in the closed circuit through the copper-zinc junction in the direction of the latter and through the liquid from the zinc to the copper. We shall return in a moment, paragraph 34 at sec, to the question how far the individual electric forces of separation present in the enclosed circuit really participate in the formation of the current. A combination of conductors providing such a galvanic current, we term a galvanic element, or also a galvanic battery. Unquote. Volume 1, page 45. Thus the miracle has been accomplished. By the mere electric contact force of separation, which, according to Wiedemann himself, cannot be effective without energy being supplied from outside, a constant current has been produced. And if we were offered nothing more for its explanation than the above passage from Wiedemann, it would indeed be an absolute miracle. What have we learned here about the process? 1. If zinc and copper are immersed in a liquid containing a so-called binary compound, then, according to paragraph 7, the zinc becomes negatively charged and the copper positively charged. But in the whole of paragraph 27, there is no word of any binary compound. It describes only a simple voltaic element of a zinc plate and copper plate, with a piece of cloth moistened by an acid liquid interposed between them, and then investigates, without mentioning any chemical processes, the resulting static electric charges of the two metals. Hence, the so-called binary compound has been smuggled in here by the back door. 2. What this binary compound is doing here remains completely mysterious. The circumstance that it, quote, can be decomposed into two chemical constituents that fully saturate each other, unquote, 
in parentheses, fully saturate each other after they have been decomposed, question mark, exclamation point, close parentheses, could at most teach us something new if it were actually to decompose, but we are not told a word about that. Hence, for the time being, we have to assume that it does not decompose, for example, in the case of paraffin. 3. When the zinc in the liquid has been negatively charged and the copper positively charged, we bring them into contact, outside the liquid. At once, quote, these electricities neutralize one another through the place of contact, through which, therefore, a current of positive electricity flows from the copper to the zinc, unquote. Again, we do not learn why only a current of quote-unquote positive electricity flows in the one direction, and not also a current of quote-unquote negative electricity in the opposite direction. We do not learn at all what becomes of the negative electricity, which hitherto was just as necessary as the positive. The effect of the electric force of separation consisted precisely in setting them free to oppose one another. Now it has been suddenly suppressed, as it were eliminated, and it is made to appear as if there exists only positive electricity. But then again, on page 51, the precise opposite is said, for here, quote, the electricities unite in one current, unquote. Consequently, both negative and positive flow in it. Who will rescue us from this confusion? 4. Quote, Moreover, since the electric force of separation making its appearance on the contact with these two metals carries away the positive electricity in the same direction, the effects of the electric forces of separation are not abolished as in a closed metallic circuit. Hence there arises a constant current, unquote, etc. This is a bit thick, for as we shall see a few pages later, page 52, Wiedemann proves to us that on the, quote, formation of a constant current, the electric force of separation at the place of contact of the metals must be inactive, that not only does a current occur even when this force, instead of carrying away the positive electricity in the same direction, acts in opposition to the direction of the current, but that in this case too, it is not compensated by a definite share of the force of separation of the battery, and hence, once again is inactive." Unquote. Consequently, how can Wiedemann on page 45 make an electric force of separation participate as a necessary factor in the formation of the current when on page 52 he puts it out of action for the duration of the current, and that, moreover, by a hypothesis erected specially for this purpose. 5. Quote, Hence, there arises a constant current of positive electricity, flowing in the closed circuit from the copper through its place of contact with the zinc, in the direction of the latter, and through the liquid from the zinc to the copper. Unquote. But in the case of such a constant electric current, quote, heat would be produced by it, in the conductors themselves, unquote. and it would also be possible for, quote, an electromagnetic motor to be driven by it, and thus work performed, unquote. which, however, is impossible without supply of energy. Since Wiedemann up to now has not breathed a syllable as to whether such a supply of energy occurs, or whence it comes, the constant current so far remains just as much an impossibility as in both the previously investigated cases. No one feels this more than Wiedemann himself, so he finds it desirable to hurry as quickly as possible over the many ticklish points of this remarkable explanation of current formation, and instead to entertain the reader throughout several pages with all kinds of elementary anecdotes about the thermal, chemical, magnetic, and physiological effects of this still mysterious current, in the course of which, by way of exception, he even adopts a quite popular tone. Then he suddenly continues, page 49, quote, We have now to investigate in what way the electric forces of separation are active in a closed circuit of two metals and a liquid, for example, zinc, copper, and hydrochloric acid, unquote. Quote, We know that when the current traverses the liquid, the constituents of the binary compound, HCl, contained in it, become separated in such a manner that one constituent, H, is set free on the copper, and an equivalent amount of the other, Cl, on the zinc, whereby the latter constituent, 
combines with an equivalent amount of zinc to form ZnCl, unquote. We know. If we know this, we certainly do not know it from Wiedemann, who, as we have seen, so far has not breathed a syllable about this process. Further, if we do know anything of this process, it is that it cannot proceed in the way described by Wiedemann. On the formation of a molecule of CHL from hydrogen and chlorine, an amount of energy equaling 22,000 units of heat is liberated, in parentheses Julius Thomson. Therefore, to break away the chlorine from its combination with hydrogen, the same quantity of energy must be supplied from outside for each molecule of HCl. Where does the battery derive this energy? Wiedemann's description does not tell us, so let us look for ourselves. When chlorine combines with zinc to form zinc chloride, a considerably greater quantity of energy is liberated than is necessary to separate chlorine from hydrogen. ZnCl2 develops 97,210 and 2 HCl 44,000 units of heat, in parentheses Julius Thomson. With that, the process in the battery becomes comprehensible. Hence it is not, as Wiedemann relates, that hydrogen without more ado is liberated from the copper and chlorine from the zinc, quote-unquote whereby, then subsequently and accidentally, the zinc and chlorine enter into combination. On the contrary, the union of the zinc with the chlorine is the essential, basic condition for the whole process, and as long as this does not take place, one would wait in vain for hydrogen on the copper. The excess energy liberated on formation of a molecule of ZnCl2 over that expended on liberating two atoms of H from two molecules of HCl is converted in the battery into electric motion and provides the entire quote-unquote electromotive force that makes its appearance in the current circuit. Hence it is not a mysterious quote-unquote electric force of separation that tears asunder hydrogen and chlorine without any demonstrable source of energy. It is the total chemical process taking place in the battery that endows all the quote-unquote electric forces of separation and quote-unquote electromotive forces of the circuit with the energy necessary for their existence. For the time being, therefore, we put on record that Wiedemann's second explanation of the current gives us just as little assistance as his first one, and let us proceed further with the text. Quote, This process proves that the behavior of the binary substance between the metals does not consist merely in a simple predominant attraction of its entire mass for one electricity or the other, as in the case of metals, but that, in addition, a special action of its constituents is exhibited. Since the constituent, Cl, is given off where the current of positive electricity enters the fluid, and the constituent, H, where the negative electricity enters, we assume that each equivalent of chlorine in the compound, HCl, is charged with a definite amount of negative electricity, determining its attraction by the entering positive electricity. It is the electronegative constituent of the compound. Similarly, the equivalent H must be charged with positive electricity, and so represent the electropositive constituent of the compound. These charges could be produced on the combination of H and Cl in just the same way as on the contact of zinc and copper. Since the compound HCl as such is non-electric, we must assume accordingly that in the atoms of the positive and negative constituents contain equal quantities of positive and negative electricity. If now a zinc plate and a copper plate are dipped in a dilute hydrochloric acid, we can suppose that the zinc has a stronger attraction towards the electronegative constituent Cl than towards the electropositive one H. Consequently, the molecules of hydrochloric acid in contact with the zinc would dispose themselves so that their electronegative constituents are turned towards the zinc, and their electropositive constituents towards the copper. Owing to the constituents, when so arranged, exerting their electrical attraction on the constituents of the next molecules of HCl, the whole series of molecules between the zinc and copper plates become arranged as in figure 10. A picture of this should be on the screen right now. So on the left, there is negatively charged zinc. On the right, there is positively charged copper. 
and between them there are atoms of chlorine and hydrogen, where chlorine has a negative charge and hydrogen has a positive charge. Now back to the text. If the second metal acts on the positive hydrogen as the zinc does on the negative chlorine, it would help to promote the arrangement. If it acted in the opposite manner, only more weakly, at least the direction would remain unaltered. By the influence exerted by the negative electricity of the electronegative constituent Cl adjacent to the zinc, the electricity would be so distributed in the zinc that places on it, which are close to the Cl of the immediately adjacent atom of acid, would become charged positively, those further away negatively. Similarly, negative electricity would accumulate in the copper next to the electropositive constituent H of the adjacent atom of hydrochloric acid and the positive electricity would be driven to the more remote parts. Next, the positive electricity in the zinc would combine with the negative electricity of the immediately adjacent atom of Cl and the latter itself with the zinc to form non-electric ZnCl2. The electropositive atom H, which was previously combined with this atom of Cl, would unite with the atom of Cl, turn towards it, belonging to the second atom of HCl, with simultaneous combination of the electricities contained in these atoms. Similarly, the H of the second atom of HCl would combine with the Cl of the third atom, and so on, until finally an atom of H would be set free on the copper, the positive electricity of which would unite with the distributed negative electricity of the copper, so that it escapes a non-electrified condition. Unquote. This process would, quote, repeat itself until the repulsive action of the electricities accumulated in the metal plates on the electricities of the hydrochloric acid constituents turned towards them balances the chemical attraction of the latter by the metals. If, however, the metal plates are joined by a conductor, the free electricities of the metal plates unite with one another and the above-mentioned processes can recommence. In this way, a constant current of electricity comes into being. It is evident that in the course of it, a continual loss of vis viva occurs, owing to the constituents of the binary compound, on their migration to the metals, moving to the latter with a definite velocity, and then coming to rest, either with formation of a compound, ZnCl2, or by escaping in the free state, H. Since the gain in vis viva on separation of the constituents Cl and H is compensated by the vis viva lost on the union of these constituents with the constituents of adjacent atoms, the influence of this process can be neglected. This loss of vis viva is equivalent to the quantity of heat which is set free in the visibly occurring chemical process. Essentially, therefore, that produced on the solution of an equivalent of zinc in the dilute acid. This value must be the same as that of the work expended on separating the electricities. If, therefore, the electricities unite to form a current, then, during the solution of an equivalent of zinc and the giving off of an equivalent of hydrogen from the liquid, there must make its appearance in the whole circuit, whether in the form of heat or in the form of external performance of work, an amount of work that is likewise equivalent to the development of heat corresponding to this chemical process." Unquote. Let us assume, could, we must assume, we can suppose, would be distributed, would become charged, etc., etc. Sheer conjecture and subjunctives, from which only three actual indicatives can be definitely extracted. Firstly, that the combination of the zinc with the chlorine is now pronounced to be the condition for the liberation of hydrogen. Secondly, as we now learn right at the end, and as it were incidentally, that the energy herewith liberated is the source, and indeed the exclusive source, of all energy required for formation of the current. And thirdly, that this explanation of the current formation is as directly in contradiction to both those previously given as the latter themselves mutually contradictory. Further, it is said, quote, For the formation of a constant current, therefore, there is active wholly and solely the electric force of separation which is derived from the unequal attraction and polarization of the atoms of the binary compound in the exciting liquid of the battery by the metal electrodes. At the place of contact of the metals, at which no further mechanical changes can occur, the electric force of separation must on the other hand be inactive. 
that this force, if by chance it counteracts the electromotive excitation of the metals by the liquid, as on immersion of zinc and lead in potassium cyanide solution, is not compensated by a definite share of the force of separation at the place of contact, is proved by the above-mentioned complete proportionality of the total electric force of separation and electromotive force in the circuit, with the above-mentioned heat equivalent of the chemical process. Hence, it must be neutralized in another way. This would most simply occur on the assumption that on contact of the exciting liquid with the metals, the electromotive force is produced in a double manner. On the one hand, by an unequally strong attraction of the mass of the liquid as a whole, towards one or the other electricity, on the other hand by the unequal attraction of the metals towards the constituents of the liquid charged with opposite electricities. Owing to the former unequal mass attraction towards the electricities, the liquids would fully conform to the law of the voltaic series of metals in a closed circuit. Complete neutralization to zero of the electric forces of separation and electromotive forces take place. The second chemical action, on the other hand, would be provided solely by the electric force of separation necessary for the formation of the current and the corresponding electromotive force. Unquote. Volume 1, pages 52 to 53. Herewith, the last relics of the contact theory are now happily eliminated from formation of the current, and simultaneously also, the last relics of Wiedemann's first explanation of current formation, given on page 45. It is finally conceded without reservation that the galvanic battery is a simple apparatus for converting liberated chemical energy into electric motion, into so-called electric force of separation and electromotive force, in exactly the same way as the steam engine is an apparatus for converting heat energy into mechanical motion. In the one case, as in the other, the apparatus provides only the conditions for liberation and further transformation of the energy, but supplies no energy on its own account. This once established, it remains for us now to make a closer examination of this third version of Wiedemann's explanation of the current. How are the energy transformations in the circuit of the battery represented here? It is evident, he says, that in the battery... Quote, a continual loss of vis viva occurs owing to the constituents of the binary compound on their migration to the metals moving to the latter with a definite velocity and then coming to rest, either with formation of a compound ZnCl2 or by escaping in the free state H. This loss is equivalent to the quantity of heat which is set free in the visibly occurring chemical process, essentially therefore that produced on the solution of an equivalent of zinc in the dilute acid." Unquote. Firstly, if the process goes on in pure form, no heat at all is set free in the battery on solution of the zinc. The liberated energy is indeed converted directly into electricity, and only from this converted once again into heat by the resistance of the whole circuit. Secondly, vis viva is half the product of the mass and the square of the velocity. Hence, the above statement would read, The energy set free on solution of an equivalent of zinc in dilute hydrochloric acid equals so many calories is likewise equivalent to half the product of the mass of the ions and the square of the velocity with which they migrate to the metals. Expressed in this way, the sentence is obviously false. The vis viva appearing on the migration of the ions is far removed from being equivalent to the energy set free by the chemical process. Footnote by Engels F. Kohlrausch has recently calculated Wiedemann's Annalen, Volume 6, page 206, that quote-unquote immense forces are required to drive the ions through the water solvent. To cause one milligram to move through a distance of one millimeter requires an attractive force, which for H equals... 32,500 kilograms, for CL equals 5,200 kilograms, hence for HCL equals 37,700 kilograms. Even if these figures are absolutely correct, they do not affect what has been said above, but the calculation contains the hypothetical factors hitherto inevitable in the sphere of electricity and therefore require control by experiment. Such control appears possible in the first place, these quote-unquote immense forces 
must reappear as a definite quantity of energy in the place where they are constituted, that is, in the above case, in the battery. Secondly, the energy consumed by them must be smaller than that supplied by the chemical process of the battery, and there should be a definite difference. Thirdly, this difference must be used up in the rest of the circuit, and likewise be quantitatively demonstrable there. Only after confirmation by this control can the above figures be regarded as final. The demonstration in the decomposition cell appears still more susceptible of realization. End of footnote by Engels. Footnote. Actually, the hypothesis was incorrect. It is now believed that when HCl is dissolved in water, it is almost completely broken up into positive hydrogen ions and negative chlorine ions, which do not require, quote-unquote, immense forces to drive them. Engels was fully justified in his skepticism. End of footnote. But if it were to be so, no current would be possible, since there would be no energy remaining over for the current in the remainder of the circuit. Hence, the further remark is introduced that the ions come to rest, quote, either with formation of a compound, ZnCl2, or by escaping in the free state, unquote. But if the loss of vis viva is to include also the energy changes taking place in these two processes, then we have indeed arrived at a deadlock, for it is precisely to these two processes taken together that we owe the whole liberated energy, so that there can be absolutely no question here of a loss of vis viva, but at most of a gain. It is therefore obvious that Wiedemann himself did not mean anything definite by his sentence. Rather, the quote-unquote loss of vis viva represents only the deus ex machina, which is to enable him to make the fatal leap from the old contact theory to the chemical explanation of the current. In point of fact, the loss of vis viva has now performed its function and is dismissed. Henceforth, the chemical process in the battery has undisputed sway as the sole source of energy for current formation, and the only remaining anxiety of our author is as how he can politely get rid from the current of the last relic of the excitation of electricity by the contact of chemically indifferent bodies, namely the force of separation active at the place of contact of the two metals. Reading the above explanation of current formation given by Wiedemann, one could believe oneself in the presence of a specimen of the kind of apologia that holy and half-credulous theologians of almost forty years ago employed to meet the philologico-historical Bible criticism of Strauss, Wilke, Bruno Bauer, etc. The method is exactly the same, and it is bound to be so, for in both cases it is a question of saving the heritage of tradition from scientific thought. Exclusive empiricism which at most allows thinking in the form of mathematical calculation, imagines that it operates only with undeniable facts. In reality, however, it operates predominantly with out-of-date notions, with the largely obsolete products of thought of its predecessors, and such are positive and negative electricity, the electric force of separation, the contact theory. These serve it as the foundation of endless mathematical calculations, in which, owing to the strictness of the mathematical formulation, the hypothetical nature of the premises gets comfortably forgotten. This kind of empiricism is as credulous towards the results of the thought of its predecessors as it is skeptical in its attitude to the results of contemporary thought. For it, the experimentally established facts have gradually become inseparable from the traditional interpretation associated with them. The simplest electric phenomena is presented falsely, for example, by smuggling in the two electricities. This empiricism cannot any longer describe the facts correctly, because the traditional interpretation is woven into the description. In short, we have here in the field of the theory of electricity a tradition just as highly developed as that in the field of theology. And since in both fields the results of recent research, the establishment of hitherto unknown or disputed facts, and of the necessarily following theoretical conclusions, run pitilessly counter to the old traditions, the defenders of these traditions find themselves in the direst dilemma. They have to resort to all kinds of subterfuges and untenable expedients, to the glossing over of irreconcilable contradictions, and thus finally land themselves into a medley of contradictions from which they have no escape. It is this faith in the old theory of electricity 
that entangles Wiedemann here in the most hopeless contradictions, simply owing to the hopeless attempt to reconcile rationally the old explanation of the current by quote-unquote contact force with the modern one by liberation of chemical energy. It will perhaps be objected that the above criticism of Wiedemann's explanation of the current rests on juggling with words. It may be objected that, although at the beginning Wiedemann expresses himself somewhat carelessly and inaccurately, still he does finally give the correct account in accord with the principle of the conservation of energy and so sets everything right. As against this view, we give below another example, his description of the process in the battery. Zinc, dilute sulfuric acid, copper. Quote, If, however, the two plates are joined by a wire, a galvanic current arises. By the electrolytic process, one equivalent of hydrogen is given off at the copper plate from the water of the dilute sulfuric acid. This hydrogen escapes in bubbles. At the zinc, there is formed one equivalent of oxygen, which oxidizes the zinc to form zinc oxide, the latter becoming dissolved in the surrounding acid to form sulfuric zinc oxide. Unquote. Volume 1, pages 592 to 93. To break up water into hydrogen and oxygen requires an amount of energy of 69,924 heat units for each molecule of water. From where then comes the energy in the above cell? Quote, by the electrolytic process, unquote. And from where does the electrolytic process get it? No answer is given. But Wiedemann further tells us, not once but at least twice, volume 1, page 472 and page 614, that, quote, according to recent knowledge, the water itself is not decomposed, unquote but that in our case it is the sulfuric acid, H2SO4, that splits up into H2 on the one hand and into SO3 plus O on the other hand, whereby under suitable conditions H2 and O can escape in gaseous form. But this alters the whole nature of the process. The H2 of the H2SO4 is directly replaced by the bivalent zinc, forming zinc sulfate, ZnSO4. There remains over on the one side, H2, on the other, SO3 plus O. The two gases escape in the proportions in which they unite to form water. The SO3 unites with the water of the solvent to reform H2SO4, that is, sulfuric acid. The formation of ZnSO4, however, develops sufficient energy not only to replace and liberate the hydrogen of the sulfuric acid, but also to leave over a considerable excess, which in our case is expended in forming the current. Hence, the zinc does not wait until the electrolytic process puts free oxygen at its disposal, in order first to become oxidized and then to become dissolved in the acid. On the contrary, it enters directly into the process, which only comes into being at all by this participation of the zinc. We see here how obsolete chemical notions come to the aid of the obsolete contact notions. According to modern views, a salt is an acid in which hydrogen has been replaced by a metal. The process under investigation confirms this view. The direct replacement of the hydrogen of the acid by the zinc fully explains the energy change. The old view, adhered to by Wiedemann, regards a salt as a compound of a metallic oxide with an acid and therefore speaks of sulfuric zinc oxide instead of zinc sulfate. But to arrive at sulfuric zinc oxide in our battery of zinc and sulfuric acid, the zinc must first be oxidized. In order to oxidize the zinc fast enough, we must have free oxygen. In order to get free oxygen, we must assume, since hydrogen appears at the copper plate, that the water is decomposed. In order to decompose water, we need tremendous energy. But how are we to get this? simply, quote, by the electrolytic process, unquote, which itself cannot come into operation as long as its chemical end product, the quote-unquote sulfuric zinc oxide, has not begun to be formed. The child gives birth to the mother. Consequently, here again, Wiedemann puts the whole course of the process absolutely the wrong way around and upside down. And the reason is that he lumps together active and passive electrolysis 
two directly opposite processes simply as electrolysis. So far we have only examined the events in the battery, that is, the process in which an excess of energy is set free by chemical action and is converted into electricity by the arrangements of the battery. But it is well known that this process can also be reversed. The electricity of a constant current produced in the battery from chemical energy can, in its turn, be reconverted into chemical energy in a decomposition cell inserted in the circuit. The two processes are obviously the opposites of each other. If the first is regarded as chemico-electric, then the second is electrochemical. Both can take place in the same circuit with the same substances. Thus, the voltaic pile from gas elements, the current of which is produced by the union of hydrogen and oxygen to form water, can in a decomposition cell inserted in the circuit furnish hydrogen and oxygen in the proportion in which they form water. The usual mode of view lumps these two opposite processes together under the single expression, electrolysis, and does not even distinguish between active and passive electrolysis, between an exciting liquid and a passive electrolyte. Thus Wiedemann treats of electrolysis in general for 143 pages, and then adds at the end some remarks on quote-unquote electrolysis in the battery, in which, moreover, the processes in actual batteries only occupy the lesser part of the 17 pages of this section. Also, in the quote-unquote theory of electrolysis that follows, this contrast of battery and decomposition cell is not even mentioned, and anyone who looked for some treatment of the energy changes in the circuit in the next chapter, the influence of electrolysis on the conduction resistance and the electromotive force in the circuit, would be bitterly disappointed. Let us now consider the irresistible, quote-unquote, electrolytic process, which is able to separate H2 from O without visible supply of energy, and which plays the same role in the present section of the book as did previously the mysterious, quote-unquote, electric force of separation. Quote, Besides the primary, purely electrolytic process of separation of the ions, a quantity of secondary, Purely chemical processes, quite independent of the first, take place by the action of the ions split off by the current. This action can take place on the material of the electrodes and on the bodies that are decomposed, and in the case of solutions, also on the solvent. Unquote. Volume 1, page 481. Let us return to the above-mentioned battery, zinc and copper in dilute sulfuric acid. Here, according to Wiedemann's own statement, the separated ions are the H2 and O of the water. Consequently for him, the oxidation of the zinc and the formation of ZnSO4 is a secondary, purely chemical process, independent of the electrolytic process, in spite of the fact that it is only through it that the primary process becomes possible. Let us now examine somewhat in detail the confusion that must necessarily arise from this inversion of the true course of events. Let us consider in the first place the so-called secondary processes in the decomposition cell, of which Wiedemann puts forward some examples, pages 481, 482. Footnote by Engels. It may be noted here once for all that Wiedemann employs throughout the old chemical equivalent values, writing HO, Z, N, C, L, etc. In my equations, the modern atomic weights are everywhere employed, putting therefore H2O, Z, N, C, L, 2, etc. End of footnote by Engels. 1. Quote, the electrolysis of Na2SO4 dissolved in water. This, quote, breaks up into one equivalent of SO3 plus O and one equivalent of Na. The latter, however, reacts on the water solvent and splits off from it one equivalent of H while one equivalent of sodium is formed and becomes dissolved in the surrounding water. Unquote. The equation is Na2SO4 plus 2H2O equals O plus SO3 plus 2NaOH plus 2H. In fact, in this example, the decomposition Na2SO4 equals Na2 plus SO3 plus O could be regarded as the primary electrochemical process and the further transformation Na2 
plus 2H2O equals 2NaHO plus 2H as the secondary purely chemical one. But this secondary process is affected immediately at the electrode where the hydrogen appears. The very considerable quantity of energy, 111,810 heat units for NaOH aqueous solution according to Julius Thomson, thereby liberated, is therefore at least for the most part converted into electricity and only a portion in the cell is transformed directly into heat. But the latter can also happen to the chemical energy directly or primarily liberated in the battery. The quantity of energy which has thus become available and converted into electricity, however, is to be subtracted from that which the current has to supply for continued decomposition of the Na2SO4. If the conversion of sodium into hydrated oxide appeared in the first moment of the total process as a secondary process, from the second moment onwards it becomes an essential factor of the total process and so ceases to be secondary. But yet a third process takes place in this decomposition cell. SO3 combines with H2O to form H2SO4, sulfuric acid, provided the SO3 does not enter into combination with the metal of the positive electrode, in which case again energy would be liberated. But this change does not necessarily proceed immediately at the electrode, and consequently the quantity of energy in parentheses 21,320 heat units, J. Thompson, thereby liberated, becomes converted wholly or mainly into heat in the cell itself, and provides at most a very small portion of the electricity in the current. The only really secondary process occurring in this cell is therefore not mentioned at all by Wiedemann. 2. Quote, if a solution of copper sulfate is electrolyzed between a positive copper electrode and a negative one of platinum, one equivalent of copper separates out for one equivalent of water decomposed at the negative platinum electrode with simultaneous decomposition of sulfuric acid in the same current circuit. At the positive electrode, one equivalent of SO4 should make its appearance. But this combines with the copper of the electrode to form one equivalent of CuSO4, which becomes dissolved in the water of the electrolyzed solution. Unquote. In the modern chemical mode of expression, we have therefore to represent the process as follows. Copper is deposited on the platinum. The liberated SO4, which cannot exist by itself, splits up into SO3 plus O, the latter escaping in the free state. The SO3 takes up H2O from the aqueous solvent and forms H2SO4, which again combines with the copper of the electrode to form CuSO4, H2 being set free. Accurately speaking, we have here three processes. 1. The separation of Cu and SO4. 2. SO3 plus O plus H2O equals H2SO4 plus O. 3. H2SO4 plus Cu equals H2 plus CuSO4. It is natural to regard the first as primary, the two others as secondary. But if we inquire into the energy changes, we find that the first process is completely compensated by a part of the third. The separation of copper from SO4 by the reuniting of both at the other electrode. If we leave out of account the energy required for shifting the copper from one electrode to the other, and likewise the inevitable, not accurately demonstrable loss of energy in the cell by conversion into heat, we have here a case where the so-called primary process withdraws no energy from the current. The current provides energy exclusively to make possible the separation of H2 and O, which moreover is indirect, and this proves to be the real chemical result of the whole process, hence for carrying out a secondary or even tertiary process. Nevertheless, in both the above examples, as in other cases also, it is undeniable that the distinction of primary and secondary processes has a relative justification. Thus in both cases, among other things, water also is apparently decomposed and the elements of water given off at the opposite electrodes. Since, according to the most recent experiments, absolutely pure water comes as near as possible to being an ideal non-conductor, 
hence also a non-electrolyte, it is important to show that in these and similar cases, it is not the water that is directly electrochemically decomposed, but that the elements of water are separated from the acid, in the formation of which, here it is true, the water solvent must participate. 3. Quote, if one electrolyzes hydrochloric acid simultaneously in two U-tubes, using in one tube a zinc-positive electrode and in the other tube one of copper, then in the first tube a quantity of zinc, 32.53, is dissolved, in the other a quantity of copper, 2 times 32.7, unquote. For the time being, let us leave the copper out of account and consider the zinc. The decomposition of HCl is regarded here as the primary process, the solution of Zn as secondary. According to this conception, therefore, the current brings to the decomposition cell from outside the energy necessary for the separation of H and Cl, and after this separation is completed, the Cl combines with the Zn, whereby a quantity of energy is set free that is subtracted from that required for separating H and Cl. The current needs only, therefore, to supply the difference. So far everything agrees beautifully. But if we consider the two amounts of energy more closely, we find that the one liberated on the formation of ZnCl2 is larger than that used up in separating 2HCl. Consequently, that the current not only does not need to supply energy, but on the contrary receives energy. We are no longer confronted by a passive electrolyte, but by an exciting fluid, not a decomposition cell but a battery which strengthens the current forming voltaic pile by a new element. The process which we are supposed to conceive as secondary becomes absolutely primary, becoming the source of energy of the whole process and making the latter independent of the current supplied by the voltaic pile. We see clearly here the source of the whole confusion prevailing in Wiedemann's theoretical description. Wiedemann's point of departure is electrolysis. Whether this is active or passive, battery or decomposition cell, is all one to him. Sawbones is sawbones, as the sergeant major said to the doctor of philosophy doing his year's military service. And since it is easier to study electrolysis in the decomposition cell than in the battery, he does in fact take the decomposition cell as his point of departure, and he makes the processes taking place in it and the partly justifiable division of them into primary and secondary, the measure of the altogether reverse processes in the battery, not even noticing when his decomposition cell becomes surreptitiously transformed into a battery. Hence he is able to put forward the statement, quote, The chemical affinity that the separated substances have for the electrodes has no influence on the electrolytic process as such, unquote. Volume 1 page 471. A sentence which in this absolute form, as we have seen, is totally false. Hence, further, his threefold theory of current formation, firstly, the old traditional one, by means of pure contact, secondly, that derived by means of abstractly conceived electric force of separation, which in an inexplicable manner obtains for itself or for the quote-unquote electrolytic process, the requisite energy for splitting apart the H and Cl in the battery, and for forming a current as well. And finally, the modern chemico-electric theory, which demonstrates the source of this energy in the algebraic sum of the chemical reactions in the battery. Just as he does not notice that the second explanation overthrows the first, so also he has no idea that the third in its turn overthrows the second. On the contrary, the principle of the conservation of energy is merely added in a quite superficial way to the old theory handed down from routine, just as a new geometrical theorem is appended to an earlier one. He has no inkling that this principle makes necessary a revision of the whole traditional point of view, in this as in all other fields of natural science. Hence, Fiedemann confines himself to noting the principle in his explanation of the current, and then calmly puts it on one side, taking it up again only right at the end of the book, in the chapter on the work performed by the current. Even in the theory of the excitation of electricity by contact, volume 1, page 781 at sec, the conservation of energy plays no role at all in relation to the chief subject dealt with, and is only incidentally brought in 
for throwing light on subsidiary matters. It is and remains a quote-unquote secondary process. Let us return to the above example 3. There, the same current was used to electrolyze hydrochloric acid in two U-tubes, but in one there was a positive electrode of zinc, in the other the positive electrode used was of copper. According to Faraday's basic law of electrolysis, the same galvanic current decomposes in each cell equivalent quantities of electrolyte, and the quantities of the substances liberated at the two electrodes are also in proportion to their equivalents. Volume 1, page 470. In the above case, it was found that in the first tube, a quantity of zinc, 32.53, was dissolved, and in the other, a quantity of copper, 2 times 31.7. Nevertheless, continues Wiedemann, quote, this is no proof for the equivalence of these values. They are observed only in the case of very weak currents, with the formation of zinc chloride on the one hand, and of copper chloride on the other. In the case of denser currents, with the same amount of zinc dissolved, the quantity of dissolved copper would sink with formation of increasing quantities of chloride up to 31.7. It is well known that zinc forms only a single compound with chlorine, zinc chloride, ZnCl. Copper, on the other hand, forms two compounds, copperic chloride, CuCl2, and copperous chloride, Cu2Cl2. Hence the process is that the weak current splits off two copper atoms from the electrode for each two chlorine atoms. The two copper atoms remaining united by one of their valencies, while their two free valencies unite with the two chlorine atoms. There should be a graph for this on the screen right now. Now back to the text. On the other hand, if the current becomes stronger, it splits the copper atoms apart altogether, and each one unites with the two chlorine atoms. In the case of currents of medium strength, both compounds are formed side by side. Thus it is solely the strength of the current that determines the formation of one or the other compound, and therefore the process is essentially electrochemical, if this word has any meaning at all. Nevertheless, Wiedemann declares explicitly that it is secondary, hence not electrochemical, but purely chemical. The above experiment is one performed by Renault, 1867, and is one of a whole series of similar experiments, in which the same current is led in one U-tube through salt solution, in parentheses, positive electrode, zinc, and in another cell through a varying electrolyte, with various metals as the positive electrode. The amounts of the other metals dissolved here, for each equivalent of zinc, diverged very considerably, and Wiedemann gives the results of the whole series of experiments, which, however, in point of fact, are mostly self-evident chemically and could not be otherwise. Thus, for one equivalent of zinc, only two-thirds of an equivalent of gold is dissolved in hydrochloric acid. This can only appear remarkable if, like Wiedemann, one adheres to the old equivalent weights, and writes ZnCl for zinc chloride, according to which both the chlorine and the zinc appear in the chloride with only a single valency. In reality, two chlorine atoms are included to one zinc atom, ZnCl2, and as soon as we know this formula, we see at once that in the above determination of equivalents, the chlorine atom is to be taken as the unit, and not the zinc atom. The formula for gold chloride, however, is AuCl3, from which it is at once seen that 3ZnCl2 contains exactly as much chlorine as 2AuCl3. And so, all primary, secondary, and tertiary processes in the battery or cell are compelled to transform for each part by weight of zinc converted into zinc chloride, neither more or less than two-thirds of a part by weight of gold into gold chloride. Footnote. As it stands, this is untrue. Probably part by weight is a slip of Engel's pen for equivalent by weight or some such phrase. End of footnote. This holds absolutely unless the compound AuCl3 also could be prepared by galvanic means, in which case two equivalents of gold even would have to be dissolved for one equivalent of zinc, when also similar variations according to the current strength 
could occur as in the case of copper and chlorine mentioned above. Footnote. Again, this does not make sense as it stands. Presumably Engels meant to refer to a hypothetical AUCL. End of footnote. The value of Renault's researches consist in the fact that they show how Faraday's law is confirmed by facts that appear to contradict it, but what they are supposed to contribute in throwing light on secondary processes in electrolysis is not evident. Wiedemann's third example led us again from the decomposition cell to the battery, and in fact the battery offers by far the greatest interest when one investigates the electrolytic processes in relation to the transformations of energy taking place. Thus we not infrequently encounter batteries in which the chemico-electric processes seem to take place in direct contradiction to the law of the conservation of energy and in opposition to chemical affinity. According to Poggendorf's measurements, the battery, zinc-concentrated salt solution-platinum, provides a current of strength 134.6. Hence we have here quite a respectable quantity of electricity, one-third more than in the Daniel cell. What is the source of the energy appearing here as electricity? The quote-unquote primary process is the replacement of sodium in the chlorine compound by zinc. But in ordinary chemistry, it is not zinc that replaces sodium, but vice versa. Sodium replacing zinc from chlorine and other compounds. The quote-unquote primary process, far from being able to give the current the above quantity of energy, on the contrary, requires itself a supply of energy from outside in order to come into being. Hence, with the mere quote-unquote primary process, we are again at a standstill. Let us look therefore at the real process. We find that the change is not Zn plus 2 NaCl equals ZnCl2 plus 2 Na, but Zn plus 2 NaCl plus 2 H2O equals ZnCl2 plus 2 NaOH plus H2. In other words, the sodium is not split off in the free state at the negative electrode, but forms a hydroxide, as in the above example 1, pages 118 to 119. To calculate the energy changes taking place here, Julius Thomson's determinations provide us at least with certain important data. According to them, the energy liberated on combination is as follows. ZnCl2 equals 97,210, ZnCl2 aqua equals 15,630, making a total for dissolved zinc chloride equals 112,840 heat units, 2NaOH aqua equals 223,620 heat units, in total 336,000 460 heat units. Deducting consumption of energy on the separations, 2 NaCl aqua equals 193,020 heat units, 2 H2O equals 136,720 heat units, in total 329,740 heat units. The excess of liberated energy equals 6,720 heat units. This amount is obviously small for the current strength obtained, but it suffices to explain, on the one hand, the separation of the sodium from chlorine, and on the other hand, the current formation in general. We have here a striking example of the fact that the distinction of primary and secondary processes is purely relative, and leads us ad absurdum as soon as we take it absolutely. The primary electrolytic process, taken alone, not only cannot produce any current, but cannot even take place itself. It is only the secondary, ostensibly purely chemical process, that makes the primary one possible, and moreover, supplies the whole surplus energy for current formation. In reality, therefore, it proves to be the primary process and the other the secondary one. When the rigid differences and opposites, as imagined by the metaphysicians and metaphysical natural scientists, were dialectically reversed into their opposites by Hegel, it was said that he had twisted the words in their mouths. But if nature itself proceeds exactly like old Hegel, it is surely time to examine the matter more closely. 
with greater justification one can regard as secondary those processes which, while taking place in consequence of the chemical-electric process of the battery or the electrochemical process of the decomposition cell, do so independently and separately, occurring therefore at the same distance from the electrodes. The energy changes taking place in such secondary processes, likewise, do not enter into the electric process. Directly they neither withdraw energy from it nor supply energy to it. Such processes occur very frequently in the decomposition cell. We saw an instance in the example 1 above on the formation of sulfuric acid during electrolysis of sodium sulfate. They are, however, of lesser interest here. Their occurrence in the battery, on the other hand, is of greater practical importance. For although they do not directly supply energy to it, or withdraw it from the chemico-electric process, nevertheless they alter the total available energy present in the battery, and thus affect it indirectly. There belongs here, besides, subsequent chemical changes of the ordinary kind, the phenomena that occur when the ions are liberated at the electrodes in a different condition from that in which they usually occur in the free state, and when they pass over to the latter only after moving away from the electrodes. In such cases the ions can assume a different density or a different state of aggregation. They can also undergo considerable changes in regard to their molecular constitution, and this case is the most interesting. In all these cases, an analogous heat change corresponds to the secondary, chemical or physical change of the ions taking place at a certain distance from the electrodes. Usually heat is set free, in some case it is consumed. The heat change is of course restricted in the first place to the place where it occurs. The liquid in the battery or decomposition cell becomes warmer or cooler, while the rest of the circuit remains unaffected. Hence this heat is called local heat. The liberated chemical energy available for conversion into electricity is therefore diminished or increased by the equivalent of this positive or negative local heat produced in the battery. According to Favre, in a battery with hydrogen peroxide and hydrochloric acid, two-thirds of the total energy set free is consumed as local heat. The Grove cell, on the other hand, on closing the circuit, became considerably cooler and therefore supplied energy from outside to the circuit by absorption of heat. Hence we see that these secondary processes also react on the primary one. We can make whatever approach we like. The distinction between primary and secondary processes remains a merely relative one and is regularly suspended in the interaction of one with the other. If this is forgotten and such relative opposites treated as absolute, one finally gets hopelessly involved in contradictions, as we have seen above. As is well known, on the electrolytic separation of gases, the metal electrodes become covered with a thin layer of gas. In consequence, the current strength decreases until the electrodes are saturated with gas, whereupon the weakened current again becomes constant. Favre and Silberman have shown that local heat arises also in such a decomposition cell. This local heat, therefore, can only be due to the fact that the gases are not liberated at the electrodes in the same state in which they usually occur, but that they are only brought into their usual state after their separation from the electrode by a further process bound up with the development of heat. But what is the state in which the gases are given off at the electrodes? It is impossible to express oneself more cautiously on this than Wiedemann does. He terms it, quote-unquote, a certain, a quote-unquote, allotropic, a quote-unquote, active, and finally, in the case of oxygen, several times, a quote-unquote, ozonized state. In the case of hydrogen, his statements are still more mysterious. Incidentally, the view comes out that ozone and hydrogen peroxide are the forms in which this quote-unquote active state is realized. Our author is so keen in his pursuit of ozone that he even explains the extreme electronegative properties of certain peroxides from the fact that they possibly quote, contain a part of the oxygen in the ozonized state, unquote. Volume 1, page 57. Certainly, both ozone and hydrogen peroxide are formed on the so-called decomposition of water, but only in small quantities. There is no basis at all for assuming that in the case mentioned, 
local heat is produced first of all by the origin and then by the decomposition of any large quantities of the above two compounds. We do not know the heat of formation of ozone, O3, from free oxygen atoms. According to Berthelot, the heat of formation of hydrogen peroxide from liquid H2O plus O equals minus 21,480. The origin of this compound in any large amount would therefore give rise to a large excess of energy, about 30% of the energy required for the separation of H2 and O, which could not but be evident and demonstrable. Finally, ozone and hydrogen peroxide would only take oxygen into account, apart from current reversals, where both gases would come together at the same electrode, but not hydrogen. Yet the latter also escapes in a quote-unquote active state, so much so that in the combination potassium nitrate solution between platinum electrodes, it combines directly with the nitrogen split off from the acid to form ammonia. In point of fact, all these difficulties and doubts have no existence. The electrolytic process has no monopoly of splitting off bodies, quote-unquote, in an active state. Every chemical decomposition does the same thing. It splits off the liberated chemical elements, in the first place in the form of free atoms, of O, H, N, etc., which only after their liberation can unite to form molecules, O2, H2, N2, etc., and on thus uniting give off a definite, though up to now still undetermined, quantity of energy which appears as heat. Footnote. This quantity has now not only been determined but utilized. Thus, if the hydrogen is previously split into atoms, the ordinary oxyhydrogen flame can be made a great deal hotter. End of footnote. But during the infinitesimal moment of time when the atoms are free, they are the bearers of the total quantity of energy that they can take up at all. While possessed of their maximum energy, they are free to enter into any combination offered them. Hence they are, quote-unquote, in an active state, in contrast to the molecules O2, H2, N2, which have already surrendered a part of this energy and cannot enter into combination with other elements, without this quantity of energy surrendered being resupplied from outside. We have no need, therefore, to resort to ozone and hydrogen peroxide, which themselves are only products of this active state. For instance, we can undertake the above-mentioned formation of ammonia on electrolysis of potassium nitrate even without a battery, simply by chemical means, by adding to nitric acid or a nitrate solution a liquid in which hydrogen is set free by a chemical process. In both cases, the active state of the hydrogen is the same. But the interesting point about the electrolytic process is that here the transitory existence of the free atoms becomes, as it were, tangible. The process here is divided into two phases. The electrolysis provides free atoms at the electrodes, but their combination to form molecules occurs at some distance from the electrodes. However infinitesimally minute this distance may be, compared to measurements where masses are concerned, it suffices to prevent the energy liberated on formation of the molecules being used for the electric process, at least for the most part, and so determines its conversion into heat, the local heat in the battery. But it is owing to this that the fact is established that the elements are split off as free atoms, and for a moment have existed in the battery as free atoms. This fact, which in pure chemistry can only be established by theoretical conclusions, is here proved experimentally, insofar as this is possible without sensuous perception of the atoms and molecules themselves. Footnote. It has since been proved experimentally. End of footnote. Herein lies the high scientific importance of the so-called local heat of the battery. The conversion of chemical energy into electricity by means of the battery is a process about whose course we know next to nothing, and which we shall get to know in more detail only when the modus operandi of electric motion itself becomes better known. The battery has ascribed to it a quote-unquote electric force of separation, which is given for each particular battery. As we saw at the outset, Wiedemann conceded that this electric force of separation is not a definite form of energy. On the contrary, it is primarily nothing more than the capacity, the property, of a battery to convert a definite quantity of liberated chemical energy into electricity in unit time. Throughout the whole course of events, this chemical energy itself never assumes the form 
of a quote-unquote electric force of separation, but on the contrary, at once and immediately, takes on the form of the so-called electromotive force, that is, of electric motion. If in ordinary life, we speak of the force of a steam engine in the sense that it is capable in unit time of converting a definite quantity of heat into the motion of masses, this is not a reason for introducing the same confusion of ideas into scientific thought also. We might just as well speak of the varying force of a pistol, a carbine, a smoothboard gun, and a blunderbuss, because with equal gunpowder charges and projectiles of equal weight, they shoot varying distances. But here the wrongness of the expression is quite obvious. Everyone knows that it is the ignition of the gunpowder charge that drives the bullet, and that the varying range of the weapon is only determined by the greater or lesser dissipation of energy according to the length of the barrel, the form of the projectile, and the tightness of its fitting. But it is the same for steam power and for electric force of separation. Two steam engines, other conditions being equal, that is, assuming the quantity of energy liberated in equal periods of time to be equal in both, or two galvanic batteries, of which the same thing holds good, differ as regards performance of work, only owing to their greater or lesser dissipation of energy. And if until now all armies have been able to develop the technique of firearms, without the assumption of a special shooting force of weapons, the science of electricity has absolutely no excuse for assuming a quote-unquote electric force of separation, analogous to this shooting force, a force which embodies absolutely no energy, and which therefore of itself cannot perform a millionth of a milligram meter of work. The same thing holds good for the second form of this quote-unquote force of separation, the quote-unquote electric force of contact of metals, mentioned by Helmholtz. It is nothing but the property of metals to convert on their contact the existing energy of another form into electricity. Hence it is likewise a force that does not contain a particle of energy. If we assume with Wiedemann that the source of energy of contact electricity lies in the vis viva of the motion of adhesion, then this energy exists in the first place in the form of this mass motion, and on its vanishing becomes converted immediately into electric motion, without even for a moment assuming the form of a quote-unquote electric force of contact. And now we are assured in addition that the electromotive force, that is, the chemical energy reappearing as electric motion, is proportional to this quote-unquote electric force of separation, which not only contains no energy, but owing to the very conception of it, cannot contain any. This proportionality between non-energy and energy obviously belongs to the same mathematics as that in which there figures the quote, ratio of the unit of electricity to the milligram, unquote. But the absurd form, which owes its existence only to the conception of a simple property as a mystical force, conceals a quite simple tautology. The capacity of a given battery to convert liberated chemical energy into electricity is measured by what? By the quantity of energy reappearing in the circuit as electricity in relation to the chemical energy consumed in the battery. That is all. In order to arrive at an electric force of separation, one must take seriously the device of the two electric fluids. To convert this from its neutrality to its polarity, hence to split it apart, requires a certain expenditure of energy, the electric force of separation. Once separated, the two electricities can, on being reunited, again give off the same quantity of energy, electromotive force. But since nowadays no one, not even Wiedemann, regards the two electricities as having a real existence, it means that one is writing for a defunct public if one deals at length with such a point of view. The basic error of the contact theory consists in the fact that it cannot divorce itself from the idea that contact force or electric force of separation is a source of energy, which of course was difficult when the mere capacity of an apparatus to bring about transformation of energy had been converted into a force. For indeed, a force ought precisely to be a definite form of energy. Because Wiedemann cannot rid himself of this unclear notion of force, although alongside of it, the modern ideas of indestructible and uncreatable energy have been forced upon him, he falls into his nonsensical explanation of the current, number one, and into all the later demonstrated contradictions. If the expression electric force of separation is directly contrary to reason, the other, 
quote-unquote electromotive force, is at least superfluous. We had heat engines long before we had electromotors, and yet the theory of heat has been developed quite well without any special thermomotor force. Just as the simple expression heat includes all phenomena of motion that belong to this form of energy, so also can the expression electricity in its own sphere. Moreover, very many forms of action of electricity are not at all directly quote-unquote motor, the magnetization of iron, chemical decomposition, conversion into heat. And finally, in every natural science, even in mechanics, it is always an advance if the word force can somehow be got rid of. Footnote. This statement has been very fully confirmed by the progress of physics in the last 50 years. It is interesting to note that idealistic writers have used this disappearance of the notion of force as an argument that materialism is being refuted. End of footnote. We saw that Wiedemann did not accept the chemical explanation of the process in the battery without a certain reluctance. This reluctance continually attacks him. Where he can blame anything on the so-called chemical theory, this is certain to occur. Thus, quote, it is by no means established that the electromotive force is proportional to the intensity of chemical action, unquote. Volume 1, page 791. Certainly not in every case, but where this proportionality does not occur, it is only a proof that the battery has been badly constructed, that dissipation of energy takes place in it. For that reason, Wiedemann is quite right in paying no attention in his theoretical deductions to such subsidiary circumstances which falsify the purity of the process, but in simply assuring us that the electromotive force of a cell is equal to the mechanical equivalent of the chemical action taking place in it, in unit time with unit intensity of current. In another passage we read, quote, that further in the acid-alkali battery, the combination of acid and alkali is not the cause of current formation, follows from the experiments of paragraph 61, Becquerel and Fechner, paragraph 260, Dubois-Raymond, and paragraph 261, Verm-Müller, according to which, in certain cases, when these are present in equivalent quantities, no current makes its appearance, and likewise from the experiments, in parentheses, Henrici, mentioned in paragraph 62, that on interposing a solution of potassium nitrate between the potassium hydroxide and nitric acid, the electromotive force makes its appearance in the same way as without this interposition. Unquote. Volume 1, page 791. The question whether the combination of acid and alkali is the cause of current formation is a matter of very serious concern for our author. Put in this form, it is very easy to answer. The combination of acid and alkali is first of all the cause of a salt being formed with liberation of energy. Whether this energy wholly or partly takes the form of electricity depends on the circumstances under which it is liberated. For instance in the battery, nitric acid and potassium hydroxide between platinum electrodes, this will be at least partially the case, and it is a matter of indifference for the formation of the current whether a potassium nitrate solution is interposed between the acid and alkali or not, since this can at most delay the salt formation but not prevent it. If, however, a battery is formed, like one of Wurm Müller's, to which Wiedemann constantly refers, where the acid and alkali solution is in the middle, but a solution of their salt at both ends, and in the same concentration as the solution that is formed in the battery, then it is obvious that no current can arise because on account of the end members, since everywhere identical bodies are formed, no ions can be produced. Hence the conversion of the liberated energy into electricity has been prevented in as direct a manner as if the circuit had not been closed. It is therefore not to be wondered at that no current is obtained. But that acid and alkali can in general produce a current is proved by the battery. Carbon, sulfuric acid, one part in ten of water, Potassium hydroxide, one part in ten of water, carbon, which according to Raoul has a current strength of 73. Footnote by Engels. In all the following data relating to current strength, the Daniel cell is put equaling 100. End of footnote by Engels. And that with suitable arrangement of the battery, acid and alkali can provide a current strength corresponding to the large quantity of energy set free on their combination, 
is seen from the fact that the most powerful batteries known depend almost exclusively on the formation of alkali salts, for example that of wheatstone, platinum, platinic chloride, potassium amalgam, current strength 230, lead peroxide, dilute sulfuric acid, potassium amalgam, equaling 326, manganese peroxide instead of lead peroxide, equaling 280. In each case, if zinc amalgam was employed instead of potassium amalgam, the current strength fell almost exactly by 100. Similarly in the battery, manganese dioxide, potassium permanganate solution, potassium hydroxide, potassium, beats obtained the current strength 302, and further, platinum, dilute sulfuric acid, potassium, equaling 293.8. Joule, platinum, nitric acid, potassium hydroxide, potassium amalgam, equaling 302. The quote-unquote cause of these exceptionally strong current strengths is certainly the combination of acid and alkali, or alkali metal, and the large quantity of energy thereby liberated. A few pages further in, it is again stated, quote, It must, however, be carefully borne in mind that the equivalent in work of the whole chemical action taking place at the place of contact of the heterogeneous bodies is not to be directly regarded as the measure of the electromotive force in the circuit. When, for instance, in the acid-alkali battery, in parentheses, iterum crispinus, close parentheses, of Becquerel, these two substances combine when carbon is consumed in the battery, platinum, molten potassium nitrate, carbon, when the zinc is rapidly dissolved in an ordinary cell of copper, impure zinc, dilute sulfuric acid, with formation of local currents, then a large part of the work produced, in parentheses, it should read energy liberated, close parentheses, in these chemical processes, is converted into heat, and is thus lost for the total current circuit, unquote. Volume 1, page 798. All these processes are to be referred to loss of energy in the battery. They do not affect the fact that the electric motion arises from transformed chemical energy, but only affect the quantity of energy transformed. Electricians have devoted an endless amount of time and trouble to composing the most diverse batteries and measuring their quote-unquote electromotive force. The experimental material thus accumulated contains very much of value, but certainly still more that is valueless. For instance, what is the scientific value of experiments in which quote-unquote water is employed as the electrolyte, when, as has now been proved by F. Kohlrausch, water is the worst conductor and therefore also the worst electrolyte, and where, therefore, it is not the water but its unknown impurities that cause the process. Footnote by Engels A column of the purest water prepared by Kohlrausch one milliliter in length offered the same resistance as a copper conductor of the same diameter, and a length approximately that of the moon's orbit. Naumann, Allgemeine Chemie, General Chemistry, page 729. See Appendix 2, page 335. End of footnote by Engels. And yet, for instance, almost half of all Fechner's experiments depend on such employment of water, even his, quote-unquote, Experimentum Crucis, by which he sought to establish the contact theory impregnably on the ruins of the chemical theory. As is already evident from this, in almost all such experiments, a few only accepted, the chemical process in the battery, which however formed the source of the so-called electromotive force, remained practically disregarded. There are however a number of batteries whose chemical composition does not allow of any certain conclusion being drawn, as to the chemical changes proceeding in them when the current circuit is closed. On the contrary, as Wiedemann, volume 1, page 797, says it is, quote, not to be denied that we are by no means in all cases able to obtain an insight into the chemical attractions in the battery, unquote. Hence, from the ever more important chemical aspect, all such experiments are valueless, insofar as they are not repeated with these processes under control. In these experiments, it is indeed only quite by way of exception that any account is taken of the energy changes taking place in the battery. Many of them were made before the law of the equivalence of motion was recognized in natural science, but as a matter of custom, 
they continue to be dragged from one textbook into another without being controlled or their value summed up. It has been said that electricity has no inertia, which has about as much sense as saying velocity has no specific gravity, but this certainly cannot be said of the theory of electricity. So far, we have regarded the galvanic cell as all arrangement in which, in consequence of the contact relations established, chemical energy is liberated in some way for the time being unknown and converted into electricity. We have likewise described the decomposition cell as an apparatus in which the reverse process is set up, electric motion being converted into chemical energy and used up as such. In so doing, we had to put in the foreground the chemical side of the process that has been so much neglected by electricians, because this was the only way of getting rid of the lumber of notions handed down from the old contact theory and the theory of the two electric fluids. This once accomplished, the question was whether the chemical process in the battery takes place under the same conditions as outside it, or whether special phenomena make their appearance that are dependent on the electric excitation. In every science, incorrect notions are, in the last resort, apart from errors of observation, incorrect notions of correct facts. The latter remains even when the former are shown to be false. Although we have discarded the old contact theory, the established facts remain, of which they were supposed to be the explanation. Let us consider these, and with them the electric aspect proper of the process in the battery. It is not disputed that on the contact of heterogeneous bodies, with or without chemical changes, an excitation of electricity occurs which can be demonstrated by means of an electroscope or a galvanometer. As we have already seen at the outset, it is difficult to establish in a particular battery the source of energy of these in themselves extremely minute phenomena of motion. It suffices that the existence of such an external source is generally conceded. In 1850-53, to Kohlrausch published a series of experiments in which he assembled the separate components of a battery in pairs and tested the static electric stresses produced in each case. The electromotive force of the cell should then be composed of the algebraic sum of these stresses. Thus, taking the stress of Zn slash Cu equals 100, he calculates the relative strengths of the Daniel and Grove cells as follows. For the Daniel cell, Zn slash Cu plus amalgam Zn slash H2SO4 plus Cu slash SO4 equals 100 plus 149 minus 21 equals 228. For the Grove cell, Zn slash Pt plus amalgam Zn slash H2SO4 plus Pt slash HNO3 equals 107 plus 149 plus 149 equals 405, which closely agrees with the direct measurement of the current strengths of these cells. These results, however, are by no means certain. In the first place, Wiedemann himself calls attention to the fact that Kohlrausch only gives the final result, but, quote, unfortunately, no figures for the results of the separate experiments, unquote. In the second place, Wiedemann himself repeatedly recognizes that all attempts to determine quantitatively the electric excitation on contact of metals, and still more on contact of metal and fluid, are at least very uncertain, on account of the numerous unavoidable sources of error. If nevertheless he repeatedly uses Kohlrausch's figures in his calculations, we shall do better not to follow him here, the more so as another means of determination is available, which is not open to these objections. If the two exciting plates of a battery are immersed in the liquid, and then joined into a circuit by the terminals of a galvanometer, according to Wiedemann, quote, the initial deflection of its magnetic needle before chemical changes have altered the strength of the electric excitation, is a measure of the sum of the electromotive forces in the circuit. Unquote. Batteries of various strengths, therefore, give initial deflections of various strengths, and the magnitude of these initial deflections is proportional to the current strength of the corresponding batteries. It looks as if we had here tangibly before our eyes the quote-unquote electric force of separation the quote-unquote contact force, 
which causes motion independently of any chemical action. And this in fact is the opinion of the whole contact theory. In reality, we are confronted here by a relation between electric excitation and chemical action that we have not yet investigated. In order to pass to this subject, we shall first of all examine rather more closely the so-called electromotive law. In so doing, we shall find that here also the traditional contact notions not only provide no explanation, but once again directly bar the way to an explanation. If in any cell consisting of two metals and a liquid, for example zinc, dilute hydrochloric acid and copper, one inserts a third metal, such as a platinum plate, without connecting it to the external circuit by a wire, then the initial deflection of the galvanometer will be exactly the same as without the platinum plate. Consequently, it has no effect on the excitation of electricity. But it is not permissible to express this so simply in electromotive language. Hence one reads, quote, The sum of the electromotive forces of zinc and platinum, and platinum and copper, now takes the place of the electromotive force of zinc and copper in the liquid. Since the path of the electricities is not perceptibly altered by the insertion of the platinum plate, we can conclude from the identity of the galvanometer readings in the two cases that the electromotive force of zinc and copper in the liquid is equal to that of zinc and platinum plus that of platinum and copper in the same liquid. This would correspond to Volta's theory of the excitation of electricity between the metals as such. The result, which holds good for all liquids and metals, is expressed by saying, on their electromotive excitation by liquids, metal follows the law of the voltaic series. This law is also given the name of the electromotive law. Unquote. Biedemann, Volume 1, page 62. In saying that in this combination, the platinum does not act at all as an exciter of electricity, one expresses what is simply a fact. If one says that it does act as an exciter of electricity, but in two opposite directions with equal strength, so that the effect is neutralized, the fact is converted into a hypothesis, merely for the sake of doing honor to the quote-unquote electromotive force. In both cases, the platinum plays the role of a fictitious person. During the first deflection, there is still no closed circuit. The acids, being undecomposed, do not conduct. They can only conduct by means of the ions. Footnote. This statement is in accord with theory 50 years ago, but incorrect. End of footnote. If the third metal has no influence on the first deflection, this is simply the result of the fact that it is still isolated. How does the third metal behave after the establishment of the constant current and during the latter? In the voltaic series of metals, in most liquids, zinc lies after the alkali metals, fairly close to the positive end, and platinum at the negative end, copper being between the two. Hence, if platinum is put above between copper and zinc, it is negative to them both. If the platinum had any effect at all, the current in the liquid would have to flow to the platinum both from the zinc and from the copper, that is, away from both electrodes to the unconnected platinum, which would be a contradictio in adjectio. The basic condition for the action of several different metals in the battery consists precisely in their being connected among themselves, externally to the circuit. An unconnected superfluous metal in the battery acts as a non-conductor, it can neither form ions nor allow them to pass through, and without ions, we know of no conduction in the electrolytes. Hence, it is not merely a fictitious person, it even stands in the way by forcing the ions to go around it. The same thing holds good if we connect the zinc and platinum, leaving the copper unconnected in the middle. Here, the latter, if it had any effect at all, would produce a current from the zinc to the copper, and another from the copper to the platinum. Hence, it would have to act as a sort of intermediary electrode and give off hydrogen on the side turned towards the zinc, which again is impossible. If we discard the traditional electromotive mode of expression, the case becomes extremely simple. As we have seen, the galvanic battery is an apparatus in which chemical energy is liberated and transformed into electricity. It consists, as a rule, of one or more liquids and two metals as electrodes which must be connected together by a conductor outside the liquids. This completes the apparatus. 
anything else that is dipped unconnected into the exciting liquid, whether metal, glass, resin, or whatever you like, cannot participate in the chemical electric process taking place in the battery in the formation of the current, so long as the liquid is not chemically altered. It can at most hinder the process. Whatever the capacity for exciting electricity of a third metal dipped into the liquid may be, or that of one or both electrodes of the battery, it cannot have any effect so long as this metal is not connected to the circuit outside the liquid. Consequently, not only is Wiedemann's derivation as given above of the so-called electromotive law false, but the interpretation which he gives to this law is also false. One can speak neither of a compensating electromotive activity of the unconnected metal, since the sole condition for such activity is cut off from the outset, nor can the so-called electromotive law be deduced from a fact which lies outside the sphere of this law. In 1845, old Poggendorf published a series of experiments in which he measured the electromotive force of various batteries, that is to say, the quantity of electricity supplied by each of them in unit time. Footnote. This is of course not electromotive force in the modern sense of the term. End of footnote. Of these experiments, the first 27 are of special value, in each of which three given metals were one after another connected in the same exciting liquid to three different batteries, and the latter investigated and compared as regards the quantity of electricity produced. As a good adherent of the contact theory, Poggendorf also put the third metal unconnected in the battery in each experiment, and so had the satisfaction of convincing himself that in all 81 batteries, this third metal remained a pure inactive element in the combination. But the significance of these experiments by no means consists in this fact, but rather in the confirmation and establishment of the correct meaning of the so-called electromotive law. Let us consider the above series of batteries, in which zinc, copper, and platinum are connected together in pairs in dilute hydrochloric acid. Here Poggendorf found the quantities of electricity produced to be as follows, taking that of a Daniel cell as 100. Zinc copper, 78.8, copper platinum, 74.3, total 153.1, zinc platinum, 153.7. Thus, zinc in direct connection with platinum produced almost exactly the same quantity of electricity as zinc, copper, copper, platinum. The same thing occurred in all other batteries, whatever liquids and metals were employed. When, from a series of metals in the same exciting liquid, batteries were formed in such a way that in each case, according to the voltaic series, valid for this liquid, the second, third, fourth, etc., one after the other, were made to serve as negative electrodes for the preceding one, and as positive electrodes for that which followed, then the sum of the quantities of electricity produced by all these batteries is equal to the quantity of electricity produced by a battery formed directly between the two end members of the whole metallic series. For instance, in dilute hydrochloric acid, the sum of the total quantities of electricity produced by the batteries, zinc-zinc, zinc-iron, iron copper, copper silver, and silver platinum, would be equal to that produced by the battery zinc platinum. A pile formed from all the cells of the above series would, other things being equal, be exactly neutralized by the introduction of a zinc platinum cell with a current of the opposite direction. In this form, the so-called electromotive law has a real and considerable significance. It reveals a new aspect of the inner connection between chemical and electrical action. Hitherto, on investigating mainly the source of energy of the galvanic current, this source, the chemical change, appeared as the active side of the process. The electricity was produced from it, and therefore appeared primarily as passive. Now this is reversed. The electric excitation, determined by the constitution of the heterogeneous bodies, put into contact in the battery, can neither add nor subtract energy from the chemical action, other than by conversion of liberated energy into electricity. It can, however, according as the battery is made up, accelerate or slow down this action. If the battery, zinc-dilute hydrochloric acid-copper, produced in unit time only half as much electricity for the current as the battery, 
zinc dash dilute hydrochloric acid dash platinum, this means in chemical terms that the first battery produces in unit time only half as much zinc chloride and hydrogen as the second. Hence, the chemical action has been doubled, although the purely chemical conditions for this action have remained the same. The electric excitation has become the regulator of the chemical action. It appears now as the active side, the chemical action being the passive side. Thus it becomes comprehensible that a number of processes previously regarded as purely chemical now appear as electrochemical. Chemically pure zinc is not attacked at all by dilute acid, or only very weakly. Ordinary commercial zinc, on the other hand, is rapidly dissolved with formation of a salt and production of hydrogen. It contains an admixture of other metals and carbon, which make their appearance in unequal amounts at various places of the surface. Local currents are formed in the acid between them and the zinc itself, the zinc areas forming the positive electrodes, and the other metals the negative electrodes, the hydrogen bubbles being given off on the latter. Likewise the phenomena that when iron is dipped into a solution of copper sulfate, it becomes covered with a layer of copper, is now seen to be an electrochemical phenomena, one determined by the currents which arise between the heterogeneous areas of the surface of the iron. In accordance with this, we find also that the voltaic series of metals in liquids corresponds on the whole to the series in which metals replace one another from their compounds with halogens and acid radicals. At the extreme negative end of the voltaic series, we regularly find the metals of the gold group, gold, platinum, palladium, rhodium, which oxidize with difficulty, are little or not at all attacked by acids, and which are easily precipitated from their salts by other metals. At the extreme positive end are the alkali metals, which exhibit exactly the opposite behavior. They are scarcely to be split off from their oxides, except with the greatest expenditure of energy. They occur in nature almost exclusively in the form of salts, and of all the metals, they have by far the greatest affinity for halogens and acid radicals. Between these two come the other metals in somewhat varying sequence, but such that, on the whole, electrical and chemical behavior corresponds to one another. The sequence of the separate members varies according to the liquids and has hardly been finally established for any single liquid. It is even permissible to doubt whether there exists such an absolute voltaic series of metals for any single liquid. Given suitable batteries and decomposition cells, two pieces of the same metal can act as positive and negative electrodes respectively, hence the same metal can be both positive and negative towards itself. In thermocells, which convert heat into electricity, with large temperature differences at the two junctions, the direction of the current is reversed. The previously positive metal becomes negative and vice versa. Similarly, there is no absolute series according to which the metals replace one another from their chemical compounds with a particular halogen or acid radical. In many cases, by supplying energy in the form of heat, we are able almost at will to alter and reverse the series valid for ordinary temperatures. Hence we find here a peculiar interaction between chemical action and electricity. The chemical action in the battery, which provides the electricity with the total energy for current formation, is in many cases first brought into operation, and in all cases quantitatively regulated by the electric charges developed in the battery. If previously the processes in the battery seem to be chemico-electric in nature, we see here that they are just as much electrochemical. From the point of view of formation of the constant current, chemical action appears to be the primary thing. From the point of view of the excitation of current, it appears as secondary and accessory. The reciprocal action excludes any absolute primary or absolute secondary, but it is just as much a double-sided process, from which its very nature can be regarded from two different standpoints. To be understood in its totality, it must even be investigated from both standpoints one after the other, before the total result can be arrived at. If, however, we adhere one-sidedly to a single standpoint as the absolute one, in contrast to the other, or if we arbitrarily jump from one to the other according to the momentary needs of our argument, we shall remain entangled in the one-sidedness of metaphysical thinking. The interconnection escapes us 
and we become involved in one contradiction after another. We saw above that, according to Wiedemann, the initial deflection of the galvanometer, immediately after dipping the exciting plates into the liquid of the battery and before chemical changes have altered the strength of the electric excitation, is, quote, a measure of the sum of the electromotive forces in the circuit, unquote. So far, we have become acquainted with the so-called electromotive force as a form of energy, which in our case was produced in an equivalent amount from chemical energy, and which in the further course of the process became reconverted into equivalent quantities of heat, mass motion, etc. Here we learn all at once that the quote, sum of the electromotive forces in the circuit, unquote, is already in existence before this energy has been liberated by chemical changes. In other words, that the electromotive force is nothing but the capacity of a particular cell to liberate a particular quantity of chemical energy in unit time and to convert it into electric motion. As previously in the case of the electric force of separation, so here also the electromotive force appears as a force which does not contain a single spark of energy. Consequently, Wiedemann understands by quote-unquote electromotive force two totally different things. On the one hand, the capacity of a battery to liberate a definite quantity of given chemical energy and to convert it into electric motion. On the other hand, the quantity of electric motion itself that is developed. The fact that the two are proportional, that the one is a measure for the other, does not do away with the distinction between them. The chemical action in the battery, the quantity of electricity developed, and the heat in the circuit derived from it when no other work is performed, are even more than proportional, they are equivalent, but that does not infringe the diversity between them. The capacity of a steam engine, with a given cylinder bore and piston stroke, to produce a given quantity of mechanical motion from the heat supplied, is very different from this mechanical motion itself, however proportional to it it may be. And while such a mode of speech was tolerable, at a time when natural science had not yet said anything of the conservation of energy, nevertheless it is obvious that since the recognition of this basic law, it is no longer permissible to confuse real active energy in any form with the capacity of an apparatus to impart this form of energy which is being liberated. This confusion is a corollary on the confusion of force and energy in the case of the electric force of separation. These two confusions provide a harmonious background for Wiedemann's three mutually contradictory explanations of the current, and in the last resort are the basis in general for all his errors and confusions in regard to the so-called electromotive force. Besides the above considered peculiar interaction between chemical action and electricity, there is also a second point that they have in common, which likewise indicates a closer kinship between these two forms of motion. Both can exist only for an infinitesimal period. The chemical process takes place suddenly for each group of atoms undergoing it. It can be prolonged only by the presence of new material that continually renews it. The same thing holds for electric motion. Hardly has it been produced from some other form of motion before it is once more converted into a third form. Only the continual readiness of available energy can produce the constant current, in which at each moment new quantities of motion assume the form of energy and lose it again. An insight into this close connection of chemical and electric action and vice versa will lead to important results in both spheres of investigation. Footnote. This has of course been very completely verified by the researches of the last 50 years. Electrical theory was revolutionized by Thomson's study of electrical conduction in gases, which led to his discovery of electrons, and the whole of chemistry, including the chemistry of such unions as that between carbon and hydrogen, which at first sight is quite unconnected with electrical phenomena, has been restated in terms of electrons. End of footnote. Such an insight is already becoming more and more widespread. Among chemists, Lothar Meyer, and after him Kekulé, have plainly stated that a revival of the electrochemical theory in a rejuvenated form is impending. Among electricians also, as indicated especially by the latest works of F. Kohlrausch, the conviction seems finally to have taken hold that only exact attention to the chemical processes in the battery and decomposition cell 
can help their science to emerge from the blind alley of all traditions. And in fact, one cannot see how else a firm foundation is to be given to the theory of galvanism, and so secondarily to that of magnetism and static electricity, other than by a chemically exact, general revision of all traditional uncontrolled experiments, made from an obsolete scientific standpoint, with exact attention to establishing the energy changes, and preliminary rejection of all traditional theoretical notions about electricity. Tidal Friction, Kant and Thomson Tate, on the Rotation of the Earth and Lunar Attraction Thomson and Tate, Natural Philosophy, Volume 1, page 191, paragraph 276 Quote there are also indirect resistances, owing to friction impeding the tidal motions, on all bodies which, like the earth, have portions of their free surfaces covered by liquid, which, as long as these bodies move relatively to neighboring bodies, must keep drawing off energy from their relative motions. Thus, if we consider in the first place the action of the moon alone on the earth with its oceans, lakes, and rivers, we perceive that it must tend to equalize the period of the Earth's rotation about its axis and the revolution of the two bodies about their center of inertia, because as long as these periods differ, the tidal action of the Earth's surface must keep subtracting energy from their motions. To view the subject more in detail, and at the same time to avoid unnecessary complications, let us suppose the Moon to be a uniform spherical body, the mutual action and reaction of gravity between her mass and the Earth's will be equivalent to a single force in some line through her center, and must be such as to impede the Earth's rotation as long as this is performed in a shorter period than the Moon's motion around the Earth. It must, therefore, lie in some such direction as the line MQ in the diagram, which represents, necessarily with enormous exaggeration, its deviation, OQ, from the Earth's center. Picture of this diagram should be on the screen right now. Back to the text. Now the actual force on the Moon in the line MQ may be regarded as consisting of a force in the line MO towards the Earth's center, sensibly equal in amount to the whole force, and a comparatively very small force in the line MT, perpendicular to MO. This latter is very nearly tangential to the moon's path, and is in the direction with her motion. Such a force, if suddenly commencing to act, would, in the first place, increase the moon's velocity. But after a certain time, she would have moved so much farther from the earth, in virtue of this acceleration, as to have lost, by moving against the earth's attraction, as much velocity as she gained by the tangential accelerating force. The effect of a continued tangential force, acting with the motion, but so small in amount, as to make only a small deviation at any moment from the circular form of the orbit, is to gradually increase the distance from the central body, and to cause as much again as its own amount of work to be done against the attraction of the central mass, by the kinetic energy of motion lost. The circumstances will be readily understood by considering this motion round the central body, in a very gradual spiral path tending outwards. Provided the law of force is the inverse square of the distance, the tangential component of gravity against the motion will be twice as great as the disturbing tangential force in the direction with the motion. And therefore, one half of the amount of work done against the former is done by the latter, and the other half by kinetic energy taken from the motion. The integral effect on the moon's motion of the particular disturbing cause now under consideration is most easily found by using the principle of moments of momenta. Thus we see that as much moment of momentum is gained in any time by the motions of the centers of inertia, of the moon and earth relatively to their common center of inertia, as is lost by the earth's rotation about its axis. The sum of the moments of momentum of the centers of inertia of the Moon and Earth as moving at present, is about 4.45 times the present moment of momentum of the Earth's rotation. The average plane of the former is the ecliptic, 
and therefore the axis of the two moments are inclined to one another at the average angle of 23 degrees, 27.5 minutes, which, as we are neglecting the sun's influence on the plane of the moon's motion, may be taken as the actual inclination of the two axes at present. The resultant or whole moment of momentum is therefore 3.38 times that of the Earth's present rotation, and its axis is inclined 19 degrees, 13 minutes to the axis of the Earth. Hence, the ultimate tendency of the tides is to reduce the Earth and Moon to a simple uniform rotation, with this resultant moment round this resultant axis, as if they were two parts of one rigid body, in which condition the Moon's distance would be increased approximately in the ratio 1 to 1.46, being the ratio of the square of the present moment of momentum of the centers of inertia to the square of the whole moment of momentum, and the period of revolution in the ratio 1 to 1.77, being that of the cubes of the same quantities. The distance would therefore be increased to 847,100 miles, and the period lengthened to 48.36 days. Were there no other body in the universe but the Earth and the Moon, these two bodies might go on moving thus forever, in circular orbits round their common center of inertia, and the Earth rotating about its axis in the same period, so as always to turn the same face to the Moon, and therefore to have all the liquids at its surface at rest relatively to the solid. But the existence of the Sun would prevent any such state of things from being permanent. There would be solar tides, twice high water and twice low water, in the period of the Earth's revolution relatively to the Sun, that is to say, twice in the solar day, or which would be the same thing, the month. This could not go on without loss of energy by fluid friction. It is not easy to trace the whole course of the disturbance in the Earth's and Moon's motions which this cause would produce, but its ultimate effect must be to bring the Earth, Moon and Sun to rotate round their common center of inertia like parts of one rigid body. Unquote. Footnote. This theory has since been greatly developed, and the actual rate at which tidal friction is lengthening the day has been approximately found. End of footnote. Kant, in 1754, was the first to put forward the view that the rotation of the Earth is retarded by tidal friction, and that this effect will only reach its conclusion Quote, when its, in parentheses the Earth's, surface will be at relative rest in relation to the Moon, that is, when it will rotate on its axis in the same period that the Moon takes to revolve round the Earth, and consequently will always turn the same side to the latter. Unquote. He held the view that this retardation had its origin in tidal friction alone, arising therefore from the presence of fluid masses on the Earth. Quote, if the Earth were a quite solid mass without any fluid, neither the attraction of the Sun nor of the Moon would do anything to alter its free axial rotation. For it draws with equal force both the eastern and western parts of the terrestrial sphere, and so does not cause any inclination either to the one or to the other side. Consequently, it allows the Earth full freedom to continue this rotation unhindered, as if there were no external influence on it. Unquote. Kant could rest content with this result. All scientific prerequisites were lacking at that time for penetrating deeper into the effect of the moon on the rotation of the earth. Indeed, it required almost a hundred years before Kant's theory obtained general recognition, and still longer before it was discovered that the ebb and flow of the tides are only the visible aspect of the effect exercised by the attraction of the sun and moon on the rotation of the earth. This more general conception of the matter is just that which has been developed by Thomson and Tate. The attraction of the moon and sun affects not only the fluids of the terrestrial body or its surface, but the whole mass of the earth in general in a manner that hinders the rotation of the earth. As long as the period of the Earth's rotation does not coincide with the period of the Moon's revolution round the Earth, so long the attraction of the Moon, to deal with this alone, first of all, has the effect of bringing the two periods closer and closer together. 
If the rotational period of the relative central body were longer than the period of revolution of the satellite, the former would be gradually lengthened. Footnote. A slip of the pen. The word should obviously be shortened. End of footnote. If it were shorter, as is the case for the Earth, it would be slowed down. But neither in the one case will kinetic energy be created out of nothing, nor in the other will it be annihilated. In the first case, the satellite would approach closer to the central body and shorten its period of revolution. In the second, it would increase its distance from it and acquire a longer period of revolution. In the first case, the satellite, by approaching the central body, loses exactly as much potential energy as the central body gains in kinetic energy from the accelerated rotation. In the second case, the satellite, by increasing its distance, gains exactly the same amount of potential energy as the central body loses in kinetic energy of rotation. The total amount of dynamic energy, potential and kinetic, present in the Earth-Moon system remains the same. The system is fully conservative. Footnote. There can be no doubt that Engels was right when he pointed out that Thomson and Tate's error in saying that the changes in the length of the day and month, quote, could not go on without loss of energy by fluid friction, unquote. We now know that there are tides in the earth as well as in the ocean, but Engels was wrong in supposing that the moon could move away from the earth without loss of energy, for in a system such as the earth and moon, the angular momentum, moment of momentum, remains constant unless it is diminished or increased by the tidal action or of some external body. If both momentum and energy are conserved, no systematic slowing down can occur. This is readily seen in the simplified case, where the moon is supposed to go round in a circle in the plane of the Earth's equator. In this case, there are only two possible variables, the length of the day and month. But so long as the moment of momentum and the energy of the system are unchanged, we have two equations to determine these quantities, and they are therefore fixed. End of footnote. It is seen that this theory is entirely independent of the physico-chemical constitution of the bodies concerned. It is derived from the general laws of motion of free heavenly bodies, the connection between them being produced by attraction in proportion to their masses and inverse proportion to the square of the distance between them. The theory has obviously arisen as a generalization of Kant's theory of tidal friction, and is even presented here by Thomson and Tate as its substantiation on mathematical lines. But in reality, and remarkably enough the authors simply have no inkling of this, in reality it excludes the special case of tidal friction. Friction is hindrance to the motion of mass, and for centuries it was regarded as the destruction of such motion, and therefore of kinetic energy. We now know that friction and impact are the two forms in which kinetic energy is converted into molecular energy, into heat. In all friction, therefore, kinetic energy as such is lost in order to reappear, not as potential energy in the sense of dynamics, but as molecular motion in the definite form of heat. The kinetic energy lost by friction is therefore, in the first place, really lost for the dynamic aspect of the system concerned. It can only become dynamically effective again if it is reconverted from the form of heat into kinetic energy. How then does the matter stand in the case of tidal friction? It is obvious that here also the whole of the kinetic energy communicated to the masses of water on the Earth's surface by lunar attraction is converted into heat, whether by friction of the water particles among themselves in virtue of the viscosity of the water, or by friction at the rigid surface of the earth, and the communition of rocks which stand up against the tidal motion. Of this heat, there is reconverted into kinetic energy only the infinitesimally small part that contributes to evaporation at the surface of the water. But even this infinitesimally small amount of kinetic energy, leaving the total system, earth-moon, at a part of the earth's surface, remains first of all subject to the conditions prevailing at the Earth's surface, and these conditions leads to all energy active there, reaching one and the same final destination, final conversion into heat and radiation into space. Consequently, 
To the extent that tidal friction indisputably acts in an impending manner on the rotation of the Earth, the kinetic energy used for this purpose is absolutely lost to the dynamic system Earth-Moon. It can therefore not reappear within this system as dynamic potential energy. In other words, of the kinetic energy expended in impending the Earth's rotation by means of the attraction of the Moon, only that part that acts on the solid mass of the Earth's body can entirely reappear as dynamic potential energy, and hence be compensated for by a corresponding increase of the distance of the Moon. On the other hand, the part that acts on the fluid masses of the Earth can do so only in so far as it does not set these masses themselves into a motion opposite in direction to that of the Earth's rotation, for such a motion is wholly converted into heat and is finally lost to the system by radiation. What holds good for tidal friction at the surface of the Earth is equally valid for the so often hypothetically assumed tidal friction of a supposed fluid nucleus of the Earth's interior. The most peculiar part of the matter is that Thomson and Tate do not notice that in order to establish the theory of tidal friction, they are putting forward a theory that proceeds from the tacit assumption that the Earth is an entirely rigid body, and so exclude any possibility of tidal flow, and hence also of tidal friction. Footnote. Although Engels formulated his criticism of Thomson and Tate incorrectly, he was right in a fundamental point. The Earth-Moon system would evolve in such a way as to lengthen the day and month, even if there were no ocean. For the Earth is a solid body, but not a rigid body, in the sense in which this latter word is used in theoretical mechanics, that is to say, a body whose shape is unaltered by the forces on it. Of course, a rigid body is a mathematical abstraction, like a flat surface. There are no perfectly rigid bodies, nor flat surfaces, and it has now been shown that the solid Earth bends slightly as the Moon's attraction varies. There are also solid tides, as well as liquid tides, though much smaller. These act in the same way as the tides in the ocean, though much more slowly. The part played by labor in the transition from ape to man. Footnote. This article was intended to introduce a larger work, which Engels planned to call Die drei Grundformen der Knechtschaft, Outline of the General Plan. Engels never finished it, nor even this intro, which breaks off at the end. It would be included in Dialectics of Nature. End of footnote. 1. Labor is the source of all wealth the political economists assert. And it really is the source, next to nature, which supplies it with the material that it converts into wealth. But it is even infinitely more than this. It is the prime basic condition for all human existence, and this to such an extent that, in a sense, we have to say that labor created man himself. Many hundreds of thousands of years ago, during an epoch not yet definitely determinable, of that period of the Earth's history known to geologists as the Tertiary Period, most likely towards the end of it, a particularly highly developed race of anthropoid apes lived somewhere in the tropical zone, probably on a great continent that has now sunk to the bottom of the Indian Ocean. Footnote. In the 1870s when this was written, British zoographer Philip Lutley Sclater put forth a theory that a continent he called Lemuria existed which reached from modern Madagascar to India and Sumatra, and this continent has since submerged beneath the Indian Ocean. End of footnote. Darwin has given us an approximate description of these ancestors of ours. They were completely covered with hair, they had beards and pointed ears, and they lived in bands in the trees. First. Owing to their way of living, which meant that the hands had different functions than the feet when climbing, these apes began to lose the habit of using their hands to walk, and adopted a more and more erect posture. This was the first decisive step in the transition from ape to man. All extant anthropoid apes can stand erect and move about on their feet alone, but only in case of urgent need and in a very clumsy way. Their natural gait is in a half-erect posture, and includes the use of the hands. 
the majority rest the knuckles of the fist on the ground, and with legs drawn up, swing the body through their long arms, much as a cripple moves on crutches. In general, all the transition stages from walking on all fours to walking on two legs are still to be observed among the apes today. The latter gait, however, has never become more than a makeshift for any of them. It stands to reason that if erect gait among our hairy ancestors became first a rule and then in time a necessity, other diverse functions must in the meantime have developed upon the hands. Already among the apes there is some difference in the way the hands and the feet are employed. In climbing, as mentioned above, the hands and feet have different uses. The hands are used mainly for gathering and holding food in the same way as the forepaws of the lower mammals are used. Many apes use their hands to build themselves nests in the trees, or even to construct roofs between the branches to protect themselves against the weather, as the chimpanzee, for example, does. With their hands they grasp sticks to defend themselves against enemies, or bombard their enemies with fruits and stones. In captivity they used their hands for a number of simple operations copied from human beings. It is in this that one sees the great gulf between the undeveloped hand of even the most man-like apes and the human hand that has been highly perfected by hundreds of thousands of years of labor. The number and general arrangement of the bones and muscles are the same in both hands, but the hand of the lowest savage can perform hundreds of operations that no simian hand can imitate. No simian hand has ever fashioned even the crudest stone knife. The first operations for which our ancestors gradually learned to adapt their hands during the many thousands of years of transition from ape to man could have been only very simple ones. The lowest savages, even those in whom regression to a more animal-like condition with a simultaneous physical degeneration can be assumed, are nevertheless far superior to these transitional beings. Before the first flint could be fashioned into a knife by human hands, a period of time probably elapsed, in comparison with which the historical period known to us appears insignificant. But the decisive step had been taken, the hand had become free, and could henceforth attain ever greater dexterity. The greater flexibility thus acquired was inherited and increased from generation to generation. Thus, the hand is not only the organ of labor, it is also the product of labor. Only by labor, by adaptation to ever new operations, through the inheritance of muscles, ligaments, and over long periods of time, bones that had undergone special development, and the ever-renewed employment of this inherited finesse in new, more and more complicated operations, have given the human hand the high degree of perfection required to conjure into being the pictures of a Raphael, the statues of a Torvaldsen, the music of a Paganini. But the hand did not exist alone. It was only one member of an integral, highly complex organism. And what benefited the hand, benefited also the whole body it served, and this in two ways. In the first place, the body benefited from the law of correlation of growth, as Darwin called it. This law states that the specialized forms of separate parts of an organic being are always bound up with certain forms of other parts that apparently have no connection with them. Thus all animals that have red blood cells without cell nuclei and in which the head is attached to the first vertebrae by means of a double articulation, in parentheses condyles, also without exception possess lacteal glands for suckling their young. Similarly, cloven hoofs in mammals are regularly associated with the possession of a multiple stomach for rumination. Changes in certain forms involve changes in the form of other parts of the body, although we cannot explain the connection. Perfectly white cats with blue eyes are always, or almost always, deaf. The gradually increasing perfection of the human hand and the commensurate adaptation of the feet for erect gait have undoubtedly, by virtue of such correlation, reacted on other parts of the organism. However, this action has not yet been sufficiently investigated 
for us to be able to do more here than to state the fact in general terms. Much more important is the direct, demonstrable influence of the development of the hand on the rest of the organism. It has already been noted that our simian ancestors were gregarious. It is obviously impossible to seek the derivation of man, the most social of all animals, from non-gregarious immediate ancestors. Mastery over nature began with the development of the hand, with labor, and widened man's horizon at every new advance. He was continually discovering new, hitherto unknown properties in natural objects. On the other hand, the development of labor necessarily helped to bring the members of society closer together by increasing cases of mutual support and joint activity and by making clear the advantage of this joint activity to each individual. In short, men in the making arrived at the point where they had something to say to each other. Necessity created the organ. The undeveloped larynx of the ape was slowly but surely transformed by modulation to produce constantly more developed modulation, and the organs of the mouth gradually learned to pronounce one articulate sound after another. Comparison with animals proves that this explanation of the origin of language, from and in the process of labor, is the only correct one. The little that even the most highly developed animals need to communicate to each other does not require articulate speech. In its natural state, no animal feels handicapped by its inability to speak or to understand human speech. It is quite different when it has been tamed by man. The dog and the horse, by association with man, have developed such a good ear for articulate speech that they easily learn to understand any language within their range of concept. Moreover, they have acquired the capacity for feelings such as affection for man, gratitude, etc., which were previously foreign to them. Anyone who has had much to do with such animals will hardly be able to escape the conviction that in many cases they now feel their inability to speak as a defect, although, unfortunately, it is one that can no longer be remedied because their vocal organs are too specialized in a definite direction. However, where vocal organs exist, within certain limits even this inability disappears. The buccal organs of birds are as different from those of man as they can be, yet birds are the only animals that can learn to speak and it is the bird with the most hideous voice, the parrot, that speaks best of all. Let no one object that the parrot does not understand what it says. It is true that for the sheer pleasure of talking and associating with human beings, the parrot will chatter for hours at a stretch, continually repeating its whole vocabulary. But within the limits of its range of concepts, it can also learn to understand what it is saying. Teach a parrot swear words in such a way that it gets an idea of their meaning, one of the great amusements of sailors returning from the tropics. Tease it, and you will soon discover that it knows how to use its swear words just as correctly as a Berlin costermonger. The same is true of begging for tidbits. First labor, after it, and then with it, speech. These were the two most essential stimuli under the influence of which the brain of the ape gradually changed into that of man, which, for all its similarity, is far larger and more perfect. Hand in hand with the development of the brain went the development of its most immediate instruments, the senses. Just as the gradual development of speech is inevitably accompanied by a corresponding refinement of the organ of hearing, so the development of the brain as a whole is accompanied by a refinement of all the senses. The eagle sees much farther than man, but the human eye discerns considerably more in things than does the eye of the eagle. The dog has a far keener sense of smell than man, but it does not distinguish a hundredth part of the odors that for man are definite signs denoting different things. And the sense of touch which the ape hardly possesses in its crudest initial form, has been developed only side by side with the development of the human hand itself, through the medium of labor. The reaction on labor and speech, of the development of the brain and its attendant senses, 
of the increasing clarity of consciousness, power of abstraction and of conclusion, gave both labor and speech an ever-renewed impulse to further development. This development did not reach its conclusion when man finally became distinct from the ape, but on the whole made further powerful progress, its degree and direction, varying among different peoples and at different times, and here and there even being interrupted by local or temporary regression. This further development has been strongly urged forward, on the one hand, and guided along more definite directions, on the other, by a new element which came into play with the appearance of fully-fledged man, namely society. Hundreds of thousands of years, of no greater significance in the history of the earth than one second in the life of man, certainly elapsed before human society arose out of a troop of tree-climbing monkeys. Footnote by Engels A leading authority in this respect, Sir William Thompson, has calculated that little more than a hundred million years could have elapsed since the time when the earth had cooled sufficiently for plants and animals to be able to live on it. End of footnote by Engels. And what do we find once more as the characteristic difference between the troop of monkeys and human society? Labor. The ape herd was satisfied to browse over the feeding area determined for it by geographical conditions or the resistance of neighboring herds. It undertook migrations and struggles to win new feeding grounds, but it was incapable of extracting from them more than they offered in their natural state, except that it unconsciously fertilized the soil with its own excrement. As soon as all possible feeding grounds were occupied, there could be no further increase in the ape population. The number of animals could at best remain stationary. But all animals waste a great deal of food, and in addition destroy in the germ the next generation of the food supply. Unlike the hunter, the wolf does not spare the doe, which would provide it with the young the next year. The goats in Greece, that eat away the young bushes before they grow to maturity, have eaten bare all the mountains of the country. This quote-unquote predatory economy of animals plays an important part in the gradual transformation of species by forcing them to adapt themselves to other than the usual food, thanks to which their blood acquires a different chemical composition and the whole physical constitution gradually alters, while species that have remained unadapted die out. There is no doubt that this predatory economy contributed powerfully to the transition of our ancestors from ape to man. In a race of apes that far surpassed all others in intelligence and adaptability, this predatory economy must have led to a continual increase in the number of plants used for food and the consumption of more and more edible parts of food plants. In short, food became more and more varied, as did also the substances entering the body with it, substances that were the chemical premises for the transition to man. But all that was not yet labor in the proper sense of the word. Labor begins with the making of tools. And what are the most ancient tools that we find? The most ancient, judging by the heirlooms of prehistoric man that have been discovered, and by the mode of life of the earliest historical peoples and of the rawest of contemporary savages. They are hunting and fishing implements, the former at the same time serving as weapons. But hunting and fishing presuppose the transition from an exclusively vegetable diet to the concomitant use of meat, and this is another important step in the process of transition from ape to man. A meat diet, contained in an almost ready state, the most essential ingredients required by the organism for its metabolism. By shortening the time required for digestion, it also shortened the other vegetative bodily processes that correspond to those of plant life, and thus gained further time, material and desire for the active manifestation of animal life proper. And the farther man in the making moved from the vegetable kingdom, the higher he rose above the animal. Just as becoming accustomed to a vegetable diet side by side with meat, converted wild cats and dogs into the servants of man, 
So also adaptation to a meat diet side by side with a vegetable diet greatly contributed towards giving bodily strength and independence to man in the making. The meat diet, however, had its greatest effect on the brain, which now received a far richer flow of the materials necessary for its nourishment and development, and which, therefore, could develop more rapidly and perfectly from generation to generation. With all due respect to the vegetarians, man did not come into existence without a meat diet, and if the latter, among all peoples known to us, has led to cannibalism at some time or other, the forefathers of the Berliners, the Velatabians or Vilsians, used to eat their parents as late as the 10th century, that is of no consequence to us today. The meat diet led to two new advances of decisive importance, the harnessing of fire and the domestication of animals. The first still further shortened the digestive processes, as it provided the mouth with food already, as it were, half digested. The second made meat more copious by opening a new, more regular source of supply in addition to hunting, and moreover provided in milk and its products a new article of food at least as valuable as meat in its composition. Thus both these advances were in themselves new means for the emancipation of man. It would lead us too far afield to dwell here in detail on their indirect effects, notwithstanding the great importance they have had for the development of man and society. Just as man learned to consume everything edible, he also learned to live in any climate. He spread over the whole of the habitable world, being the only animal fully able to do so of its own accord. The other animals that have become accustomed to all climates, domestic animals and vermin, did not become so independently, but only in the wake of man and the transition from the uniformly hot climate of the original home of man to colder regions, where the year was divided into summer and winter, created new requirements, shelter and clothing as protection against cold and damp, and hence new spheres of labor, new forms of activity, which further and further separated man from the animal. By the combined function of hand, speech organs and brain, Not only in each individual, but also in society, men became capable of executing more and more complicated operations, and were able to set themselves, and achieve, higher and higher aims. The work of each generation itself became different, more perfect and more diversified. Agriculture was added to hunting and cattle raising. Then came spinning, weaving, metalworking, pottery and navigation. Along with trade and industry, art and science finally appeared. Tribes developed into nations and states. Law and politics arose, and with them that fantastic reflection of human things in the human mind, religion. In the face of all these images, which appeared in the first place to be products of the mind and seemed to dominate human societies, the more modest productions of the working hand retreated into the background, the more so since the mind that planned the labor was able, at a very early stage in the development of society, for example already in the primitive family, to have the labor that had been planned carried out by other hands than its own. All merits for the swift advance of civilization was ascribed to the mind, to the development and activity of the brain. Men became accustomed to explain their actions as arising out of thought instead of their needs which in any case are reflected and perceived in the mind. And so, in the course of time, there emerged that idealistic world outlook, which, especially since the fall of the world of antiquity, has dominated men's minds. It still rules them to such a degree that even the most materialistic natural scientists of the Darwinian school are still unable to form any clear idea of the origin of man, because under this ideological influence they do not recognize the part that has been played therein by labor. Animals, as has already been pointed out, change the environment by their activities in the same way, even if not to the same extent, as man does, and these changes, as we have seen, in turn, react upon and change those who made them. 
In nature, nothing takes place in isolation. Everything affects and is affected by every other thing. And it is mostly because this manifold motion and interaction is forgotten that our natural scientists are prevented from gaining a clear insight into the simplest things. We have seen how goats have prevented the regeneration of forests in Greece. On the island of St. Helena, goats and pigs, brought by the first arrivals, have succeeded in exterminating its old vegetation almost completely, and so have prepared the ground for the spreading of plants, brought by later sailors and colonists. But animals exert a lasting effect on their environment unintentionally, and as far as the animals themselves are concerned, accidentally. The further removed men are from animals, however, the more their effect on nature assumes the character of premeditated, planned action directed towards definite preconceived ends. The animal destroys the vegetation of a locality without realizing what it is doing. Man destroys it in order to sow field crops on the soil thus released, or to plant trees or vines, which he knows will yield many times the amount planted. He transfers useful plants and domestic animals from one country to another, and thus changes the flora and fauna of whole continents. More than this, through artificial breeding, both plants and animals are so changed by the hand of man that they become unrecognizable. The wild plants from which our grain varieties originated are still being sought in vain. There is still some dispute about the wild animals from which our very different breeds of dogs or equally numerous breeds of horses are descended. It goes without saying that it would not occur to us to dispute the ability of animals to act in a planned, premeditated fashion. On the contrary, a planned mode of action exists in embryo wherever protoplasm, living albumen, exists and reacts, that is, carries out definite, even if extremely simple, movements, as a result of definite external stimuli. Such reaction takes place even where there is yet no cell at all, far less a nerve cell. There is something of the plant action in the way insect-eating plants capture their prey, although they do it quite unconsciously. In animals, the capacity for conscious, planned action is proportional to the development of the nervous system, and among mammals, it attains a fairly high level. While fox hunting in England, one can daily observe how unerringly the fox makes use of its excellent knowledge of the locality in order to elude its pursuers, and how well it knows and turns to account all favorable features of the ground that cause the scent to be lost. Among our domestic animals, more highly developed thanks to association with man, one can constantly observe acts of cunning on exactly the same level as those of children. For, just as the development of history of the human embryo in the mother's womb is only an abbreviated repetition of the history, extending over millions of years, of the bodily development of our animal ancestors, starting from the worm, so the mental development of the human child is only a still more abbreviated repetition of the intellectual development of these same ancestors, at least of the later ones. But all the planned action of all animals has never succeeded in impressing the stamp of their will upon the earth that was left for man. In short, the animal merely uses its environment and brings about changes in it simply by its presence. Man by his changes makes it serve his ends, masters it. This is the final essential distinction between man and other animals, and once again it is labor that brings about this distinction. Let us not, however, flatter ourselves over much on account of our human victories over nature. For each such victory, nature takes its revenge on us. Each victory, it is true, in the first place, brings about the results we expected, but in the second and third places it has quite different, unforeseen effects, which only too often cancel the first. The people who, in Mesopotamia, Greece, Asia Minor, and elsewhere, destroyed the forests to obtain cultivable land, never dreamed that by removing along with the forests the collecting centers and reservoirs of moisture, they were laying the basis for the present forlorn state of those countries. 
when the Italians of the Alps used up the pine forests on southern slopes, so carefully cherished on the northern slopes, they had no inkling that by doing so they were cutting at the roots of the dairy industry in their region. They had still less inkling that they were thereby depriving their mountain springs of water for the greater part of the year and making it possible for them to pour still more furious torrents on the plains during the rainy seasons. Those who spread the potato in Europe were not aware that with these farinaceous tubers they were at the same time spreading scrofula. Thus at every step we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside nature, but that we, with flesh, blood and brain, belong to nature and exist in its midst, and that all our mastery of it consists in the fact that we have the advantage over all other creatures of being able to learn its laws and apply them correctly. And, in fact, with every day that passes, we are acquiring a better understanding of these laws and getting to perceive both the more immediate and the more remote consequences of our interference with the traditional course of nature. In particular, after the mighty advances made by the natural sciences in the present century, we are more than ever in a position to realize, and hence to control, also the more remote natural consequences of at least our day-to-day -day production activities. But the more this progresses, the more will men not only feel but also know their oneness with nature, and the more impossible will become the senseless and unnatural idea of a contrast between mind and matter, man and nature, soul and body, such as arose after the decline of classical antiquity in Europe, and obtained its highest elaboration in Christianity. It required the labor of thousands of years for us to learn a little of how to calculate the more remote natural effects of our actions in the field of production, but it has been still more difficult in regard to the more remote social effects of these actions. We mentioned the potato and the resulting spread of scrofula. But what is scrofula? compared to the effects which the reduction of the workers to a potato diet had on the living conditions of the popular masses in whole countries, or compared to the famine the potato blight brought to Ireland in 1847, which consigned to the grave a million Irishmen, nourished solely or almost exclusively on potatoes, and forced the emigration overseas of two million more. When the Arabs learned to distill spirits, it never entered their heads that by doing so, they were creating one of the chief weapons for the annihilation of the aborigines of the then still undiscovered American continent. And when afterwards Columbus discovered this America, he did not know that by doing so, he was giving a new lease of life to slavery, which in Europe had long ago been done away with, and laying the basis for the black slave trade. The men who in the 17th and 18th centuries labored to create the steam engine had no idea that they were preparing the instrument, which more than any other was to revolutionize social relations throughout the world. Especially in Europe, by concentrating wealth in the hands of a minority and dispossessing the huge majority, this instrument was destined at first to give social and political domination to the bourgeoisie but later to give rise to a class struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat, which can end only in the overthrow of the bourgeoisie and the abolition of all class antagonisms. But in this sphere too, by long and often cruel experience, and by collecting and analyzing historical material, we are gradually learning to get a clearer view of the indirect, more remote social effects of our production activity and so are afforded an opportunity to control and regulate these effects as well. This regulation, however, requires something more than mere knowledge. It requires a complete revolution in our hitherto existing mode of production, and simultaneously a revolution in our whole contemporary social order. All hitherto existing modes of production have aimed merely at achieving the most immediately and directly useful effect of labor. The further consequences, which appear only later, and become effective through gradual repetition and accumulation, were totally neglected. 
the original common ownership of land corresponded, on the one hand, to a level of development of human beings in which their horizon was restricted, in general to what lay immediately available, and presupposed, on the other hand, a certain superfluity of land that would allow some latitude for correcting the possible bad results of this primeval type of economy. When this surplus land was exhausted, common ownership also declined. All higher forms of production, however, led to the division of the population into different classes, and thereby to the antagonism of ruling and oppressed classes. Thus the interest of the ruling class became the driving factor of production, since production was no longer restricted to providing the barest means of subsistence for the oppressed people. This has been put into effect most completely in the capitalist mode of production prevailing today in Western Europe. The individual capitalists, who dominate production and exchange, are able to concern themselves only with the most immediate useful effects of their actions. Indeed, even this useful effect, inasmuch as it is a question of the usefulness of the article that is produced or exchanged, retreats far into the background, and the sole incentive becomes the profit to be made on selling. Classical political economy, the social science of the bourgeoisie, in the main examines only social effects of human actions in the fields of production and exchange that are actually intended. This fully corresponds to the social organization of which it is the theoretical expression. As individual capitalists are engaged in production and exchange for the sake of the immediate profit, only the nearest, most immediate results must first be taken into account. As long as the individual manufacturer or merchant sells a manufactured or purchased commodity with the usual coveted profit, he is satisfied and does not concern himself with what afterwards becomes of the commodity and its purchasers. The same thing applies to the natural effects of the same actions. What cared the Spanish planters in Cuba, who burned down forests on the slopes of the mountains, and obtained from the ashes sufficient fertilizer for one generation of very highly profitable coffee trees. What cared they that the heavy tropical rainfall afterwards washed away the unprotected upper stratum of the soil, leaving behind only bare rock? In relation to nature as to society, the present mode of production is predominantly concerned only about the immediate, the most tangible result and then surprise is expressed that the more remote effects of action directed to this end turn out to be quite different, are mostly quite the opposite in character, that the harmony of supply and demand is transformed into the very reverse opposite, as shown by the course of each ten years industrial cycle, even Germany has had a little preliminary experience of it in the quote-unquote crash, that private ownership, based on one's own labor, must of necessity develop into the expropriation of the workers, while all wealth becomes more and more concentrated in the hands of non-workers. That the manuscript breaks off here. Natural Science and the Spirit World Footnote From a manuscript of Engels, probably written in 1878, and first published in the Illustrierter Neue Weltkalender für das Jahr 1898. End of footnote. The dialectics that has found its way into popular consciousness finds expression in the old saying that extremes meet. In accordance with this, we should hardly err in looking for the most extreme degree of fantasy, credulity, and superstition not in that trend of natural science which, like the German philosophy of nature, tries to force the objective world into the framework of subjective thought, but rather in the opposite trend, which, relying on mere experience, treats thought with sovereign disdain and really has gone to the furthest extreme in emptiness of thought. This school prevails in England. Its father, the much-lauded Francis Bacon, already advanced the demand that his new empirical inductive method should be pursued to attain by its means, above all, longer life, rejuvenation, to a certain extent alteration of stature and features, 
transformation of one body into another, the production of new species, power over the air and the production of storms. He complains that such investigations have been abandoned, and in his natural history he actually gives recipes for making gold and performing various miracles. Similarly, Isaac Newton, in his old age, greatly busied himself with expounding the revelation of St. John. So it is not to be wondered at if in recent years English empiricism, in the person of some of its representatives, and not the worst of them, should seem to have fallen a hopeless victim to the spirit wrapping and spirit seeing imported from America. The first natural scientist belonging here is the very eminent zoologist and botanist Alfred Russell Wallace, the man who simultaneously with Darwin put forward the theory of evolution of species by natural selection. In his little work on miracles and modern spiritualism, London, Burns, 1875, he relates that his first experiences in this branch of natural knowledge date from 1844, when he attended the lectures of Mr. Spencer Hall on mesmerism and as a result carried out similar experiments on his pupils. Quote, I was extremely interested in the subject and pursued it with ardor. Unquote. He not only produced magnetic sleep together with the phenomena of articular rigidity and local loss of sensation, he also confirmed the correctness of Gal's map of the skull, because on touching any of Gal's organs, the corresponding activity was aroused in the magnetized patient and exhibited by appropriate and lively gestures. Further, he established that his patient, merely by being touched, partook of all the sensations of the operator. He made him drunk with a glass of water as soon as he told him that it was brandy. He could make one of the young men so stupid, even in the waking condition, that he no longer knew his own name, a feat, however, that other schoolmasters are capable of accomplishing without any mesmerism, and so on. Now it happens that I also saw this Mr. Spencer Hall in the winter of 1843-44, to in Manchester. He was a very mediocre charlatan, who traveled the country under the patronage of some parsons, and undertook magnetico-phrenological performances with a young girl, in order to prove thereby the existence of God, the immortality of the soul, and the incorrectness of the materialism that was being preached at that time by the Owenites in all big towns. The lady was sent into a magnetico sleep, and then, as soon as the operator touched any part of the skull corresponding to one of Gal's organs, she gave a bountiful display of theatrical, demonstrative gestures and poses representing the activity of the organ concerned. For instance, for the organ of philoprogenitiveness, she fondled and kissed an imaginary baby, etc. Moreover, the good Mr. Hall had enriched Gal's geography of the skull with a new island of Barataria. Right at the top of the skull he had discovered an organ of veneration, on touching which his hypnotic miss sank on to her knees, folded her hands in prayer, and depicted to the astonished Philistine audience an angel wrapped in veneration. This was the climax and conclusion of the exhibition the existence of God had been proved. The effect on me and one of my acquaintances was exactly the same as on Mr. Wallace. The phenomena interested us, and we tried to find out how far we could reproduce them. A wide-awake young boy of twelve years old offered himself as subject. Gently gazing into his eyes or stroking sent him without difficulty into the hypnotic condition. But since we were rather less credulous than Mr. Wallace, and set to work with rather less fervor, we arrived at quite different results. Apart from muscular rigidity and loss of sensation, which were easy to produce, we found also a state of complete passivity of the will, bound up with a peculiar hypersensitivity of sensation. The patient, when aroused from his lethargy by any external stimulus, exhibited very much greater liveliness than in the waking condition. 
There was no trace of any mysterious relation to the operator. Anyone else could just as easily set the sleeper into activity. To set Gal's cranial organs into action was the least that we achieved. We went much further. We could not only exchange them for one another, or make their seat anywhere in the whole body, but we also fabricated any amount of other organs, organs of singing, whistling, piping, dancing, boxing, sewing, cobbling, tobacco smoking, etc., and we could make their seat wherever we wanted. Wallace made his patients drunk on water, but we discovered in the great toe an organ of drunkenness which only had to be touched in order to cause the finest drunken comedy to be enacted. But it must be well understood, no organ showed a trace of action until the patient was given to understand what was expected of him. The boy soon perfected himself by practice to such an extent that the merest indication sufficed. The organs produced in this way then retained their validity for later occasions of putting to sleep, as long as they were not altered in the same way. The patient had even a double memory, one for the waking state and a second quite separate one for the hypnotic condition. As regards the passivity of the will and its absolute subjection to the will of a third person, this loses all its miraculous appearance when we bear in mind that the whole condition began with the subjection of the will of the patient to that of the operator and cannot be restored without it. The most powerful magician of a magnetizer in the world will come to the end of his resources as soon as his patient laughs him in the face. While we, with our frivolous skepticism, thus found that the basis of magnetico phrenological charlatanry lay in a series of phenomena which for the most part differ only in degree from those of the waking state and require no mystical interpretation, Mr. Wallace's quote-unquote ardor led him into a series of self-deceptions in virtue of which he confirmed Gal's map of the skull in all its details and noted a mysterious relation between operator and patient. Footnote by Engels As already said, the patients perfect themselves by practice. It is therefore quite possible that, when the subjection of the will has become habitual, the relation of the participants becomes more intimate, individual phenomena are intensified, and are reflected weakly even in the waking state. End of footnote by Engels Everywhere in Mr. Wallace's account, the sincerity of which reaches the degree of naivete, it becomes apparent that he was much less concerned in investigating the factual background of charlatanry than in reproducing all the phenomena at all costs. Only this frame of mind is needed for the man who was originally a scientist to be quickly converted into an adept by means of simple and facile self-deception. Mr. Wallace ended up with faith in magnetico-phrenological miracles, and so already stood with one foot in the world of spirits. He drew the other foot after him in 1865. On returning from his twelve years of travel in the tropical zone, experiments in table-turning introduced him to the society of various so-called mediums. How rapid his progress was, and how complete his mastery of the subject, is testified by the above-mentioned booklet. He expects us to take for good coin not only all the alleged miracles of home, the brothers Davenport and other quote-unquote mediums, who all, more or less, exhibit themselves for money, and who have, for the most part, been frequently exposed as impostors, but also a whole series of allegedly authentic spirit histories from early times. The Pythonesses of the Greek oracle, the witches of the Middle Ages, were all quote-unquote mediums, and Iamblichus, in his De Divinatione, already described quite accurately, quote, the most astonishing phenomena of modern spiritualism, unquote. Footnote, see Appendix 2, page 368. End of footnote. Just one example to show how lightly Mr. Wallace deals with the scientific corroboration and authentication of these miracles. It is certainly a strong assumption that we should believe 
that the aforesaid spirits should allow themselves to be photographed, and we have surely the right to demand that such spirit photographs should be authenticated in the most indubitable manner before we accept them as genuine. Now Mr. Wallace recounts on page 187 that in March 1872, a leading medium, Mrs. Guppy Nee Nichols, had herself photographed together with her husband and a small boy at Mr. Hudson's in Notting Hill, and on two different photographs a tall female figure, finely draped in a white gauze robes, with somewhat eastern features, was to be seen behind her in a pose as if giving a benediction. Quote, Here then, one of two things are absolutely certain. Either there was a living, intelligent, but invisible being present, or Mr. and Mrs. Guppy, the photographer and some fourth person, planned a wicked imposture and have maintained it ever since. Knowing Mr. and Mrs. Guppy so well as I do, I feel an absolute conviction that they are as incapable of an imposture of this kind as any earnest inquirer after truth in the Department of Natural Science. Unquote. Footnote by Engels The spirit world is superior to grammar. A joker once caused the spirit of the grammarian Lindley Murray to testify. To the question whether he was there, he answered, I are. The medium was from America. End of footnote by Engels. Footnote, see Appendix 2, page 369. End of footnote. Consequently, either deception or spirit photography. Quite so. And if deception, either the spirit was already on the photographic plates, or four persons must have been concerned, or three if we leave out as weak-minded or duped old Mr. Guppy, who died in January 1875, at the age of 84. It only needed that he should be sent behind the Spanish screen of the background. That a photographer could obtain a quote-unquote model for the spirit without difficulty does not need to be argued. But the photographer, Hudson, shortly afterwards, was publicly prosecuted for habitual falsification of spirit photographs. So Mr. Wallace remarks in mitigation, quote, One thing is clear, if an imposture has occurred, it was at once detected by spiritualists themselves. Unquote. Hence, there is not much reliance to be placed on the photographer. Remains Mrs. Guppy, and for her there is only the quote-unquote absolute conviction of our friend Wallace and nothing more. Nothing more? Not at all. The absolute trustworthiness of Mrs. Guppy is evidenced by her assertion that one evening, early in June 1871, she was carried through the air in a state of unconsciousness from her house in Highbury Hill Park to 69 Lambs Conduit Street, three English miles as the crow flies, and deposited in the said house of number 69 on the table in the midst of a spiritualistic seance. The doors of the room were closed, and although Mrs. Guppy was one of the stoutest women in London, which is certainly saying a good deal, nevertheless her sudden incursion did not leave behind the slightest hole either in the doors or in the ceiling, reported in the London Echo, June 8, 1871. And if anyone still does not believe the genuineness of spirit photography, there is no helping him. The second eminent adept among English natural scientists is Mr. William Crookes, the discoverer of the chemical element thallium and of the radiometer, in Germany also called Lichtmühle, light mill. Mr. Crookes began to investigate spiritualistic manifestations about 1871 and employed for this purpose a number of physical and mechanical appliances, spring balances, electric batteries, etc. Whether he brought to his task the main apparatus required, a skeptically critical mind, or whether he remained to the end in a fit state for working, we shall see. At any rate, within a not very long period, Mr. Crookes was just as completely captivated as Mr. Wallace. For some years, he relates, quote, a young lady, Miss Florence Cook, 
has exhibited remarkable mediumship, which latterly culminated in the production of an entire female form, purporting to be of spiritual origin, and which appeared barefooted and in white flowing robes, while she lay entranced in dark clothing and securely bound in a cabinet or adjoining room. Unquote. This spirit, which called itself Katie, and which looked remarkably like Miss Cook, was one evening suddenly seized round the waist by Mr. Volkman, the present husband of Mrs. Guppy, and held fast in order to see whether it was not indeed Miss Cook in another edition. The spirit proved to be a quite sturdy damsel. It defended itself vigorously. The onlookers intervened. The gas was turned out, and when, after some scuffling, peace was re-established and the room re-lit, the spirit had vanished, and Miss Cook lay bound and unconscious in her corner. Nevertheless, Mr. Volkman is said to maintain up to the present day that he had seized hold of Miss Cook and nobody else. In order to establish this scientifically, Mr. Varley, a well-known electrician on the occasion of a new experiment, arranged for the current from a battery to flow through the medium, Miss Cook, in such a way that she could not play the part of the spirit without interrupting the current. Nevertheless, the spirit made its appearance. It was therefore, indeed, a being different from Miss Cook. To establish this further was the task of Mr. Crooks. His first step was to win the confidence of the spiritualistic lady. This confidence, so he says himself in The Spiritualist, June 5, 1874, quote, increased gradually to such an extent that she refused to give a seance unless I made the arrangements. She said that she always wanted me to be near her and in the neighborhood of the cabinet. I found that when this confidence had been established, and she was sure that I would not break any promise made to her, the phenomena increased considerably in strength, and there was freely forthcoming evidence that would have been unobtainable in any other way. She frequently consulted me in regard to the persons present at the seances and the places to be given them, for she had recently become very nervous as a result of certain ill-advised suggestions that, besides other more scientific methods of investigation, Force also should be applied. Unquote. The spirit lady rewarded this confidence, which was as kind as it was scientific in the highest measure. She even made her appearance, which can no longer surprise us, in Mr. Crook's house, played with his children, and told them quote, anecdotes from her adventures in India. Unquote. Treated Mr. Crooks to an account of. Quote, some of the bitter experiences of her past life, unquote, allowed him to take her by the arm so that he could convince himself of her evident materiality, allowed him to take her pulse and count the number of her respirations per minute, and finally allowed herself to be photographed next to Mr. Crooks. This figure, says Mr. Wallace, quote, after she had been seen, touched, photographed, and conversed with, vanished absolutely out of a small room from which there was no other exit than an adjoining room filled with spectators, unquote, which was not such a great feat, provided that the spectators were polite enough to show as much faith in Mr. Crooks, in whose house this happened, as Mr. Crooks did in the spirit. Unfortunately, these so-called fully authenticated phenomena are not immediately credible even for spiritualists. We saw above how the very spiritualistic Mr. Folkman permitted himself to make a very material grab, and a clergyman, a member of the committee of the so-called British National Association of Spiritualists, has also been present at a seance with Miss Cook, and he established the fact without difficulty that the room through the door of which the spirit came and disappeared communicated with the outer world by a second door. The behavior of Mr. Crooks who was also present, gave, quote, the final death blow to my belief that there might be something in the manifestations, unquote. Mystic London, by Reverend C. Morris Davies, London, Tinsley Brothers. Footnote, see Appendix 2, page 370, end of footnote. 
and over and above that, it came to light in America how KDs were quote-unquote materialized. A married couple named Holmes held seances in Philadelphia in which likewise a so-called KD appeared and received bountiful presents from the believers. However, one skeptic refused to rest until he got on the track of the said KD, who anyway had already gone on strike once because of lack of pay. He discovered her in a boarding house as a young lady of unquestionable flesh and bone, and in possession of all the presents that had been given to the spirit. Meanwhile, the continent also had its scientific spirit seers. A scientific association at St. Petersburg, I do not know exactly whether the university or even the academy itself, charged the councillor of state, Aksakov, and the chemist, Butlerov, to examine the basis of the spiritualistic phenomena, but it does not seem that very much came of this. On the other hand, if the noisy announcements of the spiritualists are to be believed, Germany has now also put forward its man in the person of Professor Zöllner in Leipzig. For years, as is well known, Herr Zöllner has been hard at work on the so-called fourth dimension of space, and has discovered that many things that are impossible in a space of three dimensions are a simple matter of course in a space of four dimensions. Thus, in the latter kind of space, a closed metal sphere can be turned inside out like a glove without making a hole in it. Similarly, a knot can be tied in an endless string, or one which has both ends fastened, and two separate closed rings can be interlinked without opening either of them and many more such feats. According to the recent triumphant reports from the spirit world, it is said now that Professor Zöllner has addressed himself to one or more mediums in order with their aid to determine more details of the locality of the fourth dimension. The success is said to have been surprising. After the session, the arm of the chair, on which he rested his arm while his hand never left the table, was found to have become interlocked with his arm. A string that at both ends sealed to the table was found tied into four knots, and so on. In short, all the miracles of the fourth dimension are said to have been performed by the spirits with the utmost ease. It must be borne in mind, Rilata Refero, I do not vouch for the correctness of the spirit bulletin, and if it should contain any inaccuracy, Herr Zöllner ought to be thankful that I am giving him the opportunity to make a correction. If, however, it reproduces the experiences of Herr Zöllner without falsification, then it obviously signifies a new era both in the science of spiritualism and that of mathematics. The spirits prove the existence of the fourth dimension, just as the fourth dimension vouches for the existence of spirits and this once established, an entirely new, immeasurable field is open to science. All previous mathematics and natural science will be only a preparatory school for the mathematics of the fourth and still higher dimensions, and for the mechanics, physics, chemistry and physiology of the spirits dwelling in these higher dimensions. Has not Mr. Crookes scientifically determined how much weight is lost by tables, and other articles of furniture on their passage into the fourth dimension, as we may now well be permitted to call it. And does not Mr. Wallace declare it proven that fire there does no harm to the human body? And now we have even the physiology of the spirit bodies. They breathe, they have a pulse, therefore lungs, heart, and a circulatory apparatus, and in consequence are at least as admirably equipped as our own in regard to the other bodily organs. For breathing requires carbohydrates, which undergo combustion in the lungs, and these carbohydrates can only be supplied from without, hence stomach, intestines, and their accessories, and if we have once established so much, the rest follows without difficulty. The existence of such organs, however, implies the possibility of their falling a prey to disease, hence it may still come to pass, that her Virchow will have to compile a cellular pathology of the spirit world. And since most of these spirits are very handsome young ladies, who are not to be distinguished in any respect whatsoever from terrestrial damsels, 
other than by their supramundane beauty, it could not be very long before they come into contact with, quote, men who feel the passion of love, unquote. And since, as established by Mr. Crooks, from the beat of the pulse, quote, the female heart is not absent, unquote, natural selection also has opened before it the prospect of a fourth dimension, one in which it has no longer any need to fear of being confused with wicked social democracy. Enough. Here it becomes palpably evident which is the most certain path from natural science to mysticism. It is not the extravagant theorizing of the philosophy of nature, but the shallowest empiricism that spurns all theory and distrusts all thought. It is not a priori necessity that proves the existence of spirits, but the empirical observations of Messrs. Wallace, Crooks, and company. If we trust the spectrum analysis observations of Crooks, which led to the discovery of the metal thallium, or the rich zoological discoveries of Wallace in the Malay archipelago, we are asked to place the same trust in the spiritualistic experiences and discoveries of these two scientists. And if we express the opinion that, after all, there is a little difference between the two, namely, that we can verify the one but not the other, then the spirit seers retort that this is not the case, and that they are ready to give to us the same opportunity of verifying also the spirit phenomena. Indeed, dialectics cannot be despised with impunity. However great one's contempt for all theoretical thought, Nevertheless, one cannot bring two natural facts into relation with one another or understand the connection existing between them without theoretical thought. The only question is whether one's thinking is correct or not, and contempt of theory is evidently the most certain way to think naturalistically and therefore incorrectly. But according to an old and well-known dialectic law, incorrect thinking, carried to its logical conclusion, inevitably arrives at the opposite of its point of departure. Hence, the empirical contempt of dialectics on the part of some of the most sober empiricists is punished by their being led into the most barren of all superstitions, into modern spiritualism. It is the same with mathematics. The ordinary metaphysical mathematicians boast with enormous pride of the absolute irrefutability of the results of their science but these results include also imaginary magnitudes which thereby acquire a certain reality. When one has once become accustomed to ascribe some kind of reality outside of our minds, to square root of minus one, or to the fourth dimension, then it is not a matter of much importance if one goes a step further and also accepts the spirit world of the mediums. It is as Kettler said about Dullinger, quote, The man has defended so much nonsense in his life, he really could have accepted infallibility into the bargain. Footnote. Dullinger, a Catholic scholar who did not accept the dogma of papal infallibility. End of footnote. In fact, mere empiricism is incapable of refuting the spiritualists. In the first place, the so called higher phenomena always show themselves only when the so-called investigator concerned is already so far into the toils that he now only sees what he is meant to see or wants to see, as Crooks himself describes with such inimitable naivete. In the second place, however, the spiritualist cares nothing that hundreds of alleged facts are exposed as imposture and dozens of alleged mediums as ordinary tricksters. As long as every single alleged miracle has not been explained away, they have still room enough to carry on, as indeed Wallace says clearly enough in connection with the falsified spirit photographs. The existence of falsifications proves the genuineness of the genuine ones. And so, empiricism finds itself compelled to refute the importunate spirit seers, not by means of empirical experiments, but by theoretical considerations, and to say with Huxley, quote, The only good that I can see in the demonstration of the truth of spiritualism is to furnish an additional argument against suicide. Better to live a crossing sweeper than die and be made to talk twaddle by a so-called medium hired at a guinea a seance. Unquote. Footnote. 
See Appendix 2, page 370.